All right. Good morning. I call this meeting to order. Uh, and I am excited to see all of you. Good morning. Uh, I am excited that we are able to start this meeting, that I am here with you in person today as we begin to start our annual board election. Um, this couldn't be a better time. December is always a great time of reflection. I'm certainly in deep reflection being back with you here at the table and thinking about all the work that we've done thus far and the work that we're going to continue to do on behalf of children. So, um, as I said, this is an exciting time um, when, as the Secretary Treasurer of the Board of Education, I have the opportunity to preside over the Board of Education until it elects a new president. And according to the rules, uh, all of the names of the board members are in nomination. With all eight members present, five votes are required to elect a new president. So at this time, we'll begin the election, and I will ask the board staff <coughs> to distribute the ballots. The board staff will collect the ballots, and as they are given to me, I will then read them aloud. I will proceed on to read the uh, ballots. And this is for the position of president. So for board member Grace Rivera Oven. Okay. Uh, we have vote for Carla Silvestri. For board member Brenda Wolf, Carla Silvestri. Board member Shebra Evans, Carla Silvestri. Board member Rebecca Smodrowski votes for Carla Silvestri. Board member Lynn Harris votes for Carla Silvestri. Board member Carla Silvestri votes for Carla Silvestri. Board member Julie Yang votes for Carla Silvestri. Sammy, I'm going to write your name. Uh, it's my first time. Member, so. Mr. Saeed, you are absolutely okay. Uh, Sammy Saeed, student member of the board, votes for Carly Silvestri as president. So now that all of the votes and all of the nominations and votes are in, I would like to congratulate Carly Silvestri as the new president of continuing president of the Board of Education. Congratulations. Thank you, And <clears throat> congratulations. Thank you, Dr. Rene. Um, Thank you, board. Before I will now turn it over to uh, Ms. Silvestri to begin the election for the vice president, that I do want to say that um, I, it has just been wonderful to work with you, and I look forward to continuing to work with you as uh, <coughs> president of the Board of Education. Thank you, Dr. Rene. Absolutely. Now, you will begin the, Ms. Silvestri will run the process for vice president. Okay. Um, now we will move on with the election of the vice president. The names of all board members are in nomination. <coughs> Five votes are required to elect the new vice president. At this point, I will ask the board staff to distribute the ballots. When all ballots are collected, I will read each one into the record.
<laughs> I'm reading them. <laughs> We'll now read the, the votes for va Vice President of the Board of Education. Ms. Rebecca Smodrowski votes for Lynn Harris. Ms. Brenda Wolf votes for Lynn Harris. Ms. Lynn Harris votes for Lynn Harris. Sammy Saeed votes for Lynn Harris. Ms. Shebra Evans votes for Julie Yang. Ms. Grace Rivera Oven gross, votes for Lynn Harris. Ms. Carla Sylvester, myself, votes for Julie Yang. And Ms. Julie Yang votes for Julie Yang. What does that make it, Ms. Van Dyke? Five, three. All right. Harris. So we have uh, five votes. So congratulations, Ms. Harris, as our new Vice President of the Board of Education. Um, thank you to Ms. Mrs. Evans for stepping up and once again having served as Vice President uh, for our board. I appreciate you and everything you've done to help me as, pre as a new president um, in this board. So thank you so much for your service. Uh, Ms. Harris, do you have any remarks for us um, as our new Vice President? Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, I look forward to serving. And um, we have a lot of work to do. This is a board that I very much enjoy working with, both personally and professionally. And I know that we are going to have um, uh, a, a good year working hard for the, in the best interest of the students and staff of Montgomery County Public Schools. Thank you, Ms. Harris. Um, I do have some remarks, so if you will oblige me. Um, they're brief. I want to start out by thanking all of the board members uh, for entrusting in me uh, your support to be the president once again of our school system. I've been on the board for five years and I've really learned from each and every one of you. I truly believe that everybody brings their skills and their talents to this board and we all have something to contribute and together we're better. Um, I look forward to working collaboratively with everyone to be an effective and productive board as we do this very important work of providing systemic leadership and oversight for Montgomery County Public Schools, the 14th largest district in the country, for the benefit of our students. I also want to take this opportunity to thank our hardworking board staff who do so much work behind the scenes to make Everything happened. Thank you so much. We're all here because we share a common goal. We want every single student in MCPS to be well and to have a high quality education. We want them to be well prepared and now have a plan as they graduate from our school system and they go on to college, other post-secondary education or training or the workforce. As we begin this new board session, I want to remind us of our board priorities uh, at, that we have set to guide the work of the superintendent and of the system. Of course, our first priority is always to improve literacy and math. It's so simple, uh, yet there's, it's such a, much at the core of what we are here to do. And we must maintain a laser focus on this and be relentless in our pursuit of seeing improvements in both literacy and math. We must see progress for all students, but especially those students who live in poverty, who consistently below, uh, perform below what we know that they can do. We again must focus on mathematics because our data shows that we still have much work to do in this area. We must prioritize program evaluation to determine what is working, what is effective, what is a proven best practice and implement it across the entire system in a consistent and cohesive manner. 
We must continue to do the work that we as the adults in this equation know we have to do to create a culture of high expectations for every single student. And we are, and what we are doing to actively examine our practices and dismantle systems and those practices that are getting in the way of our students achieving at the highest level. I'm talking about our anti-racist system work, which is of course embedded in all of our priorities, but I highlight it here under academic achievement because I think it is at the core. Our second priority, of course, is to build an inclusive and safe school climate. So important. We hear from families all over this district on this topic. It's vital so our students can learn, so our teachers can teach, and so that our students can be engaged in school, in school and graduate. We have made important investments in this area and begun groundbreaking work it's time to evaluate what is working and prioritize it as we make difficult budget decisions this year. Our third priority to improve two-way communication between schools and families. Why is this so important? So that our families can be the active partners in their children's education that we know they want to be. We must understand our diverse family's preferred mode of communication and preferred language and build system capacity to meet their needs and regularly evaluate our efforts with our own families to see if those efforts are working. Finally, our fourth priority, improve the recruitment, retention, and distribution of the diverse workforce at all levels. All of those words in that statement are equally important. Recruit, retain, distribute, equitably I say, and diversity, diversity at all levels of the system, especially in leadership where we lack representation that reflects our community. Those are our four board priorities, but this year in particular, we must also support the work to help make MCPS a stronger workplace. Recent events have shown, shown us where we need to improve, and we are all committed to making the necessary changes to make this happen and restoring the trust of our staff in the systems that are in place to support them. We have important work to do, obviously, and it's a critical yet exciting time to be in MCPS. This is an excellent school system. I have seen it as a parent, as a community member, and now as a board member for five years. We have talented staff working in every corner of our system. I look forward to ensuring that together as a board, we are working to make this an even better school system, that we are laser focused on student achievement and well-being, as well as restoring the trust from our staff, families, and community. Last but not least, I look forward to continuing to work with Dr. McKnight and her team as she leads our system in so many important aspects of this work, from implementing structured literacy to groundbreaking work in student well-being, and other aspects of education where we are charting new ground. Let's keep our overarching goal of fully preparing our students for college, career, and community at the forefront. Let us support our staff so they can support our students. Let this be our guiding light that drives our work together. Thank you again for your support, board members, and thank you to the families, the staff, and our community uh, for everything they do for our students every day. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McNeigh. Thank you, Ms. Silvestri. And I just had a few more words before we close out. Um, it has truly been an honor to continue to work with the board leadership. And I have to say particularly as we have worked through uh, so many challenges this year. Ms. Sylvester, I thank you for continuing to talk about the focus of keeping our children front and center, because that is the work that we do. That's why we all came together. That is our priority within our community. And so it continues to give us the focus of 
what we do and why we love what we do. So I want to thank you for that. And although you are not even going a seat away, you will still be right next to me, I definitely wanted to present you with this gift to thank you for your leadership as president on the first term. So congratulations again. Yeah. But I wanted to present this with you and look forward to continuing that work. Thank you, Dr. Ringley. Absolutely. And I did want to also thank Ms. Evans. Um, it has been indeed a pleasure to continue to work with you. As I said to Ms. Silvestri, um, you all have helped us charter through some very difficult and turbulent times as of recent. Um, but your dedication to children remains at the forefront. You often tell us and share with us your experience, not only as vice president of the board, but through a mother's eyes, through the experiences you have you know, with your children coming up through the school system. And all of that just makes the work continuing to be meaningful and real as we talk about you know, real challenges and, at times, real successes that we do in the school system. So I want to thank you for your leadership as well and the work that you have done. And I look forward to continuing to work with you, as I will all of our board members. Um, I'm excited about everything you said, Ms. Silvestri, about the work that we have moving ahead of us. And it is good work that is deserving for our children. So thank you so much for your leadership. And Ms. Harris, I look forward to working with you. And congratulations as the new vice president. Yes. All right. So now we can begin our closed session. Okay. Picture. Picture. Where do you want us? If you could be here, we'll get Okay, so now we will um, transition on to closed session and ask Mr. Saeed to lead, read us into closed session. Kind of bummed no one voted me for president, but no. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. All right, I'll now read. Time will come. <laughs> okay. I'll now read the board into closed session. Uh, I move uh, that the board meet in closed session to address topics posted on the resolution for today's closed session and on the basis and for the reasons stated therein. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that is unanimous. We will now go into closed session.
Good afternoon, and welcome to the December 5th, 2023 board meeting, business meeting of the Montgomery County Board of Education. Welcome to our board members, MCPS staff, and members of our community who are here in person and joining us uh, virtually as well. Now let us begin the meeting by standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I will call the roll to recognize board members to establish that we have a quorum. Let us begin with Mr. Saeed. Hello everyone, Sammy Saeed, student member of the board, and I'm ecstatic to be at our uh, December board meeting before the holidays. Good afternoon, great to see everyone. <laughs> Shebra Evans, District 4. Good afternoon, Rebecca Smondrowski, District 2. Good afternoon everyone, Lynn Harris, my pronouns are she, her, and I am an at-large member of the board. I'd like to recognize that also uh, Ms. Harris is our new Vice President of the Board, so welcome her in that role. <laughs> Ms. Grace Rivera. Oh, I'm sorry. Good afternoon, buenas tardes. Happy holidays to all who celebrate. I, Grace Rivera Oven, I represent District 1. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Julie Yang, District 3. Good to see everyone here. <clears throat> Ms. Wolf. Good afternoon, Brenda Wolf, District 5. Thank you, everyone. Now uh, I'm going to, we're going to modify the agenda today so we can get a, get a motion to modify the agenda so that we are moving item uh, 13, the calendar, to uh, the front of our agenda um, before, well, just as soon as we open the. Between 6 and 7. Between 6 and 7, thank you. Yes. Uh, so moved. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous. All right. So now we are going to uh, proceed with item number five, human resources and development. We have to approve the revised agenda. Can I get a motion to approve the revised agenda? I already moved it, but I'm um, so moved again. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. I'd already moved. And that's unanimous. Thank you. Okay, moving on to agenda item number five, human resources and development report. Dr. McKnight. Thank you, Ms. Silvestri, and good afternoon, everyone. It's good to be back and to see you all in person. Uh, I'd like to move forward the monthly human resources and development report for approval. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous. Thank you. I, I do have one resolution that I will begin with, a death resolution. The death on September 29th, 2023 of Mrs. Mary Fotanakis, special education's paraeducator with the visually impaired programs, has deeply saddened the staff, students, and members of the Board of Education. During the 11 plus years Mrs. Fotanakis worked for MCPS, she created positive interpersonal relationships with her students to ensure a secure, productive, and nurturing learning environment. Mrs. Fotanakis fostered positive relationships with her colleagues. She served as a mentor in training new paraeducators to familiarize them with the program and acquaint them with the vision students. During COVID-19, she effectively modified lesson plans as needed to ensure the vision students could follow along during classes. She also took the initiative to learn Braille in order to better serve her students' needs. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the members of the Board of Education, the Superintendent of Schools, express our sorrow at the death of Mrs. Fotonakis and extend deepest sympathy to her family, and be it further resolved that they receive a copy of this resolution. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous. Okay, thank you. And I'm also bringing forward two human resources appointments. Our first appointment for today is Mrs. Sarah E. Kyle as supervisor in the Department of Special Education Services in the Special Education Office in the Office of the Deputy Superintendent. 
Mrs. Kyle has been employed with MCPS for 10 years as a special education teacher, special education resource teacher, instructional specialist, and most recently acting supervisor in the Department of Special Education. She looks forward to continuing to support special education services within the school clusters. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous. Thank you. Our next appointment is appointment of Mr. Gerald L. Leonaco as supervisor in the Resolution and Compliance Unit in the Office of Special Education in the Office of the Deputy Superintendent. Mr. Leonaco comes to MCPS with more than 10 years of experience in special education support and school law with a focus on compliance. He looks forward to assisting families in resolving special education conflicts. Move approval. Second. <clears throat> All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous. Congratulations, thank you, and that concludes the appointments. Moving on to our next agenda item. Our next <coughs> item on the agenda is public comments. Public comments is one of our opportunities to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. Board members will take your comments into consideration, but it is not our practice to take action at this time on the issues raised. We encourage public input on policy, program, and practices. This is not the proper avenue to address specific student or employee matters, so we encourage everyone to utilize existing avenues of redress for complaints. This is a public meeting, and we expect the conduct of all speakers and members of the audience to be within the bounds of proper etiquette. Inappropriate personal remarks, rude retorts, or other such behavior is out of order and will not be tolerated. Those who demonstrate disruptive or disrespectful behavior during public comments may be asked to leave the room. Please check our website for information about upcoming board meetings, hearings, and work sessions, including any changes to our meeting start times. We have 15 people signed up to, te to provide in-person testimony. Each speaker will receive two minutes for comments. When your name is called, please approach the table, speak clearly and directly into the microphone, 30 seconds prior to the expiration of a speaker's time, a yellow light will go on, accompanied by a beep. A red light and a buzzer signals that your time has expired. Please push the flat button below the microphone to turn it on and begin speaking. Push the same button once more at the sound of the buzzer to turn it off. In addition to our in-person speakers today, we have five people signed up to provide audio testimonies audio and video testimonies. We will play these submissions once the in-person testimonies have concluded. Copies of testimonies can be found on board docs where they are posted with other materials for the meeting. Okay. We will now begin with our first three speakers. If you could please come forward and please remember to stay within your time limit of two minutes. Mr. Ryan Forkert, Jennifer Martin, and Jeff Egan. You may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Ryan Forkert. I'm the Vice President of MCAP. I'm here to advocate for MCPS to continue maintaining two administrators at all elementary schools. Having served as a principal without the invaluable support of an assistant principal, I understand firsthand the immense challenges that fall on the shoulders of a single administrator, from spending an entire day attending IEP meetings, attending six or more grade level planning meetings a week, serving as the sole security staff member, and engaging the community, and the list goes on and on. I remember the, to this day when my community superintendent informed me I would receive an AP for the following year. I wanted to jump up and down, but I had to be restrain myself because I was in a principal's curriculum update meeting. <laughs> the downside was that one of my colleagues was losing their AP position to create mine. 
Maintaining security within our schools is paramount, as we witnessed last week when four of our schools sheltered in place while police responded to an emergency in the area. Three of those schools were elementary schools. APs and ASAs play a crucial role in fostering a safe and secure learning environment. They contribute to the development and implementation of safety protocols, emergency preparedness, and crisis management, and support principals during emergencies. If the principal is out of the building and an emergency arises, the AP or ASA, who have been trained to handle emergency situations, are there to ensure the safety and security of staff and students. Work-life balance is a fundamental aspect of a healthy and sustainable professional life. Principals are not immune to the pressures of balancing the diverse needs of administrative tasks, and instructional leadership, and community engagement. Every school community deserves the same level of resources to balance the ever-changing tasks that elementary principals are called upon to do. I urge you to maintain our current staffing level of two administrators at all elementary schools. Thank you for your time. Thank you for this opportunity to speak today on behalf of the Montgomery County Education Association. And it's very good to see Dr. McKnight back and in good health again. With budget season upon us, special education staffing remains a significant problem to address. Some of our self-contained programs, like the autism program at Kensington Parkwood, continue to rely on staff borrowed from other schools, who then cope with their own shortages. A growing number of our new hires lack certification or teaching experience, and the budget for fiscal year 25 must include funding to find innovative ways of attracting, supporting, and retaining special educators. Moreover, while there have been improvements in substitute coverage due to growing the number of permanent substitute teachers, hundreds of teacher requests for substitutes still go unfilled each day. This means that teaching staff and others must take on extra, often uncompensated duties, and many hundreds of students get less access to support and instruction. Perversely, rather than considering funding to make substitute teaching more attractive or create a plan to increase permanent substitute positions, MCPS is considering reducing the funding of substitute teachers for next year. If the superintendent and board were to accept this proposal, you would be perpetuating and exacerbating the exploitation of existing staff. Further, we have learned that there are proposals to increase the number of subcontracted jobs. Rather than seek creative ways to provide incentives to attract speech pathologists and other hard-to-fill categories, MCPS is considering siphoning off public money to pay private firms to provide temporary workers. Using a disposable workforce of this kind would be a disservice to our neediest students and their families. The 14,000 members of MCEA are counting on the superintendent and board members to submit a budget proposal for our schools that will meet the needs of our students, paying particular attention where we're experiencing the greatest staffing challenges this year. Thank you so much. Nope, oh, one more time. My first time here, so. No problem. There you go. Good afternoon, I'm Jeff Egan. Chair of the Board of Social Justice and Action at Westmoreland Church, uh, and a leader of Action in Montgomery from Bethesda, and a proud grandfather of an eight-year-old boy, an eight-month-old eight boy. Um, recently, my son relocated to our area for work, and he bought a house in the District of Columbia. I said, why not Montgomery County? You are a proud BCC graduate. We've served you well. He said, Dad, it's a no-brainer. The district has universal access to pre-K. Your grandchild is going to start school years earlier. Montgomery County doesn't have anything close to that. It doesn't even cover the, some of the demands that are already required. Universal pre-K is not just an essential educational strategy. It is a vital economic development tool and an extremely competitive regional economy. Washington has universal pre-K. Much of Northern Virginia has universal pre-K. Cities across the country as large as New York are moving in this direction. States are now moving in this direction. Why can't we, as one of the wealthiest counties in the nation, join 
and work towards universal pre-K. It's not enough to follow the blueprint plan. The board must lead this expansion with goals, objectives, timetables, budgets. Action in Montgomery is prepared to work with you. We will go with you arm in arm to Annapolis to get the resources we need. This is long overdue, but it's the time is now to make a difference. Universal pre-K. Thank you. Thank you so much. We will now ask our next three uh, persons to come to the table. Marjorie Smelkinson, Tiana Carrion, and Jacqueline Hangladaram. Marjorie, you may begin. Board members, my name is Dr. Marjorie Smelkinson, and I have four children in MCPS. You heard from me during COVID, warning about the consequences of keeping schools closed for too long, predictions that were sadly yet completely accurate. Now I bring an equally dire warning. MCPS has a massive anti-Semitism problem. As an organizer of the Montgomery County Jewish Parents Coalition, I have a front row seat to parents' stories of anti-Semitism in our schools. These span from hateful gra graffiti to instances of physical bullying. Parents fill out complaint forms, little or nothing happens, and the hate continues. You can change this sad pattern, and here are a few examples. Adopt the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's definition of anti-Semitism and use it to identify and curtail anti-Jewish sentiments. Update the curriculum with lessons on Jewish history and heritage and start teaching these subjects in elementary school because sadly even our youngest Jewish learners are experiencing anti-Semitism in their schools. Comprehensively track hateful acts, quickly condemn this behavior to the community, and take real disciplinary action against the perpetrators. These are not exhaustive suggestions, but the status quo is unacceptable, and it is time for decisive reform. Board members, too often you speak about combating hate, but seem to minimize or even ignore the anti-Jewish hate right in front of you. You speak of inclusion at a time when Jewish students feel deep exclusion. If you could match your deeds to your words, you could help stomp out anti-Semitism in our schools. But it takes action, not cheap talk, and it must start now. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon, my name is Tiana Carrion. I am a mother of two. I was an educator. I am the vice president of the PTA at William Woods Elementary School. And we are also, part, we partake in Action Montgomery. I have been a strong advocate for pre-K um, expansion in our county for two years. My youngest daughter is four years old. She should have been attending pre-K, but she was denied because they say, our family makes too much income. Sorry if I get emotional. <clears throat> but um, I am extremely frustrated. Um, we are a very hard, middle class, hard working family, and we cannot afford a full time or a half time pre K at a private school. <clears throat> I am here today because I want to understand. I want to understand the urge. I want you to understand the urgency of pre-K expansion in our county, because just like me, there are other people in the need of pre-K for all. I am not in. <clears throat> this is not an issue for low-income families. This is an issue for everybody. Um, and additionally, I understand that the biggest issue for uh, the lack of the expansion is because there's not enough certified teachers. I myself am an educator. I could be part of the extension plan. There are people in the similar situation as mine that could also fill the need of our county. Of our county. Today I want to ask how many annual full day pre-K seats does MCPS plan to open over the next 10 years? Thank you. 
It's on. You can begin. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Hi. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jacqueline Hongla I don't think the timer's not going though. <laughs> You got it? Okay, cool. Sorry. Okay. Um, so we'll start over. Uh, so good afternoon. My name is Jacqueline Hongla Rome as Mrs. H, as most people know me in the county. Um, and I'm currently the assistant school administrator at Woodfield Elementary. I'm here to emphasize that every school in MCPS, regardless of size, must have two administrators. The job of a principal is monumental. The principal is an instructional leader that is tasked not only with the day-to-day -day management and operations of a building, but also in maintaining safety and security, in supporting planning and instruction and professional development for teachers, monitoring student achievement, maintaining the social-emotional well-being of students, and collaborating with parents and community, just to name a few. No single principal alone can serve all these roles and maintain a climate conducive to successful teaching and learning. Um, at Woodfield, Mr. Schwartz and I work as a team to serve in all of these roles together in order to meet the needs of our school. We share the workload and the leadership, and even with the two of us, it is extremely challenging for us to get the job done. At Woodfield, we have the same challenges as larger schools, finding coverage for absent staff, supporting increased behavioral needs of students, delivering intervention for increasing number of students, um, et cetera. However, we have a much smaller staff and do not have the human resources to effectively support these challenges. We often cover classes for absent staff. We get pulled from coaching sessions and data chats to provide in the moment support to students, staff, and parents. We get pulled from one critical priority to address another. This has an impact on school operations, on instruction, student achievement, and the safety, security, and social emotional well-being of our students. Imagine the implications if only one administrator was supporting the school. I believe it is clear that all schools, regardless of size, require two administrators. No formula should be driving the narrative on the success and well-being of our students. Thank you. If we could get our next three speakers to please come forward. Courtney Jones, Paulina Larikova, and Sadatu Clark. May begin, Ms. Jones. Good afternoon. I am Courtney Jones, principal of Cashel Elementary School in Rockville. I am here today to express my support for retaining the second administrator in the six schools within our district that operate without an assistant principal allocation. Instructional leadership must be the priority. Having an ASA has allowed me for more individualized attention to students, enabling us to implement targeted interventions and support systems. The ASA plays a crucial role in data analysis and student assessment, leading to more informed decision making and improved outcomes. The impact of a second administrator in the smallest schools has created an inclusive and supportive environment for all stakeholders. The ASA position emphasizes critical work in fostering anti-racist leadership and promoting equitable learning opportunities within our schools. Two administrators can share leadership responsibilities, allowing for a more distributed and collaborative decision-making process. It ensures that our decisions are made with diverse perspectives. Having an ASA has enabled us to expand our outreach efforts within the community to foster increased engagement. This includes organizing more events, collaborating with local partners, and actively engaging with community members. The result has been a broader and more inclusive approach to building connections and truly understanding the diverse needs of our communities. With responsibilities divided, each administrator can focus on specific areas, leading to increased efficiency and effectiveness in our day-to-day -day operations. I understand the complexities of decisions and the challenges that our district faces. Howard County and Carroll County maintain two administrators in all elementary schools already. Frederick County is moving in that direction, but already provides more staffing through counseling and behavioral support. I humbly request that the Board of Education support our elementary schools by ensuring that no principal or school team stand alone. Thanks for your time and consideration. Thank you. Um, 
since Senator Schumer stole my speech last week, I'll keep it brief. Um, I want to thank everyone here, uh, the members of the board. Um, your job is really difficult, and I'm grateful to all of you. As a Montgomery County uh, public school graduate, Montgomery County resident, and a parent, um, I have been increasingly concerned uh, with the rise of um, anti-Semitism in the county. I'm sure you're aware of the FBI Department of Justice, Justice Crime Statistics um, that in 2021, most religious-based hate crimes in the United States were committed against Jews, 51%. That's more than half of all hate crimes. Since uh, then, 2022, the number increased. They call it an all-time historic high. And since October 7th massacre, uh, the Jews have experienced thousand-fold more increase in hate crimes against them. In the last month, as you know, two Montgomery County public school teachers have been put on leave for displaying anti-Semitic bias. One of them was in charge of equity training. Uh, a member of the Maryland Commission on Hate Crimes Response and Prevention has been placed on leave for openly displaying anti-Semitic bias. Uh, this would have been funny and the irony would have been humorous if it weren't so sad. It's also come to light that anti-Semitism awareness is not part of the mandatory training of Montgomery County teachers. As a parent and a resident in Montgomery County, I want to make sure that words like diversity, equity, inclusion actually mean something. I would hate to think that a kid can come to school and think and wonder whether their teacher hates them because they're a Jew. I believe that in light of recent events, anti-Semitism awareness needs to be part of the mandatory teacher training and part of the mandatory um, curriculum for the students. Thank you. You may begin. Your light's on already. <laughs> Good afternoon. <clears throat> my name is Sadatu Clark, and I am a leader at my church, Harvest Intercontinental Church in Olney, Maryland. My pastor is Bishop Darlington Johnson, and I help to lead a children's ministry. My church is a member, a founding member of AIM, Action in Montgomery. I raised my children in this great, great county, Montgomery County, from Tacoma Park Elementary School to Sherwood High. But I struggled to find affordable and accessible childcare for them. It was a great struggle. I used to work at Fannie Mae in, on Wisconsin Avenue in Washington, D.C. I struggled to travel from the Red Line, Silver Spray, to go to Washington, D.C. to work. It was really a struggle. Now, I find myself, the parents that I'm dealing with at this time at my church are going through the same struggles that I went through. That was over two decades ago. That's a shame. We should really not be going through the same struggle. This is 2023. So maybe some of you around the table are grandparents caring for your grandchildren and <laughs> understand the struggles. I'm sure you do. We cannot make a better investment than in our youngest because they are our heritage. They are the future. Believe it or not, they are. Whether you agree or not, they are the future. We know that there is a shared responsibility in finding a solution that does not mean that the school will make less, has less responsibility. Dr. McKnight, I want to thank you for changing half these parts to full these parts. That is going to help many of the families at my church and all of us. We need our school system to set goals with specific <laughs> numbers and specific timelines. Otherwise, we do nothing. I want to thank you for listening, and God bless. Thank you. We could get our next three speakers to please come forward. Eunice Velis, Samira Hussein, and Adam Failider.
Buenas tardes, miembros de la Junta de Educación y la superintendente, doctora Magnay. Mi nombre es Flor Belis. Tengo tres hijos y soy residente del condado de Montgomery desde hace más de 15 años. Hoy estoy aquí para hablar de la importancia de la educación temprana en los niños. Mis dos hijos mayores no tuvieron la oportunidad de ir a prekindergar, a prekinde porque no habían plazas para ellos en NCPS. Y para mí no fue posible pagar un centro privado uh, por los elevadísimos costos que estos tienen. Mis hijos tuvieron serias dificultades académicas y les costó mucho igualarse con los otros niños. La historia con mi hija fue muy diferente. La escribí y fue aceptada, pero solo por los últimos tres meses del año académico, por falta de plazas en NCPS. No, yo pude ver bien lo que estos tres meses le hicieron a mi hija, pero me apenó que no haya podido asistir el año completo. Ella estaba más preparada y despierta para el, para el kindergarten. Estoy aquí porque quiero que todos los niños de este condado tengan la oportunidad de acceder a la educación temprana de calidad, sin importar la raza o ingreso económico familiar, y así evitar que la brecha de desigualdad sea menos profunda en nuestra sociedad. Han pasado más de 14 años desde que mi hijo mayor no tuvo la oportunidad de acceder a la educa educación preescolar y siguen y NCPA sigue con las plazas muy limitadas para los niños. La educación temprana es vital de importancia para que nuestros hijos estén listos a empezar la escuela. Además, por cada dólar que ustedes invierten en la educación inicial van a recibir menos al menos ocho veces más la recompensa. Además, quiero que en CPS publique su plan de expansión de prekinder claro y más audaz. ¿Cuántas plazas de prekinder de día completo por año planea en CPS abrir en los próximos 10 años? Necesitamos números para poder ver un avance tangible de expansión de prekinder en nuestro condado. Gracias. Now we will hear the interpreter. Good afternoon, members of the Montgomery County Board of Education and Superintendent Dr. Manai. My name is Flor Vélez. I have three children, and I have been a resident of Montgomery County for over 15 years. Today, I'm here to talk about the importance of early education in children. My two oldest children did not have the opportunity to go to pre-K because there were no slots for them in MCPS, and it was not possible for me to afford a private center due to the very high cost. My children had serious academic difficulties, and it was difficult for them to catch up with the rest of the children. The story of my youngest daughter was a little bit a little different. I, en I enrolled her, and she was accepted, but only for the last three months of the academic year due to the lack of space in MCPS. I could see how good these three months were for my daughter, but I was sad that she couldn't attend the full year. She was more prepared and ready to start kindergarten. I'm here because I want all children in this county to have the opportunity to access quality early education, regardless of race or family income, and thus prevent the disparity gap from becoming deeper in our society. It has been more than 14 years since my oldest son did not have the opportunity to access pre-K, and MCPS still has very limited slots for preschool age children. Early childhood education is vitally important for school readiness. Additionally, for every dollar you invest in early education, you will receive at least eight times more in return. And I also want MCPS to release its clearer, bolder pre-K expansion plan. How many full-day pre-K slots per year does MCPS plan to open over the next 10 years? We need numbers to see tangible progress in expanding pre-K in our county. Thank you. Thank you. Mira. Good afternoon, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. It's nice to have you back. Um, thank you. 
Uh, my name is Samira Hussain, and I'm a parent of four MCPS graduates and a community advocate. Today, you will be discussing and adapting the school calendar uh, for 2024-2025. Uh, I'm here to remind you of the commitment of Montgomery County Public Schools to fair and equal treatment to all members of the community. This request is based on the commitment of the board to respect cultures, traditions, and all for all members of the community. We take a pride of our diverse population. The makeup of Montgomery County is not like what it used to be in the 70s, and this chair is my witness. I've been here saying the same thing for th over 30 years. We grew more diverse ethnically and religiously. The Muslim community is not demanding a special treatment. We are asking to be treated fairly and equally to our neighbors of other faiths. I encourage all members of the board to vote yes on having June 6, 2025, which coincides with the Islamic holiday of Eid al-Adha, the sacrifice day, as the day off for all students. I would like to um, end by reflecting on a quote by our Honorable Senator Chris Van Hollen, which speaks of equity for all. It has been 68 years since Rosa Parks refused to give her seat on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. A protest for justice, and that changed the course of history. We must continue to honor the, her legacy by fighting inequality, oppression, and justice everywhere. Thank you for all the considerations and all you do for our children, and please um, think about making the decisions for today to have all Muslim students celebrate just like their peers. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. McKnight, Ms. Silvestri, honored board, I ask for your indulgence if I go a little bit over. I will hopefully not. I'm a school teacher and I will read, I will read as fast as I can. Good afternoon. My name is Adam Fowler. I am an MCPS teacher of more than 20 years. More importantly, I come to you with my parent hat on as a proud, proud dad of an MCPS high school student. These remain challenging times, both globally and locally. We all believe the role of the public school system is to educate the populace, speaking truth to power and representing ugly events that are often difficult to address. In particular are the terrorist attacks by Hamas on October 7th that reverberate across Montgomery County and in our schools, acts so heinous that can only be compared to those of ISIS and the Taliban. MCPS must have a better program to educate our students and our teachers and our administrators and all school personnel on anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. These are not just words to pacify an educated and engaged activist community, but a requirement to explain in age-appropriate language the barbaric terrorist attacks of over 1,200 lives lost, the murdered children, the inhumane handling of the elderly, and most of all, the 139 hostages still held without any release date insights. As, MPS, as MCPS students graduate, move on to colleges and universities, and are swept up into global events, they seek to make the world a better place. In Judaism, we call it tikkun olam, healing the world. That starts in the earliest educational phases, in particular with us. So when the middle school and high school students chant from the river to the sea without understanding that its anti-Semitic meaning is to eradicate Israel, educators have failed. Good kids, but uneducated on the dynamics of these globally complex issues. That is on us. Our uninformed students of tomorrow are the same ones that are protesting and chanting the same anti-Semitic rhetoric in colleges, protests that we see today. Here is the opportunity for MCPS to positively change that dynamic. Thank you. Thank you. We have your testimony. Yes, ma'am. If we could get our next three speakers to please come forward. Susan Eckerly, Bridget Nutahal, Mazaret Chaka.
Good afternoon, school board members and Dr. McKnight. I'm Susan Eckerly. I'm the band director at Thomas S. Wooten High School. Here is some good news. After finishing in 17th place two weeks prior, the Wooten Marching Band placed second in our state championship. About half of our band program, 75 students, were nominated to audition for the Maryland All-State Bands. This past Friday, we performed twice for our student body and once for Froust and Cabin John, eighth grade students. This week, we represent MCPS at the Learning Ford <laughs> Annual Conference in D.C. and perform at Stone Mill Elementary. School. I also want to share that my students are thriving and are lovely and amazing people giving me hope for the future. The bad news is that many central office departments do not function as intended, and we teachers waste so much time trying to collaborate with these departments. One such department is the Interagency Coordinating Board, the ICB. Despite reserving the spaces on the ICB calendar through our school business administrator for our after-school rehearsals, Wooten Band members have been displaced from our classrooms or gyms several times this year. Throughout the six years I have worked for MCPS, this has been a constant issue for me, and I know it has affected my colleagues at other schools for many years as well. I'm here today to ask for your help and support to change the processes that MCPS uses with ICB so it does not happen to any school-based activity again. Yes, we have communicated with ICB to please respect our reservations and stop renting out the spaces when they are reserved, but to no avail. The first time we were kicked out this year was in September when ICB rented out our instrumental music room to an outside group while we were running a marching band rehearsal. Twice in the past three weeks, our school ensembles have been ejected from spaces inside our school that we reserved. One of the things that bothers me the most is the explanation we received for our expulsions. According to ICB, MCPS makes money off outside groups and does not make money off of Wooten students using the facilities, so we rent the classrooms and gyms to make money for MCPS. I know. That is hurtful. I appreciate your time and hope you can rectify this issue. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, good afternoon. My name is Bridget Howe, and I'm speaking today as a concerned parent. Um, last week, I set an alarm on my phone for 5.58 p.m., had the public testimony sign-up page on my web browser, and signed up as quickly as possible in order to drive across the county midday to sit here and spend two minutes with you. Um, why on earth does anybody do that? Uh, first, on an idealistic level, I really believe our elected officials and public agencies need to be responsive and accountable to their constituents. One way to ensure they know what is going on is to communicate with them in person. But second, people bring issues to the public comment time slot when they're tired of not getting answers using less public means. My written testimony details two issues related to MCPS policy violations that impact student privacy violation, I'm sorry, students' digital privacy. The first issue arose in October and I connected with what seemed to be the appropriate MCPS central office staff. I still don't have an answer. I became aware of the second related issue last week, reached out through the same channels, also copied the Ombuds, BOE email, superintendent's office, and got no response, not even an acknowledgement of the concern and a promise to get back in touch later. Sadly, this lack of response to questions and concerns is not unusual. To remind you, community engagement is two ways, and promises of accountability and transparency are meaningless if staff fails to respond to legitimate concerns from the community. If there's a better way to get a response to questions regarding student safety and MCPS policies, I'd love to hear it. Um, so here I am. Twice in the last two months, I've stumbled upon instances where an outside partner has asked for information, PII, in violation of various privacy acts, yet these forms were distributed to children by MCPS without any caveat. Outside partners bring amazing resources and support to MCPS students for enrichment as well as safety net needs. There just need to be checks and balances so we can ensure that children are safe no matter who is providing services to them through the during the school day. The hundreds of organizations in our community that want to be part of solutions for our kids would appreciate that guidance and support. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, board members. This is my third time appearing before you. My third time asking you not to make the school judge what is normal and what is not. We keep hearing unrelated causes for adding LGBTQ sexuality glorifying materials such as inclusivity, diversity, so on and so forth. But your uh, public records prove that the aim is to normalize LGBTQ sexuality by molding children's mind with storybooks. The diversity in Montgomery County is not only in sexuality. We have different religions, ethnicities, races, and culture. 
our children are not asked to embrace or normalize, or normalize anyone's special characteristics, nor does the public school echo personal brief of any other group. Why then should the LGBTQ community get that privilege? Replace the word LGBTQ with any other community group name in your policies, and it might become obvious for you to see the policies you act are very divisive, discriminating, and acceptable. <coughs> Not only that, but it's also unconstitutional. We as a free citizen have the right to accept or reject any lifestyle, ideology, including our social, sexual orientation. We as a parent take the main accountability to raise and guide our underage children through their choice of life. Public schools, like many other government institutions, are funded by taxpayers. Public schools have the, the duty to educate, but not to indoctrinate. Public schools are not here to show favoritism to some and exclude others. Public school funded by everyone should not play favorites. We ask again, please listen to my and many other parents' voice who are asking for what's rightfully ours. Respect our parental rights. After all, we are part of this community too. Thank you. Thank you. We received five audio and video testimonies. The first one comes from Reem Sharaf. Please play the video. Hello, my name is Reem Sharaf. I'm a resident of Montgomery County, Maryland. I'm also an MCPS alumni and an MCPS parent to a fourth grade student. I'm here to advocate that the Eid holiday be incorporated as a non-instructional day in the upcoming MCPS calendar. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the diversity within the MCPS school community and that students and families come from various cultural and religious backgrounds. I'd like to also acknowledge the MCPS values of inclusivity, diversity, and respect. I believe by adding the Eid holiday as a non-instructional day, it aligns with MCPS values as well as affords students a practice in understanding and tolerance, community building, and lastly, an accommodation for students. By allowing the holiday to be incorporated in the calendar, you're allowing students to learn more about different cultural religions and faith traditions. It fosters a more comprehensive understanding of the world, especially when they have peers and families within their own community that practice that faith tradition, which in then promotes a level of understanding and tolerance among students. Second, with regards to community building, by recognizing a religious holiday, it builds a sense of community within the school setting. It fosters um, a sense that the school does uphold the values that they preach of inclusivity, diversity, and inclusion, and acknowledges the diverse backgrounds of the students and families. Lastly, by accommodating the holiday, you're affording students of that faith tradition the opportunity to not miss school in order to attend the religious holiday. No student should have to make that choice about attending school or attending a religious holiday, especially, especially when specifically within the Muslim faith tradition, there are only two religious holidays in this. Our next uh, video testimony comes from Delphine Duncan. Please play the video. Good afternoon, BOE members and MCPS leadership. My name is Delphine Duncan, and I'm here sharing this testimony in support of the advocacy effort of the Black and Brown Coalition and the NAACP Parent Council. As you know, the coalition hosted a successful forum, Getting Reading Right Now, on November 9th, with approximately 800 parents, caregivers, and students, and various um, community members in attendance. I'd like to thank all the BOE members and MCPS team who were there to show support as well. I'm here to reiterate the message shared during that forum. Reading proficiently by the end of third grade is a crucial marker in a child's education. However, we see that in our school system, more than 66% of Latinos, Hispanic students, as well as 50% of black students are not meeting this benchmark. The problem persists even through middle school and high school. This data is alarming. The Black and Brown Coalition has laid out key steps that the county must take to urgently address this crisis. One, develop an early alert system that is easily accessible to understand and highly visible so that parents and caregivers know immediately when their children are falling behind in literacy. 
I'd like to say thank you to MCPS for the work that they're currently doing and taking action now. Two, develop a detailed, specific, and individualized reading successful plan for the students who do not meet grade level reading benchmark. The plan must be reviewed and consented by the parents or caregiver, must remain in effect, and include progress report each semester until that student consistently meets grade level benchmark. Three, provide students with easy access, effective, culturally responsive interventions to achieve reading success. Four, empower parents, caregivers with guidance and tools to support their students. Five, be accountable for real results and post schools and district progress report of students on track achieving grade level benchmark. BOE members, please help our children to consistently address the reading crisis and holding MCP is accountable for the changes our children need. Thank you. Thank you. Our next uh, video comes from Mary Varoxi. Please play the video. Good afternoon, President Carla Silvestre and the honorable members of the board. My name is Mary Varoxi, and as a dedicated special educator with 14 years of experience in MCPS, I wanted to bring to your attention the challenges that special educators across the county are currently facing. Our caseloads have steadily been increasing, resulting in a significant rise in paperwork. Unfortunately, this leaves us with limited time and resources to adequately support and serve our students. Additionally, the shortage of staff in many schools worsens the situation as the behaviors we encounter become more challenging each and every year. The overcrowding in self-contained special education programs further restricts our ability to recommend additional students who require specialized services beyond what general education can provide. This unsustainable model of education is taking a toll on our mental health and will inevitably lead to the loss of exceptional educators. I express my deep commitment and love for my students, but the demands of this job are taking a toll on my mental health and I know I'm not alone in feeling this way. It is critical that we find a solution to address these pressing issues. The ever increasing class sizes are also a concern and the high number of special educator vacancies that are posted right now in MCPS careers and along with the school psychologist positions that are also vacant, highlight the urgency of this situation. I kindly request information regarding your plan to hire more special educators and retain the ex existing ones like myself. Additionally, we desperately need more planning time to meet our legal deadlines without sacrificing our personal lives and responsibilities. I appreciate your attention to this matter and would be grateful for any support and steps that the board can take to alleviate these challenges. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jax Kobe. Please play the video. Hello, Dr. McKnight, members of the Board of Education. I wish this testimony could be about the need for inclusive books or the high level of bullying or the outdated infrastructure or the vaping issue or the upcoming budget or teachers sexually assaulting students or the need for gender inclusive restrooms, which I even have a 13 page white paper for. But on Monday, November 27th, my school Wooten had a bomb threat. It was the 11th bomb threat in MCPS's school year. I understand that the threats aren't under your control, but the response is your responsibility. Let me explain the events through my eyes to help you see the issue. In Spanish class, a vice principal comes over to the PA, announces that we're doing a controlled evacuation. My teacher, who's in the ILT, runs to his computer, reads an email that was sent only to the ILT. Then he says in English, which he never does, that he needs to run to grab a walkie and to stay in the room till he's back. We do, and all of us are wondering what's going on. When he comes back, we ask him to tell us. He says he's not allowed, but with our confusion and fear, he told us what it was, a bomb threat. So when our class was called, we went outside. Kids and teachers with no idea what happened, chaos. I asked my mom to let her know I'm okay. We wait outside. Some kids had backpacks, which seems a little strange given that it was a bomb threat, but no one really knew what was going on. And so we waited in the cold, and after the building was clear, we went back inside. The issue through all of this, though, was a lack of communication. Here is a simple timeline I made. Pink is the PA system, blue is when we were outside, the orange is when various sites posted updates, the green is controlled communication from MCPS. Oh, wait, there's no green. 
Parents officially found out when our principal sent an email near the end of the day, and communication from MCPS never was any. MCPS's Office of Strategic Initiatives Technology Department is working on releasing a live bus app in the, new, in the near future. Maybe once they do that, they can work on setting up mass messaging for emergencies. Because like I said earlier, emergency responses are your responsibility, and the lack of communication was irresponsible. Thank you. Our, our last testimony is a video testimony from Lisa Heiser Poland. Hello, my name is Lisa Heiser Poland, and I'm the parent of a 14 year old freshman at Einstein High School and an eight year old second grader at Rockview Elementary School. I have spent most of my career teaching about writing curriculum and training teachers about the Holocaust and anti Semitism. Right now, Jewish people are under siege from anti-Semitism coming from both the left and the right. And many who we thought were our friends, our colleagues, our trusted allies are silent. Montgomery County is the largest school district in Maryland. The Jewish population of students and staff is estimated to be over 20%. What we hear from you, the Board of Education and Central Office officially, is silence. Your failure to condemn the attacks by Hamas, your failure to give real guidance to schools on how to manage and support grieving Jewish families in crisis and prevent anti-Semitism. For example, instead of being proactive and reaching out to Jewish staff and alerting families before the high school walkouts with a robust plan with clear parameters and consistent messaging and reassuring Jewish families and staff, the lack of clarity left many students and staff to feel unsafe and devalued. School personnel, teachers, and the MCGEA and the JCRC and ADL can't keep up with the number of incidents being reported and support all the schools that need help. Your Jewish families and staff are counting on you, the school district leadership, to drive the bus and stand up to hate. 90 years ago, people were also silent, and it led to the Holocaust happening. As historian George Tatiana said, those who do not learn history are doomed to repeat it. Okay. That concludes our public comments. The next meeting for public comments is on Thursday, January 11th, 2024. Sign us for public comment will open on Thursday, January 4th, 2024 at 6 p.m. In addition to the online signups for co public comment, we allow for in-person, same-day signups when space allows. Unallocated slots may be filled on a first-come, first-served basis on the day of the meeting. In order to sign up in person, please arrive 15 to 20 minutes before the start of the open session and sign the form. In-person signups will close 15 minutes before public comment begins or when slots are filled. Um, I will now turn to my colleagues to see if they have any comments or questions. Mr. Saeed. Yeah, so I, I, I appreciate all the, you know, comments we heard today. Um, one, you know, topic that I heard come up a lot was about uh, assistant school administrators and about the importance of keeping those. So, um, you know, my general question is, you know, is that something we're planning to keep? Is that something we're planning to continue? Because I know there's a lot of concern around that. Sure, I can respond to that. Um, so yes, uh, over the past several years, we've had positions at seven different elementary schools uh, funded through the federal relief money, the ESSER money. That money is going away at the end of this year, as we know. And yes, we have included those seven positions in our operating budget request um, to move them back and maintain those positions. All right, thank you so much. That's it. Mrs. Majewski. Yep, thank you. I do want to thank everybody for um, their testimony today. There are a lot of issues I'd like to address, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to ask if I could get a follow-up as to exactly what we're doing to address all of these issues of anti-Semitism that we've seen increase and, and hate issues in general. Um, I know there are some concerns about a grant application that we uh, applied for that didn't include, it was an anti-hate grant that didn't include anti-Semitism. I think we're looking at that again, but um, I'd like to know exactly what kind of things we are doing. Um, every single day I hear from people who, you know, their children are concerned, they're concerned. There's too much of it going on and we need to do something for them. Yes, we, uh, so we will definitely send an update to you as we just kind of, as 
we've been navigating through this entire situation in our community. Um, you know, we've been keeping the board updated, but we will send a collective list of everything that's been done. Um, and we'll continue to support our schools who support our students and families directly. That we've, I've said this from the beginning, that will continue to be a commitment of mine and the staff that we will support students in our schools. Um, it was mentioned today a number of times, there is a lot of diversity and I think the best um, thing that we can do to arm that is education and continue to treat respect, to teach respect and tolerance. Um, at the same time, compassion. So many things involved in you know what everyone needs to, to, to be comforted during these difficult times. So we will certainly continue to do that, centering our students um, in that and, and share our feedback. And I want to say that as we go through the process, we continue to learn of even more that we can do. And we're open-minded about that and we'll continue to, uh, to do that work. Thank you. I, I appreciate you do keep the board very well informed in terms of sending out um, supports for students and schools when it's needed. Um, but I guess more specifically, I would look to see um, what we're doing proactively. We've gotten a lot of suggestions from the Jewish communities and, um, and whatnot, and I just would like to make sure that we're actually taking action on that. Thank you. Ms. Yang? Yes, uh, good afternoon. I, too, want to thank everyone for coming in for your testimony today. Uh, many things um, uh, from, uh, that we talk about, I appreciate your comment about teaching compassion. Um, as we go through domestic and international issues, um, our school communities uh, experience many different issues, and we have faced many different issues. So how, while we are teaching our reading and writing, how we teach you how to be compassion, uh, compassionate, empathetic, I think that is uh, a key of what we need to do. And I also uh, want to, if there's uh, a follow-up or explanation, I, I do want to address the Wooten High School ban issue with the ICB. You know, uh, I would like to have an understanding I, as I thought, our school events, uh, and if they go through the proper channel of reservation, this has nothing about school system making money, because I don't think that's what we are after here. So I want to have an understanding, please. Yes. Thank you, uh, Board Member Yang, for bringing that up. Um, I must say, I was a bit taken aback when I heard that response myself here at the table. Um, we do absolutely put our students in our programs first. If they have, you know, are utilizing the building and, and have made those plans to utilize the building, we do give that, give them that opportunity. Now, of course, we do rent out to ICB, but we always give the first right of refusal to our students and to our staff in the buildings. And so I was looking around the room. I know the, uh, Mr. Adams is our representative on that ICB um, board that we meet with, so we will continue to follow up and work with them just to make sure we remedy this, because we do want our community to understand that message loud and clear, that in our schools, the students and staff definitely have first right of refusal. So I'm so glad you brought that up, and I don't see our teacher here, but I want to let her know that we will follow up and we will reach out to her. Just to clarify. Thank you. Ms. Rivetta Oven? Um, yes. Uh, yeah, me too. I would like to thank um, the, the parents, the students, the teachers. Uh, first, I want to thank um, the Black and Brown Coalition. Um, they had an um, amazing turnout at Gaysesburg High School a couple of weeks ago. Um, I want to thank them for their advocacy, for uh, looking out for the best interest of our kids and, and working with the systems to ensure um, that those numbers get better with time. And I know um, that we will have uh, a clear response for them, and we'll be going through some of that data today, I think, with, with some of that. So thank you to them. I, um, too, want to address the Wooden High School issue with the ICB. So I chaired the ICB for 14 years, so I know a little bit about this. Um, so to be clear, foremost, the system, the, the, the students in that building have pretty much uh, the accessibility to anything in that building. That is their school. So um, I know the ICB uh, does rent stuff during the weekends and so on. So it might be, and, and I would love to speak with staff about this, um, a process thing where they, there's some miscommunication going on where something's not getting on the calendar of either the ICB or the high school. 
is, is, is pretty much, I think, goes down to communication and scheduling because um, the students have priority for all their activities. So unless something did not get on a calendar, um, so it could be as a glitch or something, but I think it needs to be clear that, and trust me when I say this, there's not a lot of money to be made when we rent, when we rent, uh, when we rent those rooms, absolutely not. Um, it's more because of accessibility to the community and the uses of either in the PTA or other folks that live in that community. So I just wanted to to ensure the public that uh, we're not making millions um, when it comes to to our school system um, in that area. And then I wanted to address a young um, student with the bomb threat um, and about the response from our system during that time, if anybody could, could speak to that, because we did unfortunately have quite a few of those um, in the last month. So if, if anybody could address that, that'd be greatly appreciated. Yep, I'll turn it over to Mr. Hall, but I will say in, um, in the student's uh, testimony, I mean, he was just sharing the concern and importance of communication, and that is so true. I mean, in our community now, anytime anything happens, you know, we, we're all on high alert, as we should be. But we do work with our principals to make sure that message is communicated to those families. Um, that's important. That's a process that we've always used and one that we believe in to have the school that has the relationship directly with those parents to hear from them. Um, if you remember, I think it was, was it this year? I think it was this year we had our principal talking about the importance of your mind. Yeah, that, was that was this year. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, from Einstein. Um, talking about the importance of using Remind and how, you know, you're able to then send a text message or a message out immediately to families. So, you know, that is exactly what we do. I did hear the student talk about, you know, there being some concern with time in terms of the communication going out. So we will also follow up with him. But we definitely want to, you know, work with the schools to alert their school community immediately when something happens versus it coming from central. Because many times, as you know, as parents, you may have questions and want to follow up about what happened. And so who, are, who best to address those questions and concerns and uh, the people who are there at the school navigating the event? Um, thank you. And the other two issues, two, two points that I wanted to make is the, the holiday for Eid on June 6th. That is already been taken care of. So I just wanted to let uh, our community know that uh, absolutely. And I know that I think if, when it falls on a Friday, it's even Hollier than any other day, so so please know that that um, we did uh, hear the community loud and clear. Um, and the other is our pre-K expansion and universal pre-K. We had quite a few testimony from the community about pre-K. This is something that is very close to my heart, um, and that I know that we're working really hard on, yes. uh, Dr. McKnight. So I, if you just want to respond to to those folks, absolutely. So I mean, I was over here um, gleaming inside as I talked, as I heard our. Uh, community members come up and talk about the joint advocacy and exactly what it is that we need to do to work with the community to expand pre-K. We've had a couple presentations this year on the importance of why that work has to happen. In the last few budgets that I've presented, I've put pre-K in there and really talked about the expansion of it because I believe the more students we're able to get in school earlier, the more gaps we're trying to close later because they are getting access, and so that equity starts right there at the beginning. And so our team has come forward and, uh, and shared information about the expansion. I mean, just from the questions today, it seemed to be more pertinent in terms of the, um, you know, how many seats over 10 years, but I, I look forward to us following up and Dr. Collins and her team, um, you know, meeting with some of the, those who came and testified about how we can expand, but that is absolutely the priority. I've said it before and believe it as you did, uh, Ms. Grace Rivera Oven, um, that's how we're going to solve the problem of equity later in education, to have all of our students in pre-K. Thank you. Ms. Harris? Um, yeah, just a couple quick things, and I did, I did, I did really appreciate all the thoughtful testimony around uh, pre-K expansion and universal pre-K, particularly the offers to partner and, you know, go to Annapolis and let's talk about what we need to do in addition to the provisions of the blueprint to make sure that every every student can access because that is sort of one of the piece, one of the ingredients the secret sauce of, of getting students 
um, moving successfully through through their academic careers. And I did also, I, I really also appreciated the, the testimony, some really constructive testimony. I know Mr. Filater, who left, um, the MCP's teacher, um, I've been following closely the work of the county's anti-hate task force. And they had their last whole group meeting um, a week ago. And I know uh, MCPS has been represented on that task force. And their report, sadly, has been being presented to the county council while we are sitting here today. So we, we couldn't be in both places. But one of the interesting things is they, they broke the, the task force into cohorts. And so they had the Asian AAPI community, and they had the Jewish community, uh, African American, Latino, Jewish, um, into cohorts. And then they all came together. And um, one of the things that the, these adults were trying to grapple with was the, how do we, first of all, expand all of our knowledge and make, and how do we ensure that uh, we all have a, a common understanding of what, you know, each type of bias and bigotry is its roots, what it looks like, what it feels like, but also how to um, how to build those bridges when sometimes um, some of the, the the bias and bigotry one community experiences can come from um, a segment of another, and so how do we really really root that out? And um, I appreciated um, uh, Mr. Felider's acknowledgement that these are really globally complex issues. And um, all of us grapple with them. And so how the schools can incorporate, you know, content in our curricula that helps to, um, helps to dig into some of these globally complex issues, but in age-appropriate ways. Right. Right. Um, um, but I did think they had a really good point that when we, we talk a lot about the professional development and training that we do um, in MCPS around cultural competence and anti-bias, but I do think what the events of the past year have really elevated to me is that we need not one. One size does not, I think, fit all. And I did appreciate the, the, the comment about we need, you know, unique, you know, training for each of these areas around what is anti-Semitism? What are the, the roots of that? What does that look like and feel like? Um, what about Islamophobia? What about homophobia? What about anti-black racism? So because it... Only the members of those impacted communities can really speak to some of those issues. And taking a global approach sometimes about how we, t we teach kindness and tolerance, which are all wonderful things, but that it needs to be reflected through a lens of what is each unique thing? And how do we, how do we increase our collective awareness when that's not our experience, when that's not our community? So we recognize it when it, and it occurs, and I think that I, mean, I I do think that is a key area of our work as a system going forward is to more uniquely tailor some of that training so to help all of us um, be more not be afraid to walk into some of those spaces because sometimes we feel like we don't know what to say we don't know, but um, helping us to all be better upstanders I think. And I did want to admit um, Mr. Kobe's testimony from the Wooten. I had some students that very day, Wooten students who experienced a bomb threat, and one of the things that stuck with me that they, they shared was that they got the messaging, you know, from the AP. They were doing a controlled evacuation. They weren't told why. And so, you know, but they all, you know, followed the rules and did what they were asked, but they were saying, hours before their, they learned from their administration what the cause of the evacuation was, it was on, I think they said the MoCo show, and every, it was on everybody's phone. So they knew through social media within 10 minutes why their school was evacuating, but they didn't get that, that information officially. And I think we have to realize that's the world that we live in. And so um, waiting to get the message perfect or is, um, you know, we, we have to navigate around that. But I also think one of the things I always caution people is that principals should be doing X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, well, in an event like that, I really want the principal to be taking care of the students and the staff. That's where I want their, I want them to be very present in that, not worried about, am I getting this message out? And so it needs to be, you know, held, I mean, we need to be really cognizant of the roles and responsibilities of individuals in the moment when we ask people to do other things. And so be thinking about really who could be taking charge of that piece of it, because really we want the school leaders to be leading um, and keeping their eye on what's actually happening around them. Absolutely. Um, I'll just ask Mr. Hull to follow up. So we, uh, but I do want to say there is a tight process in which there is an outline of what everyone's role is in one of those situations. Although the principal, the message may come out from the principal, 
it may very well be another staff member who has the responsibility of sending that message out. So it, there is a protocol that outlines that, um, and, and uh, I think any opportunity just to continue to talk with our students to make sure they understand it, and most importantly, if they're the people in the situation, communication is happening to make them feel safe and, and valued. Like, we deserve to, you know, we want to know what's happening. Um, just one thing from me, uh, just to follow up on the action in Montgomery advocacy. Um, they were specifically asking for a 10-year plan so that they can see how many seats are going to be added uh, each year. Do we have that, and can we post that as requested or and or send that to them? Oh, as Dr. Pew to come to the table, I, it's, um, when we had this presentation, a couple of months ago, I remember we did go over a long-term plan of exactly what the expansion would be. I just cannot remember if it was how many years it was or how long the plan presented. Yeah. Thank you for that. The um, blueprint is out to 2030. Um, and the way that we design the initial plan is a slow beginning so that we can line up with the capital improvement plan when we can have larger schools and centers to consider. Um, I did uh, meet with the AIM Action in Montgomery group, and we're happy to meet with them to share exactly what our thinking is and where we are. They've offered spaces and places and people, so it'll be a good collaboration. Um, we, they presented at the county council in three, the Opportunity Alliance, ECE, and our team. And so we have work to do because it is going to be a collaboration over time. I think Seth said that it would be the equivalent of building six new elementary schools in six years. And so that's not something a system stands up quite quickly. Um, so we are planning on it, and we do have the projected numbers. One of the pieces that we've been considering is that the blueprint is requiring the 300% level, and so that's been our estimated targets out that, that far, so it's 4,500 additional seats. Um, and how we get there each year, we have planned out looking at the available spaces and looking what's coming available. Yeah, yeah. So I understand there's, there's, there's plans and then there's reality. reality in implementing those plans, but it sounds like you have a plan until 2030. Um, so I'm just asking, is that posted anywhere? It is part of the blueprint implementation plan, but probably not the level of detail with the number of seats that, that our community is asking. So if so. You could, when you share that with AIM, could you share that with the board? Sure. I just I want to yeah. see the, the growth as well. Sure. I'm glad to hear that you connected around facilities because when they met with some board members, they also talked about, hey, we have some faith communities that have spaces. How do they be begin to just understand the process for how a faith community might transform a space into a, a pre-K space. That's yes, right. Mrs. Evans? Yes. Um, can I say one thing about, I'm sorry, Mrs. Can I say, that is exactly what we want. If you remember in the last presentation we talked about, we would not be able to build our way out of the pre-K need. So the request at the time was to actually look at other creative ways to utilize facilities. So I think our faith-based partners or any other partners who are able to work with us to really think about how we do that, that is going to be key because that has been the one of the most significant pieces when we've presented um, in terms of the cost of building out facility that has been significant in the, the outward plan. Thank you. Sorry. No, absolutely. Uh, so I promise I don't want us to be here until midnight. But I did want to um, also ask, could we share with um, AIM the work that we were doing prior to the blueprint being a requirement? Because yes. in 2017, we can go back and show how we've been taking um, half day pre-K to make it full day. I just want people to see the intentionality that the system has been doing all along the way with the blueprint. Um, in mind, knowing that it was going to be a requirement that what we've done up until this point. So I'm thinking of the slogan, uh, we've come a long way, baby, and we have, <laughs> right? So I just want people to see and know that we've been doing this. And I just want to say one other thing. Um, we had really great people come and give testimony today. And um, I really do believe that there are some things that we can do in our school system to help educate our students um, around the various cultures and um, religions and but I also do believe that um, 
this is where we need the help of our parents and our community to share this work with us to help educate our children because we can't do this all by ourselves but I did want to say I appreciate people coming out and sharing their thoughts and giving their feedback but um, we want to have the help of everyone right and for those that don't have the wherewithal we will do our best but this is something that we all must do together I just wanted to state that yes can I just add one last thing on the, on the whole pre-K thing, uh, which I think is wonderful that we're looking at the expansion. But with that expansion, there's also, uh, I would like us to see what the whole transportation issue looks like. Because I know that's, that it's a huge challenge and we had this conversation. I'm still waiting for a little girl to start pre-K from the trailer park community because she has no transportation. Because she had to be, she has to go to another school that's not her current school. and. Those are the challenges we're going to be seeing. I want us to, to start tackling them now and seeing what what does that look like budget-wise for us to be able to do that, even when we do with our partners and so on, because transportation is definitely going to play um, a huge accessibility issue for a lot of our families. Mr. Hall? Yeah, um, thank you for that. So uh, the pre-K team has done a great job working with our facilities folks, as was mentioned, but also transportation. And so um, one of the blueprint accelerators that is included in the budget is about a half a million dollars for next year for transportation, and that will continue to be an investment that we make. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we are done with our public comments, and now we have modified our agenda. Uh, to move up the calendar discussion first, so we are moving to item 13. Uh, so, Dr. McKnight, if you could proceed with the calendar presentation. All right, thank you, Ms. Avestri. And um, I just want to say that um, we've already heard some information about calendar consideration in our public comment, and so I'm glad that we're um, getting this discussion started, and we are talking about the calendar for 24-25 school years, the traditional calendar, as well as the innovative school calendars. Um, I'd like to thank board members for your continued contributions around this topic. I know that we've brought this forward several times for dialogue in board business meetings in October 26. Um, there was also a discussion on uh, November 17th about it. And the Special Policy Board Policy Management Committee, um, you know, were able to have those discussions. So um, Ms. Madrowski, I know she had to leave, but she is the chair of the committee, so I did want to, yes. you know, share my appreciation. And Absolutely. Um, and so um, in, her, in Mrs. Madrowski's absence, she asked me to um, just speak. And so I just really want to thank my colleagues. Um, back on October 26, we all came together to approve and move forward the calendar. And then what the policy committee did was, once that calendar was put out, take into consideration the comments and the feedback that we received from our community. And that happened on November the 17th. So right now, we have before you today the revisions, and um, we have just outstanding staff that has shared with us all the things that they've done to go out to the community to engage them to gather input so I would turn it over to Miss Edwards at this time and when we get done we're gonna um, indeed vote and approve the calendar good afternoon everyone so good to see you um, president Silvestri vice president Harris dr. McKnight as miss Evans shared uh, we are here to share the superintendent's recommended calendar for 2425 do want to thank the policy management committee for the discussion the guidance as well as the board back in October as well we'll do two things today as we get started one we will provide uh, the superintendent's recommended calendar for 2425 in addition, we will share and give a preview of current data that we've collected about the 20, about the 2526 calendar. Remember, because we had a commitment to kind of forecasting out for two years, just so we can hear what our community and stakeholders are saying to increase that level of predictability um, and really thinking about a full year engagement plan. So the next slide, as we all know, um, our school year calendar really provides the structure for us to be able to leverage the strategic plan um, and really puts in the opportunities for us to meet each and every part of the pathway, and that's really critical. It creates the time, space, and structure, and it really um, aligns with the guidelines from MSDE for the calendar, as well as for our policy under IDA. 
Next slide. Mrs. Evans talked about the process that we've been through from August up until today and each step of the process we have um, stayed very, very focused in terms of how we gain input, really think about what people are saying and, um, and reflect that within the recommendations that we've brought forward as well as getting feedback. So it has been a great process that we've been through talking to students, staff, families and community members. Next slide. I shared this with you, those two bookmarks on the end, the interest and feedback have been critical for us that have really helped us to develop scenarios. Um, many of um, the people that you've heard speak about the calendar, we have engaged them um, along the process and that's really been critical for us to be able to hear voice. We've spent a lot of time um, to really be able to fortify and bring forward today a calendar that we believe represents who we are as MCPS, but doesn't for Forget about the purpose of our school district, which is to educate our children. Next slide. I'll have Ms. Malchody talk about just a review of phase one and phase two in terms of the community surveys, um, which we had an opportunity to be able to leverage this year. Thank you. Um, in phase two, we took a similar approach as phase one in terms of really using the anti-racist and culturally responsive engagement tool as a guide for how we engaged with people. And that includes things as simple as the visuals and the language included in the survey, as well as how we went out into the community to you know, sort of solicit that information. And for us, we felt like that was a very strong part of phase one. We got a lot of feedback on that. And so we really wanted that to continue with phase two, knowing it was gonna be a little bit different. Next slide, please. So what you can see here is sort of um, a little bit of a snapshot of some of the ways in which we have thought about engagement through this process. Um, you can see some of our bus stops where we went with um, principals, we went with staff members, we went to the international office, we met with student leaders as well as our student athletic leaders. Um, one of the most compelling ones um, that occurred during phase two was to go to family markets. Um, that is a place where there are a lot of families who are there to get resources and services, and they have valuable impact input to give. And you know, some of them said, "I've never been asked questions like this before." Um, and to work with translators, I also would be remiss if I didn't thank our student member of the board for his engagement with students, which, as we talked about last time, we can think we're cool enough to do that, but <laughs> we're just not. And so just really to say thank you again. Um, this process has been so amazing in terms of growth. I, you know, I've been an educator my entire adult life, and for me, I probably learned more this year in this process than I have in a very long time in terms of thinking about something that seems so simple and, and so basic, but really um, just takes on so much of what, what it means to be a part of this community. Um, I also cannot help but thank our communications department anytime we wanted them to do something, our technology department anytime we wanted something, everyone was there to help us and we really felt that and so I just wanted to say thank you because we wouldn't be here without everyone really supporting us through this process and to really bring forth something that we're very proud of. And that, that means a lot. Um, and it, it's, it's a really special thing. So from our students to our um, families to everyone who has been a part of this, we just really want to say thank you. Next slide, please. So with that second part, we really looked at Okay, we have these two different calendars, a lot of similarities, but that, that big piece of that before Labor Day or after Labor Day. And as you can see, a resounding amount of people, not only in the survey, but also in feedback that we got formally and informally, felt strongly about starting before Labor Day. Next slide, please. In addition to that, we saw a couple different themes in our feedback. As we said, we, we you know, sought like very um, quantitative feedback in terms of this or that, but also really looking at um, people who took the time to write in comments and who took the time to email me or call me. I even was on the phone with people yesterday talking about it. Um, and some of the big themes were you know, sort of thinking about that start and end of the year. I actually went back and watched a lot of the old board meetings and someone 
joked about the Labor Day to Memorial Day, the pool year, school year, and how everyone wishes we could do something like that. But in reality, we have these, um, you know, sort of expectations from the state as well as our own policy. Um, really thinking about those professional days in terms of our staff as well as our families and impact. And with that also breaks and thinking about times for, you know, people to really be able to reflect and just t take a break from everything and then come back refreshed and ready to go. So really seeing those themes come up over and over again in, in our feedback. Next slide, please. So our second round with our policy management committee was really important because after um, what Ms. Malchody shared with you in terms of the survey, we know similar to the first survey, the survey did not represent what our MCPS community looks like, which is why those conversations in those different realms was really important to be able to hear voice. We brought all that information back to policy management, and they asked for us to consider a couple of things that you'll see in the recommended calendar. One, um, we actually uh, utilize a professional day. Um, we have a professional day every year in the fall. The recommendation from policy management was to move that professional day to October 18th, to align with the Maryland State Teachers Conference. We had conversation around by doing that, we want to make sure that on that day, we've used that professional day to really build coherence around the anti-racist audit, make sure professional development was delivered to staff, and really looking at how we continue to do that, um, even if we do have people that go to the State Teachers Conference to make sure that we are aligning that. The second piece that was a request from Policy Management Committee and we did hear from uh, Samira when you came to testify. This year is a, a year where both of the Eid celebrations do fall on a weekday. And so um, as a district, we have used our professional days to align with many of our religious celebrations and a current and um holidays. And so what you will see in the recommended calendar is that we do have June 6th as a professional day, working with our team that builds out the system-wide, the district-wide professional development. We see that as a good opportunity. You've heard us talk this year about the school improvement plan. The school improvement plan has some, some good bookends. One of the best ones is at the end of the school year. And oftentimes we hear about our schools going into ILT week and looking at a lot of the data. We've heard a lot about collaboration. That June 6th is prime time. I got excited. I felt like, should I go back and be a principal and try this out? Because on that June 6th date, you're looking at your data from the year. You're hearing from your staff. It gives an opportunity to think about how to engage with families, but that's a time where a lot of our school central offices, we're doing hiring as well. So how about opening up and having people visit and kind of see your school live and participate at that opportunity? So it's, it is a good place for us to really think about how to leverage in a different way. I'm excited, as you can tell, about that. The third component we did talk about, if you take a look at the recommended calendar, is on November 4th and November 5th. November 5th is an election day um, for the coming year. And during policy management, um, we had the conversation about when should the quarter end? We originally brought it to the board where it was October 31st, and there was a lot of conversation about fall festivals, interest in students being in school and, and staff being in school on um, Halloween on that day on the 31st, but also being cognizant of operational impact for the district if we came to school on a Monday, didn't go on a Tuesday, and so forth. So the recommended calendar does include, um, if you notice, on October 4th, and fifth to two days connected so that as we think about it, we heard testimony about substitutes, we heard testimony about different areas. And as we looked at each one of these, I do want to bring the board into knowing that we did look through our equity questions so we're clear on who does this advantage and disadvantage as well so we understand the impact spread across the board. So we do thank Policy Management Committee for that discussion. 
I'll transition now to share the recommended calendar. I've shared a couple of pieces with you already. If we go to the next slide. Um, and so as we share, we will have two things. Um, this is the traditional calendar, and I'll also switch to the innovative school year calendar. This calendar has us beginning before Labor Day on uh, August the 20. Six, mm -hmm. thank you. On August the twenty, I don't have my glasses today. So on August the twenty-six, uh, for uh, the start of school, um, coming into September, you'll notice that we do have an instructionally sound month of co um, continuous instruction that is there. We do have a non-instructional day on October the third, and the quarter does end on the eighteenth. We heard feedback from the community to continue the early release days connected with the Thanksgiving holiday um, that leads us into the end of November. And then you will see in at the end of December the winter break schedule. Moving into the second half of the year in 2025, um, you will notice that the, in uh, January there are, are there's excuse me, in January and the 20th, the one thing I do want to highlight for the board is the 20th is Martin Luther King's birthday, but it is also inauguration day. So they are blended together on that day if you are seeking that. Um, and then moving into April, you will notice we went with the earlier spring break. That was direct feedback that we received. And then June 6th, to highlight that was a recommendation from policy management to align that professional day um, with uh, EAD. Our school year would end on uh, June 13th, um, which is the second week in June, which is still pretty early. And we have blended in makeup days, not only at the end of the year, but throughout the year as well, should we um, have to take off for inclement weather. So that is the recommended calendar that we bring forth for traditional. Um, if we move to the next slide, um, we have the innovative school year calendar, which we build the two at the same time, um, working through a very similar process. If you look in your appendix, there is feedback in terms of what we have received regarding the innovative school year calendar with their first day of instruction starting on July 8th. And that was important that we heard that, that they wanted to begin after July 4th. So we were able to accommodate that um, in addition to to um, many of their professional days align with that of the traditional calendar. And then the last day of their instructional year would be on June 13th to align with the traditional calendar. So those are our two calendars that we bring forward for board adoption today. Prior to the adoption, I just want to be able to share with the board just some of the general feedback that we've heard about the second year of 25-26. Um, if we go to the next slide, there is interest um, moving for the 25-26 school year of looking at, again, a before Labor Day start. At this time, we've got about 63% um, of people who have shared that that is an interest. The good part is it does give us the year to do full year engagement, come back to policy management committee to discuss it, and look at when we would adopt the calendar possibly earlier. It would be you know, the pleasure of policy management committee to make that recommendation. The second thing we've heard in terms of the 25-26 in terms of preliminary data on the second slide, we also, um, on the next slide, uh, sought some feedback around the winter break. Because of when winter break is falling for 25-26, we wanted to hear about just the traditional time frame, extending it, or thinking about a two-week winter break. One critical part that as we get this feedback in that we'll have to really understand is what is the impact? You know, who does this exclude? Who is this a benefit for? Um, especially the consideration around our families, um, children being in school, as well as our 10-month employees as well. So we appreciate this initial thinking and we'll take that into consideration 
And then the last part that we've heard from for 2526 is really the piece on the next slide about an early or a late spring break. And right now we're hearing um, that the later spring break in the second week of April is kind of where the energy falls. So we have some work to do around here, but it's good to hear early um, and kind of start to vision it out. So as we close up today, um, our next steps um, on the, the final slide are really important. One, I will stop talking shortly and open up for questions and look forward to adoption. But the second component is um, we will be working to really be able to build out the 25-26 calendar, continuing with um, a very illustrative engagement process. But what we heard in terms of how the calendar is utilized as a communication tool and really highlighting not only religious observances but other things in which people can interact with it, not only through the web, but information in which we send out. So we're really excited to do that next step with the people that we've been working with. Um, so thank you very much, um, and I will now turn it over for questions and or discussion. Mr. Said? Yeah, uh, so this is great. Uh, I want to commend you guys again on um, all the great work you guys did with gathering community input. I mean, the ideas you guys had to actually go to, uh, for example, like these family markets. I mean, I, I couldn't even think of that. I mean, that's fantastic. That is fantastic outreach to the community. And I, I really want to, you know, see that again next year, which I know you guys will deliver on. I just had a couple quick questions. So one of them was, I know that we heard a lot that we wanted um, the day after Halloween. Um, that we wanted that one off, and I know that's something that we, that we talked about as a board and all that. I, if I'm correct, I didn't see that on the calendar, so is it just because we reached the limit on days and it was just like kind of a balancing act? I just want to know a little about that. We, when we were in policy management, one of the big interests was that we not extend past June 13th for the end of the school year. So that was one component. The second piece, um, when we looked at the originally the grading um, day that's on November the 4th was actually on October the 31st. And so we went through and we really evaluated if we move that day to November the 1st, then that means that would be um, 31st, would, that Thursday would be a school day, Friday wouldn't be a school day, Monday would be a school day, and then Tuesday wouldn't. So we had to evaluate some operational impacts that were there. And so um, one of the pieces we discussed with policy management is that we wanted to take it back to our calendar committees. And we talked through with our calendar committees to kind of really have an understanding of what would be best thinking about educational, the diversity of our district, but also the operational impact. And so what we brought forward was, some, was something that took into account all of those pieces, but really elevated more the operational impact and us being able to function as a school system. Okay, yeah, I totally get that. Sometimes just with the days off we have, kind of your hands are tied. Um, but just, you know, for the future calendar for the 25, 26, I want to reiterate the importance of that because I got that so much from students. And I know that, you know, a big impact also, students are just not going to come, a lot of students, the day after because you're staying up until 12, 1, 2 a.m. And so I think that that's another big impact we have to consider as well. But I totally understand. And then uh, one more question I was actually receiving uh, a lot about throughout this whole year, and it's kind of pertinent to the calendar, is, you know, we heard a lot about, you know, on snow days, what happens with the virtual school. That is something I've gotten all through my direct messages consistently. Uh, so, you know, if you could explain, um, you know, what happens when there is a snow day, are we going to have that virtual day? Is it going to be optional? What, that, what that's going to look like? This has been the, the second biggest conversation in our office for the past <laughs> yeah. couple of weeks. And I wish Mr. Adams was here because I was like, the snow is coming. He's like, no, it's not. So we have like this debate going back and forth. It is coming, though. Um, so the last couple of years, the state has given us the opportunity to apply to have virtual instruction days um, during uh, inclement weather. We did make the application last year for this year, and we are approved to do that. We will, um, what we have shared, la what we shared last year and what we're preparing to move forward in the next coming couple of weeks is we still will have snow days 
in terms of the, the purity of a snow day. However, the virtual instructional days provide us an opportunity to utilize if we have used all of our makeup days. We also only want to use those as much as possible um, if we have a predictable weather event, i.e. blizzard. Mm -hmm. um, something that's going to be a multi-day event that we can predict because we know it's a level of preparedness people need to have. You need to take your stuff home with you the, the previous day or if we're out of days. So we will make a, a very cautious decision there. Um, we heard from our elementary principals, like, can you start alerting people even a couple of days before, which we, do, we will do because we track these weather systems very, very closely. Um, um, so we would love, as always, to come talk to you about it um, and talk to your team and, mm -hmm. you know, do some, um, where's Mr. Cram, some some live morning okay. of decisions as we're out on the road. Um, but we definitely know that the communication and the level of preparedness are critical. Gotcha. So from what I'm hearing, I'm hearing that if there's if we are predicting that there's going to be multiple days we're not going to have school, that's when mainly we're going to use the virtual days. We're going to try and predict that that that's kind of OK, just because students always ask it. And, you know, it's always hard to give a clear answer. It's a it's a great question because we've never done it. We've exactly. always said we were going to do it and we just haven't done it. And we're rusty with mm. um, virtual. But just to put on the record, snow days still do exist. There still will be days where there is no school on a snow day. Okay, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. That's all for me. Yes, Ms. So Mrs. Mondrowski wanted me to let everyone know that although she is not able to be here, she had to leave, um, that she is listening in. And she wanted to say thank you, thank you, thank you so much for the amazing job that was done to um, incorporate the revisions and just the extra time that was spent. Um, Ms. Melchovy talked about going to the bus stops and family markets, and as a result, you're, invi you're invited back just to come, just to show up to say hi. So we appreciate that. And then she wanted to also extend that thanks to just um, her colleagues and of course the committee members. So I, I too want to say thank you. This was, um, it, was a, it was a good process, right? And then I do appreciate um, Mr. Saeed stepping in and <laughs> surveying the students, right, real yeah. quickly, <laughs> right, and um, just sharing that feedback. So just wanted to acknowledge you all for all the hard work and, and the difference that we made in just um, a calendar year and how we've engaged our community. So thank you. If, if I may, Ms. Evans, I just wanted to thank you. Uh, uh, Ms. Silvestri, that part about Mr. Saeed and the students. So I have to tell you, I mean, it was, I just like to acknowledge our students and their creative thinking. We were having a conversation about the calendar, and he said to me, if it's feedback that we want, I can get hundreds of students of thousands in minutes. And I said, well, <laughs> you know, that's exactly what he said. And I said, well, why don't we, why don't we give you that opportunity to do that? And so truly, it was a very, so he did it. And we had so much student feedback, more than we've ever had before. And I just share that because I know today we were talking a lot about communication and, you know, from public comment and other spaces. And it's almost like knowing the type of communication that has to be addressed for particular groups. Um, and so he, he said it confident, confidently to me immediately. I'll get feedback. And we'll have it in minutes, and I'll get it back. And that's exactly what happened. And so we, you know, we're going to continue to utilize he as our student uh, member of the board just in that way when we need that student feedback and that much around these issues. And we'll continue to think about that as we, as we you know, just talk about outreach overall. What is it that's needed for everybody recognizing that it's different? So I just wanted to thank you for that as well. I, I really, really appreciate that. And, you know, just to reiterate comments stated earlier, I am the only one cool enough to be able to get that <laughs> feedback. So that's just one thing I want to say. <laughs> just kidding. But uh, seriously, uh, social media is such a powerful tool. And so utilizing that has been one of the joys of being a student member of the board and getting that feedback. And I continue to do that. I just posted, because you guys had the picture of one of the polls I did in, in the slides. I just posted that and said, guys, fill out these polls, because we're showing in board meetings your voice is being heard. Um, so I, I will gladly continue to do that. I really, really appreciate the shout out. Um, so yes, thank you so much. And I'll, I'll continue to do this work. 
Yep. Sevens. I was going to say, and I see Sam in the audience. Uh, Mr. Saeed, I don't know if everyone knows that he has staff, and so they are really diligent in helping him to do his work. So I wanted to say hello to her and acknowledge her. Yes, he is very efficient. <laughs> All right. Well, if there are no other comments or discussion, um, I think we have to vote on the calendar. Whereas the establishment of school terms by the Board of Education is required by Maryland state law, and whereas Montgomery County Public Schools, parents, caregivers, community members, students, and staff should be informed of the Board of Education adopted school year calendar each year and the subsequent contingency plan identifying days that will be used to make up lost instructional time due to emergency closing. And whereas Montgomery County Public Schools conducted an inclusive calendar development process that included convening focus groups of internal and external stakeholders, soliciting open comments and survey responses and re review by the Board of Education Policy Management Committee on November 17, 2023, and whereas our and Roscoe R. Nix Elementary Schools operate on an innovative school year calendar with additional instructional days. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the proposed calendars and contingency plan for Montgomery County Public Schools for the 24-25 traditional and innovative school year calendars be adopted. Move approval. So it's coming from committee, so we don't need to do that. You can just call the vote, Ms. Sepestri. Thank you. All in favor to approve the calendars, please raise your hand. And that is unanimous with those present. Thank you so much for your work. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Malchody and uh, Ms. Edwards. Great presentation. Great job. Thank you. Okay, so now we will move back to our agenda item seven, student data uh, pathway milestone 2022-23 meets or exceeds grade level or core standards in math and English language arts for grades six through eight. Dr. McKnight. Yes, thank you. Uh, Ms. Silvestri and I will ask the staff to come uh, down to the table as we move into our next presentation focused on our student data pathway milestones. Um, so today we're going to actually share our fourth presentation related to the academic milestones that are in the uh, pathway to college career and community readiness. We made a commitment early on that we would come to the board and give these updates on a regular basis. And so I'm excited that we are in December and we're already at our fourth meeting. So thank you to the team. Um, I feel like this is because the team has just been evolving and it's been wonderful having you come and just continue to give these updates because the more we talk about this data and share it out, really it just speaks to where we are and uh, the progress that's been made and the work that we'll continue to do. So today we're going to look at the fourth academic milestone indicator in the pathway, which is uh, students meeting or exceeding math and English language arts grade level um, or course standards in grades six through eight. So with that, I'll turn the presentation over to Dr. Collins. And as we, um, as with our last Pathway Milestone presentation, this indicator is different from how we talked about math and literacy data in past presentations. By examining proficiency in both math and English collectively, we have a deeper understanding of what students need to know and be able to do can identify strengths and weaknesses and provide targeted support and interventions. This milestone and other milestones that make up our pathway to college, career, and community readiness were developed to support the expectations of the blueprint for Maryland's future to help us ensure our students develop a strong foundation before they transition to college or work. This indicator is measured by the Maryland Comprehensive Assessment Program or Dynamic Learning Maps Assessment in each subject area. Today is the first time we will share data for this milestone, which includes grades six through eight students tested during the 2022-23 school year. I now turn the presentation over to Dr. Peggy Pugh, Chief Academic Officer, who will continue today's presentation. 
Thank you, Dr. Collins. We're happy to be here again to talk about some of the data that we see in our milestones. So next slide, please. As we've become familiar with uh, aligning our data presentations to our strategic plan, and this falls squarely under academic excellence in math and literacy, um, we're highlighting this pathway to college career and community readiness because we believe that these are the measures that will help us understand where our children are on that uh, progress towards meeting uh, college career and community readiness, which is the board's goal. So today, as Dr. Collins shared, we'll have information about what the MCAP is, um, about what dynamic learning maps are. Dr. Addison will share an analysis of, or share the data uh, for our analysis. And then you'll hear from the team about what they really saw as being a call to action. So this data point, the data points that you're going to see are actually from the end of year last year. <clears throat> so this isn't new data, and this is data that we've actually been acting on because it was predicted sort of at the in the middle of the year last year when there was great concern about our math and literacy data. And since then, quite a bit has been done to address and to begin planning to make sure that the data do reflect what our students know and can do. So there's three overarching points uh, to take away today. One is that we have reviewed the data and that we do have a response and that response is in progress. Um, we have a laser-like focus. We know that our, our goal is to improve outcomes in literacy and math for all students. And to do that, the data tells us that we need to really focus on curriculum implementation, making sure we're actually delivering curriculum the way that it's planned to be delivered at the level of standard it's supposed to be. Um, planning and instruction, making sure that our teachers have support in planning for who our students are as they go into the instruction. Language supports are specifically spelled out and our teachers are capable and comfortable for building in those language supports in all classes. And then our own routine and ongoing progress monitoring. What do we see um, as we're moving through the year? The second key point is that I really want you to know we're trying to maximize the board's investment in the FY24 school year where we recognize that we needed to do much more targeted professional learning with our teachers. We have done several things over the summer to prepare them, prepare school teams to do this work, and we continue to do the coaching with the board's investment in mathematics coaches and the continued investment in reading specialists, which really give us a person in the school who supports uh, teaching and learning. And then finally, we continue to need, as has been expressed throughout the day this morning, um, family and community involvement in this work. Um, it is critical that we have partners like the Black and Brown Coalition and others who have come forward to tell us what's working and what's not working and what we can do together to make it better. The board's commitment for two-way communication has really been around making sure that what we do say is makes sense to families about where children are. We've done a lot of work to uh, make the pathway be more accessible in terms of questions that parents can ask at parent conferences. We've had it translated into multiple languages. We've also uh, wanted to provide an understanding of the reports that our families get from their report cards to their individual school reports to their individual student reports so that it can make sense for a family to know how their child is doing. So again, the three points, data review and we're responding. The second point, we're using the budget that was invested last year to drive change specifically this year. And the third, it is a community initiative and we need to continue to work together in partnership. Next slide. So here is the pathway. You've seen this multiple times. Um, we are actually on grades four through eight. We broke this up because we gave elementary data, grades four and five for math and literacy last time. And this time we'll focus on grades six through eight specifically in middle school. And again, the assessment is uh, from the end of the year last year, and it is a combination of those multiple measures. And it is for students who meet the college and career readiness standards, which which have been widely research based and had, were created with great amount of impact and used to be able to uh, uh, determine how students were doing across the nation on a sort of comparative level. Um, this is informed by uh, evidence-based practices. It's collective knowledge of educators and researchers and experts. That's the common core state standards which should guide all of our instruction. 
And so these assessments that we're talking about today are built on the framework of those standards. Um, these standards, the alignment is to help students develop the skills that they need to thrive in a global economy and an ever-changing workforce, both here and nationally and internationally. The next slide, please. So in a high level, what is assessed on each of these um, examinations? So the English language arts literacy assessment in sixth, seventh, and eighth, really focusing on having students read and respond to information. Um, they have to be able to, to express their understanding, often through writing and through analysis at a deep level. It is beyond recall. It's beyond just memorization. It's beyond just vocabulary. It requires uh, deep skill in, in working through complex text. In middle school, students are continuing to extend their skills gained at the elementary level and beginning to focus more on the breadth and depth of their literacy across all content areas, right? Because they learn a lot in science and social studies that has background information so that when they're reading something, then they are able to respond because they've had experiences with it. Um, the Common Core State Standards have very clear and rigorous expectations for students. And the mathematics assessment is far different than how you and I took math classes in that we had to get the right answer. And we sometimes had to show our work. But this is actually asking students to understand mathematics in a conceptual way, not just a computational way. Computation's part of it. They have to get the right answer. But actually understanding the mathematics in a way that they can explain it to others using modeling and reasoning is a much higher level skill than what we did ourselves, or what I did anyway, in mathematics back when I took math. So um, next slide, please speaks to the second uh, portion because we want our pathway document to be inclusive of all students, right? And not all students are taking those uh, middle school math and literacy assessments because they're not appropriate for them, right? We have a number of students who take the dynamic learning maps, which is an assessment that's aligned to the essential skills that are in the standards, but they're not at the level of the standards. So this is when it's not appropriate for the students to take this assessment. Most of these students are not on a diploma track, and they have to go through quite a bit of uh, identification and processes in order to make sure that if we say that this is the pathway that they go, that there's been a lot of checks and balances and that that's renewed consistently. So we really felt our teachers do a lot of work to make sure that our students have access to good, rigorous coursework in these content areas in those classes, and we want to recognize and honor the achievements of the students through the dynamic learning maps. Next slide, please. So before we do the data an uh, analyst and share currently the deep actions and the future next steps that we'll have to improve the data, I want to take a moment to personalize this data. Because again, we're talking about students whose school experiences were not like many of ours sitting around the tables. They would be like yours, Mr. Saeed, but not like many of the students. These students actually, uh, the eighth graders that are in the data, are currently sitting in our ninth grade. They started middle school through a virtual learning experience, with some teachers implementing a new district curriculum for the very first time. So virtual learning, new curriculum, <laughs> with teachers implementing it for their very first time. The following year, it was interrupted learning. As you remember, we continued to have um, classes quarantined and mandatory um, times when students couldn't be in person, uh, followed by a, a more normal year, I would say, post-pandemic post recovery. So sixth, seventh, and eighth grade are pretty pivotal years in a student's and young person's life. The middle school journey for these eighth graders was all but normal. But we do believe that our students and our teachers put their best foot forward each day. They worked hard. We know the data does not show what we believe our students are capable of doing, and I want to pre predict that for you, that the data that you're about to see is not great, but we also don't believe that it shows everything that there is that our students know and can do that you might see through multiple measures. We do have work to do, and we will continue on that hard work, and we have very smart and dedicated people both here and in the classroom directly to make sure that we make an impact. Next slide, please. Now turn it over to Dr. Addison. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Keisha Addison. I'm the director in the Office of Shared Accountability. And so I am going to be walking you through the data for our academic milestone under the pathway for college and career readiness that both Dr. Collins and Dr. Pugh mentioned. 
Um, as we shared, as was shared earlier, our pathway aligns to state expectations. So it is important to spend a little time highlighting the performance of students at the middle school level on the Maryland Comprehensive Assessment Program, or the MCAP. The MCAP is the Maryland State Department of Education assessment that provides information on the extent to which students are meeting academic standards needed to be successful beyond high school. Student proficiency, which is what is on this slide, is um, organized into four levels, and it's a four-point scale. And so it ranges from level one, which is beginning level, level two, developing learner, level three, proficient learner, and level four, distinguished learner. The slides detail the percentage of students at levels three or and or four um, demonstrating proficiency and thus meeting or exceeding grade level expectations and they are on track for being ready for college level coursework when they graduate from high school. So to acclimate you to this slide, to the layout of the slide, you have results for students who are in sixth grade during the 21-22 school year, which is labeled as 22 and is in light purple, and the 22-23 school year, which is in that teal blue on the right side. On the slides are results for MCPS and the state of Maryland. So let's first take a look at math six or grade six. So during the 21-22 school year, 25.9% of grade six MCPS students who took the math six MCAT demonstrated proficiency. That is, they scored a three or higher um, on that four point scale. And this compares to 17.6% of grade six students in the state of Maryland who demonstrated proficiency. During the 22-23 school year, 27.3% of grade six MCPS students who took the math six MCAT demonstrated proficiency compared to 18.9% of those in the state. In the middle of the slide is the performance for math seven for MCPS and the state of Maryland, where you see slightly higher percentages of students demonstrating proficiency for the state of Maryland compared to the district. And in the last section of the slide are the results for math eight. One thing I want to highlight is the number of students who took the math eight assessment. You will notice much lower numbers of students. And it's important to note that students take the state assessment aligned to the course that they are enrolled. And so as you think about um, course, math course enrollment specifically in MCPS, we do have students in middle school who are taking the algebra assessment. So this, what you see on the slide, is demonstrating or showing those who were proficient in math eight, took that math eight assessment. And of those students who took the math eight MCAP, Less than 5% demonstrated proficiency across the two years in MCPS, and less than 8% demonstrated proficiency in the state. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Continuing with the organization on the slide of MCPS in the state of Maryland results and the grade level organization, we transition to proficiency for English language arts and literacy. The first thing I'm sure you notice is that we have higher percentages of students across grades six through eight who demonstrated proficiency during the 21-22 school year and the 22-23 school year. Additionally, for each grade level, higher percentages of students demonstrating, demonstrated proficiency in the 2022-2023 school year compared to 2021-2022 ranging from a 0.4 percentage point increase at grade eight to a 4.8 percentage point increase at grade seven. And for 2022, 2023, across grades six through eight, on average, 53% of our students demonstrated proficiency on the MCAP assessment. Next slide, please. So during our last presentation on the pathway, which focused on the MCAP for students in grades four and five, one of the questions you all raised as a board was the performance of our emergent multilingual learners, or EMLs. Um, this slide shows the performance for the 2022-2023 school year. On the left side of the screen are results for English language arts and literacy, and on the right are the math results. You are able to see the number of students who took each respective MCAP assessment and the percent who demonstrated proficiency, again, that level three or higher. 
In general, according to the Maryland State Department of Education, all students must be included to the fullest extent possible in all state assessment programs, with their results being a part of the state accountability system. And so for our emergent multilingual learners, it is important to understand this, that there is a special exemption condition um, from the state for EMLs on the ELA and literacy assessment. Maryland exempts recently arrived EMLs from one administration on its reading assessment during the first year of enrollment in United States schools per federal law. And so recently arrived EMLs from the state definition is meaning a student who has attended school in the U.S. for less than 12 cumulative months. And so they may be exempted from one administration of the English language arts and literacy assessment. So I wanted to put that out there just so you're clear in terms of who we're looking at. And as you look at the percentages on this slide, you will notice that as the English language proficiency level or ELP, as you see indicated on the slide, as those as the ELP or English language proficiency level increases, so does the percentage of students demonstrating proficiency on the English language arts and the literacy assessment. Next slide, please. Can you put your mic on? Your mic's not on. Can you go back to the slide prior to, to, to that one? So on math eight, the 0, 0.0, what does that mean? So that means that none of the students who were designated as English language proficiency f level four met proficiency in math eight. Okay, but I thought you just said that they were all getting better. I said for literacy, English language arts. Oh, for English. Yes. Yeah, so oh. if you look at the English language arts. I'm sorry. Literacy. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. I misheard you. Okay. So then, out of the one thousand three hundred sixty-eight students, not one met in math in level four so it, met that it could have been a low number you know sometimes when you have a low number of students meet but even when you do calculate the percentage it still comes out to less than no no i, I know i i'm not the expert that's what i'm asking <laughs> yeah that's, no so yeah. there there might be a handful of students who did meet proficiency it's just that when we translate it to a percentage it still it's comes not it's not it's not strong enough to Correct. to Okay, but do, do we know at all? So we do, but okay. part of what we do intentionally for our public presentations also, like we have not applied data suppression, but one of the things that we wouldn't want to do is to say it's five students, but definitely the um, team led by Ms. Hewlett knows um, which students would have met the MCAP proficiency level for our English um, learners. Okay, because I guess my question is then we know exactly who these kids are. Yes. So then, for, then we will be able to work with them for ninth and 10th, hopefully. Like yes. We know exactly where they are, who they are. Yes. By name, last name. Yes, yes. Allergy. So as, as we've shared um, before at previous presentations and also for this, all of our data is in our internal data management system. So we have our internal data management system of Performance Matters, which has all of the essential information for our students. It has our MCAP results in that system and allows for not only school building leaders but also central office leaders to pull up the information to know which students they are and to look at additional multiple data points for students to understand what supports and interventions they may need. Okay, and I guess, you know, when we look at these, uh, these numbers, there's a lot of assumptions made, but it could be that kids came in with interrupted education at that level and they were not in our system and level LP1, LP2, LP3, and we got them into the system in LP4, right? So I guess to me, all those things are kind of important to kind of tell the whole story. Yes, and I'm sure as we progress through this presentation, you'll hear more from the curriculum team around the supports that are in place for students from right, in mathematics specifically. It's one of the things I hear from um, from principals who have a high number of LEP students, um, like Jason's for High School, for example, has a very high number of kids with interrupted education and ESL and so on, right? Is that that support at these levels are so crucial in order to be able to help the kids for the ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th grade. But sometimes that story is not very well known mm -hmm. 
So for me, it helps me, sorry, I'm thinking out loud, but it helps me to understand where we can then allocate either more math coaches or, you know, or other, other services when we have, you know, these populations that we know are in great need of support. Yes, and I appreciate your sharing that. And one of the things um, for us to think about is as we as we come each time, as Dr. McKnight shared, to <clears throat> identify each of the measures on the pathway, it's a progression, right? So we started at those early grades. We did kindergarten. We did grade three, four, five. Now we're at middle school. And so as we continue to have this conversation, you will continue to hear how we build on the supports that are needed to help students as they progress through the school district. Harris? Yeah. Just an observation as we're looking at this chart. It, it would help me, I think, when we look at the ends under the, the column headers, but those that N encompasses um, basically four different ELP groups to know how many students are we looking at in each group, how many ELP fours, how many ELP threes, because sure. um, I think that also is informative and it helps us make decisions about Yes. Yes. Thank so we you. do have that, and we can share that with you. I, I won't read them off here. Yeah, but that's fine. But thank you. <laughs> can you give him an example? I didn't really understand what you were saying, Ms. Harris. Yeah. So just looking, if you look at Math Eight, the far right hand corner, in is there's 1,368 yep. students, but that encompasses four different ELP levels. And yep. so how many students are in each level? Yeah. Oh. Okay. So how many are in ELP four? How many ELP? So yeah. And so I will, just for uh, your knowledge and awareness, for Math 8, ELP 4, there are 96 students. 96? Yes. Okay. So, that, so we can get that information to you, but just so you know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go on with the presentation. All right. Thank next you. slide, please. <laughs> okay. So we transition now to a view of students who were in emergent multilingual learners. More specifically, we are looking at the proficiency rates for recently exited EMLs. So emergent multilingual learners exit when they have achieved an overall proficiency level of 4.5 or above on the English language proficiency test or the WIDA access assessment. And so data on this slide represent those who are recently exited emergent multilingual learners, meaning they recently exited within two years. And it aligns with the language from the Maryland State Department of Education, which states that English learners who no longer require Title III services and who are exited from English language development services are monitored for two years to ensure that these students continue to make progress in meeting challenging state academic content and student achievement standards for each of the two years after they have exited. So again, this slide represents the 2022-2023 MCAT performance of recently exited emergent multilingual learners. Again, on the left side are the results for the English language arts and literacy, and on the right side is mathematics. And similar to the previous slides, you will notice higher proficiency rates on in English language arts and literacy compared to mathematics. But another thing you will notice um, again, is that for our recently exited students, you do see higher percentages able to demonstrate proficiency. And similar to what we just discussed on the previous slide, we will ensure that you have the numbers for those recently exited as well as we go forward. So am I reading this correctly, that recently exited, say two, mm -hmm. are performing at the levels of, say, our averages for the entire school system? Yeah. Or higher? Yes, you see, you can see that the percentage of recently yes. exited year two, uh, and I'm looking at ELA six, um, yeah. you see 62.5 percent of those students have demonstrated proficiency on the English language arts. So it, it does vary, right? Some for some yes. high percent. Yes, 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 yes. Low, but. Interesting. Thank you. And that's 888 students. Yes, overall. And again, we'll we'll look at you the what it is by year. Can I, Ms. So can you explain um, <clears throat> why in seven there's such a huge variance from six to seven? 
I will defer to Mrs. Hewlett. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to, um, part of this is going to be conjecture. Again, thinking about sure. where we were in the pandemic and the number of students we exited. So those seventh graders are current eighth graders. We missed one whole year of testing students, 2021. And so we're missing a whole cohort of students that would have exited. Um, so those numbers are probably lower because it's who exited. Our last really robust group of exits was 2020. Uh, we have exits in 2022, but that's kind of skewed data because you had two cohorts worth of students sitting in that data. Right. And then we have our 2023 data, which we will bring to you in January uh, for exits. So it's it's. You know, a combination. I of knew that. you knew, and I forgot all about that. So I'm, I'm so happy that we have everybody here at the table because it helps to hear from everyone and then to have it broke out, broke, broken out, or broken down how we do. Because typically we we haven't taken it to this level, but it, it helps for board members to see, to jog my memory. I'll speak for myself, and then particularly for community members to know. Right. So very good. And you know what? I want to say this. People want us to be talking about COVID and saying we need to get away from it. But there, I mean, when you look at our data, there's just no way that we can't not mention the impact that it had on our children learning virtually, math in particular, and even um, English language, language arts. development. Yeah, yes. for a lot, many of our students. And during um, COVID, I was able to, when we were in virtual learning, I was able to attend a virtual class of um, a teacher teaching English and Spanish and I was dizzy and tired by like 20 minutes. I don't know how she did it and they were like third grade. But anyway, this is different grade level, but I just wanted to say that thank you to all of our educators. That we don't say thank you enough. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And for you all, all the work that you've done and been doing and will continue to do. So thank you. Mr. Verada. Very good question. How does this compare to 2019 data? Because that's, you know, that's to me, it does a really good um, just to see how the impact of COVID was. But do we have an idea how we this these numbers compare to 2019? We have not yet looked at that. Um, we can, but the, a caveat is that in 2019 we were wrapping up the park assessment. It had yeah. five levels, so mm -hmm. there are some nuances as it relates to looking at the comparisons between. Would it be better to do 2018 then? Well, it, that is park. That's right, it still would have been park. Mm -hmm. um, I think the comparison that we can think about is this upcoming year, the 23-24, and look at based on 22-23 and then 23-24 comparison. Yeah. But the resources that we have now that we're applying to this work will be a little bit different compared to what we had even last year. So will there still be a difference? Like we didn't have the ELO co coaches and right. math coaches. So there still could be a slight mm -hmm. variance yeah. in yes. the data, right? I just want to say that too. Okay. Our resources are different. So, okay. Let's continue. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> next slide, please. Okay, um, so we spent a little time understanding the MCAP assessment, the pathway to college career and community readiness. So the visual on this slide um, is intentional to show that we, what we think and how we're looking at it through the lens of the academic milestone when we talk about demonstrating proficiency. Um, before we looked at it separately, MCAP math, MCAP English language arts and literacy, but for our pathway, our milestone, we are talking about the extent to which students are meeting both, demonstrating proficiency on both the mathematics and the English language arts um, and literacy assessments. And so our use of the Maryland State Assessment allows for examining the strengths and weaknesses of students, and it aligns, as what Dr. Pugh mentioned earlier, to Common Core state standards, which provide clear, um, consistent, and rigorous expectations for what students know and are able to do. Next slide, please. This slide details our first public presentation of the performance of students at the end of the 2022-2023 school year on our academic milestone of meeting and exceeding grade level 
or course standards for students in grades six through eight. In the title, you will see the indication of baseline. This is intentional as, this, as these data serve as our starting point, our baseline with the first examination of this academic milestone for these grade levels. Across grades six through eight, 24% of students demonstrated proficiency in English language arts and literacy and math. Again, this means students achieved at least a level three or higher on the English language arts literary assessment and at least a three or higher on the math assessment. As you look across the percentages from left to right, you will notice higher percentages of Asian students, students identified as two or more races, and white students demonstrating proficiency. Our black or African American and Hispanic Latino students have lower percentages demonstrating proficiency in both content areas. Next slide, please. Continuing with the academic milestone analysis, this slide details proficiency for our students receiving services. The first circle details the percentage again of all grades six through eight students meeting the academic milestone. From left to right, the percentages for emergent multilingual learners, students receiving free and reduced price meal system services, and students receiving special education services are detailed. I will now turn it over to Mrs. Jennifer Loznak, who will share more about the work she and her team are engaging in to support teaching and learning in the area of secondary math. Good afternoon, Dr. McKnight, President Sylvester, members of the Board of Education. My name is Jennifer Loznak, and I'm the supervisor for secondary math. I'm joined at the table today with Tamara Hewlett, the director of the Department of English Learners and Multilingual Education. We're here today because we understand that in order to change these outcomes, we have to collaborate across offices and across departments. And so today, we are here together sitting with you. Um, on this next slide, please. Um, as Dr. Pugh mentioned, we've reviewed the data and we've come away with four key levers to change outcomes for our students. Starting in the top left in green, curriculum implementation, moving to the left, planning and instruction, um, data progress monitoring, and language supports. Um, we believe that these four things will lead to positive outcomes for our students as well they are evidence-based. Um, as Dr. Addison shared today about MCAP data, that's one data point from last year. As we developed these four key levers for this school year, we, we analyzed and synthesized data from multiple data points. So we took MAPM data, district assessments, school visits, as well as teacher and student voice to create our four levers for this year. The first one in green, I want to talk a little bit about curriculum implementation. Um, first of all, we need to ensure that every student sitting in a middle school classroom has access to um, quality um, standards aligned curriculum. And so what this means is we need to make sure that teachers understand how to implement the curriculum as well as how to use the resources, the approach, and the intent of the curriculum. Um, the illustrative math uh, curriculum on the Imagine Learning platform is a high quality standards aligned curriculum that will prepare our students to be successful on the MCAP. This curriculum op provides opportunities for our kids, for our students to really reason and model about mathematics in order to develop an, uh, an opportunity for um, creating that algorithm that will help students to create, uh, to answer the computational math skills. But in order for this to happen, it really needs to be students driving the learning and understanding and reasoning and modeling with the mathematics. And for our students to really move in this MCAP, they need those three things, modeling, reasoning, and computational skills. And that's what our curriculum provides for our students. Um, the next one, planning and instruction. When we focus, if we can keep it, yeah, thank you. When we focus on curriculum implementation, along with that comes the planning and instruction piece of things. Um, many of us experienced learning math where a teacher would do a problem and then we would copy down the steps that the teacher gave us and then we would on our own or maybe with a partner repeat those steps that the teacher gave us and then we would do homework. So the current curriculum that we have flips that process for our students. So what happens is a teacher provides a, a prompt, provides an activity for the students, they internalize that and they read through the problem, make sense of it for themselves, then they gather together in groups of students. And what the teacher does is the teacher monitors what the students are doing, she he or she listens, 
and then begins to understand what the students know. And then the teacher brings everyone back together and begins to synthesize the learning for the students. And so we might have learned the process of I do, you do, we do. Um, that's not how the curriculum works. It really is the idea of students leading the learning. They're funds of knowledge, and we want to capitalize on that and pull their understanding out. Um, this doesn't happen by coincidence to, sh to shift how we teach. And so we've really taken, um, maximized the coaching position that we invested in over this school year to really work with teachers around planning and instruction. And so we really want the kids to be mathematical problem solvers. And so our um, coaches and our specialists when they work with schools are really helping the teachers to study the curriculum. What are the approaches in the curriculum? Um, what are the resources in the curriculum? And what are the standards tell us that students need to be able to do? Um, when teachers are given the time to really focus on planning and then turn around and implement that instruction that they planned for, our student outcomes are going to are going to shift and improve for all of our students. And so there's really been a big push for focusing on instruction, focusing on the planning that leads to great instruction. Um, this has been possible through the investment of our four coaches, the additional math specialists, and so really being able to be there with schools has made a great impact so far. And the third lever on this slide is data progress monitoring. I will go into that a little bit later to share with what we're doing, excuse me, with that. But now I will turn it over to Tamara Hewlett, the Director of the Department of English Learners and Multilingual Education. Good afternoon, members of the board, Dr. McKnight. I am going to cover the last lever, which is around language supports. Um, as Ms. Loznak outlined, there is a lot that goes into sound math instruction for our students. Um, the integration of language with the content is critical for their success. So our teams at the district level have been very intentional about the collaborative work that we've been doing. And so I'm outlining the fourth lever, which is language supports, highlighted in purple. Some of these supports that we have been um, intentional about uh, doing the work together is um, around our professional development and our instructional support with coaching for our teachers in PLCs. Uh, we have been so far able to visit some schools together as joint teams to observe the integration of language and content in action. Uh, we visited um, some middle schools and high schools, and while this presentation is focused on um, middle schools, it is critical for us to understand where the students are going so that we can uh, do some interruptions at the level, at the middle school level. Um, some of the classes we observed, we saw language supports like English instruction and Spanish instruction. That's a linguistic support uh, that affords first language uh, Spanish speakers to access the content. We also saw instructional scaffolds being applied, uh, pictures, word walls, um, teacher modeling with comprehensible input, meaning using gestures, making math visible uh, for our emergent multilingual learners. Um, it's, we also saw um, some sound, solid first instruction. One quick way to make a difference is to make sure that tier one instruction is effective. And so we, we were able to see that um, in action. But we continue to know that we need to work with our middle schools um, to provide um, solid, uh, consistent sound for first instruction. We also, with the investment of the board recently, uh, were able to have a middle school ELD, English Language Development coach, who's working with six targeted schools around providing language development supports for uh, content areas. Um, with this uh, investment, we're also going to be able to provide some quarterly planning for these teacher, the teachers at these schools. We still see the need to further examine our practices uh, and to ensure that we're operating from an assets-based approach that is aligned to anti-racist approaches. What does this look like? It means ensuring our EMLs, our emergent multilingual learners, are having opportunities to speak and write about their learning, about their math, about their ELA, um, 
it looks like content teachers and English language development teachers planning together for the key uses of language for each lesson um, that will be elevated during instruction. It's going to be important to provide sufficient um, support and scaffolds for our emergent multilingual learners. This is not optional. Everyone has to see themselves as a language instructor. Everyone has to own the language development and the content uh, success of every student in our classes. The shared responsibility is our urgency. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Ms. Lasnak, who will share some strategic actions that we're taking. Dr. Mene? Hi, yes, I just wanted to interject for a second. I just so love this visual. Um, if we were to put something right beside it, beside it to align to our vision of the district, it's the theory of action. I just wanted to make that connection. I know the board and I have been talking about that. That theory of action is how we say we are going to get to see those improvements in student achievement. So we say that we're going to do three things to actually accomplish that. Build staff capacity, differentiate resources, differentiate the use of, use of resources, and third, systems of accountability. That is exactly what this framework reflects. So I thought it was important to highlight at that at this point because that is the North Star of how we're going to get there as a system. And this visual is a true reflection of that. Those are the things that we believe that will help make the student achievement uh, continue to grow within MCPS. Next slide, please. Bringing in the theory of action, um, our data indicate that our students need our support. So in order to make change happen, um, there needs to be a call to action. And these, this call to action has to have strategic as well as specific actions. Um, through, our, through your funding and support, we were able to begin this strategic um, work this summer by the hiring of four coaches and additional math instructional specialists. This really allowed us to differentiate the support to schools and to think about what is it that a school really needs and which schools really need our support, which schools need the coach, and which schools need a specialist. Um, the four coaches work across 14 schools, and they're there on a consistent, regular basis to plan with the same teachers so that the teacher knows that when they ask for support, it isn't hey, I can come in like three weeks. No, I'll be here next week. For some schools, it's the coach stays for an entire week to ensure that what happens in planning happens instruction and then data monitoring and we provide feedback. So we close that loop for teachers. Um, our specialist from central office, they are supporting schools as well. They support on a higher level where they um, support with the school improvement plan. Uh, they coach teachers as well as teacher leaders. They sit on any kind of um, leadership visits that need to happen. They do walkthroughs with the principal. Maybe they collaborate with uh, the OSSWB when they go in and do uh, walkthroughs of the school. So between the specialists and the coaches, our ability to be hands-on with schools has drastically improved. We've been able to provide timely and consistent um, support to the schools that they need. The ELD coaches, the additional staffing that um, Ms. Hewlett shared a minute ago, they are, um, there's one at six middle schools and they are targeted supports for the students who have ELD services. The staff in these schools receive professional learning and support to teachers and uh, address the learning needs of our EMLs in content classes, including the language development instruction in mathematics. Um, with the addition of the specialists, the coaches from the math and the ELD, we've been able to have much more cross office collaboration and support for our students. Um, and the next piece of things, our Summer Math Institute, probably one of the most exciting things we did this summer for our teachers. Um, I'll give you a few quotes in a minute of what our teachers had to say about this experience. And so the uh, Summer Math Institute elevated our efforts to address the curriculum implementation, the planning, as well as instruction. During this summer, our, we had some teachers work hand in hand with our specialists and our coaches to really understand this whole process of planning. And so one teacher stated, it helped me understand the progress of teaching Math 7 last year to the new concepts this year for Math 8. I saw how back mapping from the cool downs, which are exit tickets, um, or kind of check in for understandings at the end of class, through the warm up and activities, how they all connected. Another teacher stated, it gave me the space to be able to talk it out with my counterparts. 
The teachers were grateful for this time to really dig into the curriculum, the resources to understand what a math language routine is, how it works, how to implement it. They really understood how what the standards look like for math six, seven, and eight so that they could have that vertical articulation of, I'm a seventh grade teacher, but what did they learn in sixth grade and what am I preparing them for eighth grade? And so this really set them up for success leading into the school year. And we're hopeful to provide this similar learning experience for many more teachers this upcoming summer. Um, progress monitoring. New this year, we are really uh, working together within the math office to provide an opportunity for ongoing data monitoring. I know that we have a progress check that happens at the end of January. And the Consistently, we get the question of how do we know how our students are doing before this progress check that happens at the end of second marking period. So what our office has done is put together, taken um, the important standards of the, gr of the grade level as um, determined by the MCAP and also that align to our curriculum. And we took the um, check for understandings within the curriculum and we put them on performance matters. And so. The kids, it isn't something that the teacher has to grade. It gives the teachers and the planning team instant information about how the students are doing with those standards. And so by looking at this, teachers, literally the t students enter it and it is popping up you know, for, this, for the teachers so that when they look at their data at the end of the day or the next day in their PLCs, they can adjust instruction instantaneously for their students, not waiting for a unit assessment or you know, Friday formative or whatever that they're doing, but right then and there they know at the end of the day how their students are doing. Um, as well, this allows an opportunity for district leaders and system leaders to monitor how students are doing in preparation for the district assessments and the MCAP. And the last one, um, this school year we have purchased IXL for all the middle schools, and IXL creates an individualized math skill plan that students can do um, at any time. They might be doing it in their math classroom, they might be doing an advisory. Um, they could be doing this at home. So if there are any parents at home who are asking, how's my child doing? Um, you can always have them pull up their math, uh, their IXL, look at their individualized math skill plans, and you can sit with your child, encourage them, hey, let's, let me see what you're working on. And so IXL makes learning possible during the school day and outside of school. Next slide, please. All right, this slide elevates two important roles that we have at the middle school. Um, we have the middle school instructional math coaches. As I stated, there are four of them at 14 middle schools. And then we have the middle school content specialist. Every middle school has a content specialist. Every high school has an RT. Um, but for right now on this slide, I really want to elevate the work of the middle school content specialist. I can't say enough about what they do. Um, our content specialists teach four classes every day. And they are given one release period, and they are also, they stay after school. And so I just want to highlight all the things that they do with one release period and time after school. And they monitor progress for the school improvement plan, and they're also a part of the shared leadership decision making at their school. So they attend their leadership meetings after school once a week. Um, they build the capacity of the department through professional learning on instruction and data monitoring. So we meet with our math content specialists and resource teachers for professional learning. Sometimes they're able to, you know, take that right to their departments. Sometimes they have to, you know, see how does what we're doing directly or aligned to their school improvement plan and what is their principal asking. And so they're really working together to meet the needs of their teachers and their school. Uh, <clears throat> as well, they observe planning and instruction um, at their schools. And so not only do they observe it, but they close that cycle of feedback. And so they find time to meet with their teachers to coach them along the way. Um, in schools where there's a coach and a math specialist, a content specialist, the relationship is critical to supporting schools and making shifts happen for all of our students. Next slide, please. I want to show you a little bit of return on your investment and um, leverage the things that our math coaches are doing at the middle school. Um, we pulled this data a little while back ago because we had initially planned this presentation for an earlier time. So at the time, there were 541 direct support sessions from a coach to, to the school in a variety of ways. Um, what I want to highlight is that a majority of their time is spent um, 
in implementation support and curriculum study and the PLCs. PLCs are when the teachers come together to plan. And so that's where a majority of their time is spent. They're working hand in hand, regularly, consistently with teachers to dig into the curriculum. What does it mean to um, implement this strategy that is within the curriculum? How can I support you to do it? Bringing people back to the math language routines, which are essential for our English language learners in order for them to um, <coughs> go beyond just the listening skills and the receiving of information, but ensuring that they're talking with each other, leveraging their language, that they're writing about mathematics. And so our special, our coaches, they support planning, they see instruction, and then they provide feedback to their PLCs, or they adjust how they're coaching their PLC to meet the needs of the teachers for what they saw in instruction. They also spend um, just a little over 11% of their time supporting school-based leaders. That means that the content specialist might need support while you're there and you're consistently there. Let me ask you a couple of questions. It may mean um, the principal has a question about what's going on in instruction and you know how, do, how can I support my teachers and different things like that. Um, I do want to address that there's a little sliver where it says monitor, uh, monitoring progress and data analysis. I know it is small, but I want to say that that also happens in the um, planning piece of things. So it looks small. It is one of our things that we are focusing on, but it is incorporated in what you see in the 37.1 percent. Next slide, please. All right. I'm excited to share that all the middle schools, again, have IXL. Um, all the schools have really jumped into uh, using IXL, like I said, either during the math classroom, uh, during advisory, or at home. Um, what I want to share with you is that IXL does the individualized skill plans, and so they also, it, the platform is also has an opportunity for teachers to assign problems to them. And so the teacher can decide what are the standards that are going to be taught tomorrow in class. And they may say, how, what standards back map into today's lesson? And a teacher can assign for homework or, you know, for an advisory, let me provide you the standards from previous grade levels that will help you access today's content information. And so IXL is aligned to the state standards. Teachers can also choose to align, uh, to assign skill plans related to the current content because um, IXL does provide an opportunity for teachers to assign the standards of a certain lesson because there is an alignment between IXL and our curriculum as well. So there are many great aspects of IXL um, that's aligned to the things that we are working on. Uh, the one bullet I want to elevate here and highlight is that we have a lot of discussion around MCAP. We know that there was a linking study that tells us how MAP, you know, is aligned to MCAP and we, it's predictable. So the skill plans that are created for our students, IXL takes their scores and their strand scores from the MAP M and puts them in there. So it's consistently looking at what is what are the standards the kid needs um, to support them in moving along their progress in MAP M. Um, I also want to share a couple of statistics with you here before uh, we go for the discussion. Um, Students have reached proficiency in 100,000 skills, as we see in the little mountain piece of things. More than 77, 47,000 hours have been spent by our students on IXL, and over 5 million questions have been answered. Um, we're excited to pull upcoming data from MAPM in the winter, as well as our progress checks, district assessments in January, to see how IXL has helped our students progress. In summary, we've talked about the four key levers. Um, implement the curriculum with integrity, consistent focus, and support on planning and instruction, ongoing data monitoring to address student needs and adjust the curriculum, and then support language in all aspects of instruction. We also gave you explicit actions that we are taking, and we also provided an opportunity for parents to know what they can be doing at home to support their child with mathematics. I'll now turn it over to President Sylvester and the members of the Board of Education for discussion. Thank you. I appreciate the presentation. I'm going to start with Ms. Harris. Uh, um, 
thank you for this. Um, and first I want to start with thanking Dr. Pugh for the way she sort of framed this initially, talking about our overall goals as a system, which are really making our students ready to enter sort of the global workplace and an increasingly, in some ways, shrinking world because we're all so interconnected. Um, because I think let's not, and, and, and one of the things that I think is really helping us do that work is our commitment to being to having fully affirming and inclusive classrooms because any student that leaves us with some kind of an arbitrary bias and they look at some people in the world as being less than because of what they look like, um, how or where they worship or don't, who they love, those students are limiting their potential. And so the work that we do around inclusion is so important to achieving the goal of really making all of our students truly ready to enter the world. So I just want to start with that foundation. And I think I, my questions go, I'm looking kind of big picture here. So I'm looking at slides seven and eight in the sixth grades in the math scores. And you mentioned earlier that if we look at our Ns, the number of students taking these assessments as sixth graders, seventh graders, eighth graders, we see those numbers shrinking, shrinking. And that was because as each grade level progresses, we have fewer students on that grade taking the, the, the MCAP, the grade level assessment. And so when I look at the, so, and the slide eight gives us our ELA numbers, which is more representative of the total number of students in a grade level. So I'm just extrapolating broadly that it looks like in, for, in the math, for seventh graders, about half of our seventh graders are not represented in those scores because they're not taking grade seven math. And about three quarters of our eighth graders aren't represented there because they're not taking grade level math. So my one, on one question is, how are we factoring in how proficient those students are, this 50% of seventh graders, 75% of eighth graders, when they're not being included because they're not taking grade level math? And then where are those kids, you know, when we move to slides, you know, 12 and 13, students meeting grade level benchmarks in both reading and math, are we just not measuring 50% of our seventh graders, 75% of our eighth graders? Or for that measure, are we looking at some other thing that measures math for the 50% of seventh graders, 75% of eighth graders who aren't taking grade level math? Sure. Um, thank you for the question. <clears throat> I think the I like first it. thing to um, point out in terms of the examination that's on slides seven and eight, which is our MCAP results, mm -hmm. we do examine it for students regardless of being in the grade level, so to speak, course. So this slide shows math six, math seven, math eight, but we shared a memo with you back in August that also includes the analysis of students in Algebra 1. And so those students who are in middle school grades who may have taken the Algebra 1 MCAP results, we are actively reporting, monitoring, and sharing that data. So they are not forgotten in the sense of an examination of how our students are performing on the state assessment. Yeah. Um, in terms of the academic milestone aspect, and then I'll turn it to Ms. Lozniak, or Dr. Puta add on in terms of the additional. Um, the milestone, we are focused on students in grades four through eight. We are able to look at <clears throat> the performance of our students in middle school as well um, as we continue to progress forward, but we were intentional to think about students in grades six, four through eight when we think about that uh, MCAP assessment. Because I just wanna emphasize, so when you look at slide seven, it's not that last academic year, just shy of 11% of seventh graders were proficient in math. It's just shy, it's just shy of those seventh graders in grade level math. So the other half of the students are not really reflected in that percentage. Is that correct? Different. Uh, that is, it, it, it is accurate, it's also a um, uh, what you see in the state, right? Many students in eighth grade, there are fewer students in eighth grade taking these MCAP assessments because they are taking Algebra 1. Mm -hmm. um, to extend on Dr. Addison's answer, and then I'll let you jump in with the who it represents, because we have a number of middle school math classes, and so it, it is important <coughs> to know who is there. We will come to 
the Algebra 1 when we come to our college and career ready indicator for who is college and career ready based upon what the state standard is and what our milestone is. Our milestone is the readiness in Algebra 1 and uh, also in the ELA 10. So we will be sharing those data about who's ready at that level using the state measurement um, in our upcoming presentation. Okay. So those students will be included even though they took it in grade six by the time they get go up the milestones uh, when we report those. And then I'll add that our coaches, uh, when I talked with the leadership of the team, many of them are supporting the Math 8 courses um, because we understand that that is a priority for us to change outcomes for them because they are also ninth grade Algebra 1 students the following year. Um, and so we want to ensure that they're prepared for that because it, we've discussed, you know, it being okay for students to take Algebra 1 in 7th, 8th, or ninth, and they need to be as successful in each one of those grade levels. And so back to the question about, given that we have like about half of our fifth, seventh graders not taking grade level math, so they're not taking that that MAP test, and we have, uh, or the MCAP test, and about 75% of our eighth graders, how are they or are they accounted for in these slides 12 and 13 when we're talking about percentages of students in different demographic groups meeting both? So they are not, um, the students who are in Algebra 1 or not in, let me change that, students who are not in Math 7 or Math 8 that we identified in the slides are not represented in the academic milestone analysis that you see in the later slides. Okay. Okay. And so to what Dr. Pugh shared, we do monitor that information. They are captured later when we begin to look at the um, high school examinations because there are aspects of those high school courses. When we think of Algebra 1, it's considered a high school course. Yeah. And so when we begin with our high school analysis, we are pulling, going back to the performance of those students as they performed in the middle school. Because I'm thinking, actually, these numbers are not fully representative of the whole population of these students because we have like 75% of our eighth graders who aren't included here. So you don't want to presume anything, but I would assume if you're already in algebra, you probably meet grade eight content standards. You know, if you're in eighth grade taking algebra, you probably would pass that standard. So that to me is kind of the secret sauce here. I'm sort of, how are we tracking that? But anyway, thank you very much for all of this work. Just to the Ms. Harris's point, if I'm understanding it correctly, we could be telling a fuller picture mm -hmm. to give ourselves a little bit more credit for these outcomes. Is that is that the yeah the sum yeah. of it? Sure. So, part of what I'm hearing in the question is, how would our data change if we included students based on grade level and not MCAP course taking? So I do think that's something that. We can explore in terms of the analysis. Um, this is our first year with the pathway. This is our baseline for the academic milestone. So it does serve as an opportunity for us to explore the inclusion of looking at this from a lens of middle school grade levels as opposed to the MCAP assessment, which is kind of what you're seeing right now. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hey, Ms. Yang. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone, uh, the panel here. Um, and also good to see you, Mrs. Lawrence Nat. I saw her out in the community sharing our uh, math pathway with parents. So that's kind of engagement effort that we really appreciate. Um, so when this year, the board make it a predominant topic to discuss data. And which is wonderful because that's how we know how we students are doing and what resources are working and do alignment. Now I'm thinking about the f the phrase um, take action, right? Uh, in data. So if we have this data of uh, mass seven students performing such. Um, I understand sometimes the MCAP, MCAP results come in late. It doesn't immediately can transfer to classroom instruction right after it. But can you share with us, have we as a system, system-wide look at it, say, hey, 
we notice for MCAP data, these are the concepts our students are not getting. And what curriculum material we are using it, what methodologies our teachers are using to teach, and how that direct the planning time at the school level and the classroom level. I, I would really want to uh, hear that. Mm -hmm. Thanks uh, for the question. Mm -hmm. A couple of things that we have done. Um, mm -hmm. The state of Maryland puts out a blueprint for their MCAP. And so it tells us the percentage of the test that's spent on different standards. Mm -hmm. And so this summer when we were putting out the pacing guide to cover the curriculum, we mm -hmm. adjusted the pacing guide to say, here's an area where we know is highly tested. And so we need more time spent in the curriculum in this section. Here's a part of the curriculum statistics and probability that isn't as isn't assessed as much. So we're gonna compress some of the lessons in this area to allow for that greater opportunity. There are fewer lessons um, in the curriculum than there are days in the school year. Mm -hmm. So that's where we uh, were able to adjust the pacing of the curriculum to allow for a deeper um, learning of the standards and give the students more time for that. The state also puts out evidence statements where we can mm -hmm. have schools look at where students did really well, what were the standards that they didn't do well. What we often see is students struggle to model and reason with mathematics. Um, and so the curriculum provides those opportunities. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the first part of professional learning for our math leaders was to really dig into how do you plan? What's the curriculum? Let's get back to the essential standards of the curriculum. And we've been working most recently with um, Delmi to think about the needs of our multilingual students. And then the second half of this school year, we'll be really focusing on what does it look like to provide modeling and reasoning uh, <laughs> problems to students. Modeling and reasoning isn't, Dr. Pugh went to the, um, to the store and bought five apples and three oranges, how much did you spend? Modeling and reasoning is more of like, um, Dr. Pugh and Ms. Hewlett went somewhere um, and then you're being a little more ambiguous and they have to define like who went faster, who went slower, did they arrive at the same time? What would have impacted their arrival? And so students have to understand unit rate, they have to understand um, a lot of different things, but we, and it also is, here's a problem, can you find the error in the problem? Okay. And so we're really per trying to provide opportunities for teachers to understand what the modeling and reasoning standards are so that they can address them in instruction. So I appreciate that because when we look at evidence of learning as a board in March and then later on uh, in September, we, we notice there's a big discrepancy in our classroom proficiency level and our district all are, are standardized our state, right? So what you're talking about is we are looking at these tests and to reflect and respond in the classroom level. So that's what we want to see, right? So there shouldn't be such great discrepancies. And the second thing I want to ask is, I saw you out in the community, wonderful. Now, for our students that are below the proficiency, how and when do we uh, alert or communicate these to the families and, and work with them? So every administration of MAPM, parents receive information about how their students are doing. Um, and so that's one opportunity for parents to know mm -hmm. um, where their student is. It gives them the information of what their projection is for MAP, um, MCAP, as well it gives them the percentile level of their child in na the nationally normed assessment, as well as their opportunities um, for teachers we just had parent conferences. That's another opportunity for teachers to share. Um, I think we collaborated within the curriculum office to think about what are the questions parents should be asking when they go to these parent conferences so that they're not walking away saying, um, I know that my student isn't doing well, but I, I don't know what to do about that. Um, I also put out an information to the math leaders about when you have parent conferences, give a goodie bag to the parent. Tell the parent, this is where your student um, needs more support, and these are the actual things that you can be doing the, so that we can partner to help your student along the way. 
So um, he, here is some feedback, I, and I, I want us to think about because, I, you know, I have two children that went through the MCPS system. So I get a report card. A report card is mailed to me, right? Then a different, or oh, now it's in uh, Synergy too, right? Then at a different time, the MAT R, MAT M, or MAT P score is mailed to me, right? And so I have this. And then I have to understand how to read, read our report card, then read report. the map. Uh, 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 well, I have no problem. I am an educator. But I can see how overwhelming this can be, right? Uh, happen at different times, and they might tell different things. Because as a parent, if I read the report card, my teacher said my students are doing well, you know what? I'm OK then, right? And those state assessments, sometimes they don't really ring a bell because that's not someone who I have a relationship with or connection mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. So I want us to think about as a system, how can we do this better? How can we communicate, like make this communication easier yeah. and have better collaboration with the family? Yes. I, I appreciate that. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, mm -hmm. I was going to say, um, Stephanie, Sharon, and I have also heard this, and she's been working with the team to say, what, what communications do we have? Because like you said, some of them are classroom indicators. Some of them are a time in a moment in time, right? And a, as a parent, oh, my child didn't feel well that day. To me, that's not as big of an indicator. But some of them are also end of course exams that are required. So I, I, we agree. We think that there are lots of communications. We, we actually appreciate multiple measures, mm -hmm. but helping parents understand understand what each of those means, right? Because they do test different things, and they do mean different things. The classroom grade is not the only piece, and especially as we go into state accountability where students have end-of-course exams. So we hear you we, uh, and are taking that feedback and sort of trying to figure out how and where do we put it together in a way that addresses your concern that says, here's, here's a true indicator along the milestones of where your child is. I truly appreciate everyone's work. Thank you. Dr. Oh, I was going to say, yes, I completely agree with Dr. Pugh. Um, I really like that feedback. We've been trying to, I heard we recently got some feedback on how to look at these documents or frame them in a way that parents can better understand or with directions or those types of things. Um, but it's almost like when you look at a student's profile overall, and we're not handing these things out all the time, but really getting a visual of everything together, it will give a, a better display overall of how the students are doing in all these different spaces. So um, I really like that idea, and I know we have our curriculum and technology teams together, and that's something we can certainly work on. Thank you for that. Mr. Saeed? Yeah, just, just real quick. Uh, I don't know if this was... Um, this was covered, but I always notice that the um, percent of students that are fulfilling uh, the requirements, uh, specifically for math, it always decreases with every grade. When you look at ELA, it doesn't seem to follow that trend. You know, you see a generally <coughs> similar amount. But you would think that the longer the students are in the system, the better they can understand the math that is there for their grade. They should learn more. But you see 27 percent, then 10 percent, and then 2.8 percent. So why do we always see the numbers decrease? And maybe does that say something about the, the standards that these students are required to meet, considering that if only 3 percent of students are meeting them, maybe the standards aren't the best standards to measure students by. Um, so I appreciate the question. One of the things to think about is that um, with each year in sixth grade, you are in potentially three different math classes, pretty much. Um, in seventh grade, when we look at the data, we're only looking at two of those articulating courses from the sixth grade. And so with each year, you're pulling out. So in seventh grade, those students who were in algebra one isn't going to be included in this data. And so the kids on the the most accelerated pathway, you're pulling out their data. And then the next year as eighth graders, you're not looking at the algebra students nor the honors geometry students. And so that's another subgroup of students that isn't included in this data. Um, and so at eighth grade, we're the data is reflective of the students who have been needing more support along the way. And so that's kind of where you see 
the difference in achievement throughout the grade levels. Okay, thank you so much. And then in that case, I definitely um, agree with my fellow board members who stated I think we need that fuller picture because, again, just to reiterate what they already said, I don't think that this data is very representative. That's the way we're representing it. But um, I appreciate all the work you're doing, especially with the uh, math coaches. I think that's a huge thing that you guys are really doing, and that's something that I brought to students that they're very happy about to have that support. I wish I had that support when I was taking math in middle school and even now. Um, but, you know, I appreciate the work you guys are doing, but I think we need a more full picture uh, to represent the data more accurately. And uh, while we've been talking a lot about this fuller picture, it, this does give us a snapshot of how our on-level students are doing, which it is very troubling. And so um, hence all the efforts that you have been doing this year to change that trajectory. And so I appreciate this deeper understanding of what our data tells us last year and some of the the interventions that you have put in place because this is not acceptable. This is not what we want uh, for our all-level students. Ms. rivera Um, Thank you. Um, um, there was, this was a lot to digest. Um, and, and I think I'm going to echo uh, President uh, Silvestre's comments that, yeah, this is not acceptable. Um, so what do we do from here? So we know that math coaches made a, made a pretty significant impact, correct? Um, so I'm thinking, uh, I would actually like to hear from the math coaches myself. I don't know if that's possible, but I really would like to hear from the horse's mouth in a sense of what are the challenges and what else they could do. Or, um, and if this is, you know, if the math coaches is actually something that is working, how can we then increase? Because I'm thinking, you have four math coaches for 14 schools. Uh, that's a big load uh, to, to be able to carry. So, you know, in my mind, the most basic thing that we can do as a school system is to ensure that our kids are reading and writing at grade level. That's literally our job. Like, that's like the number one thing, I think, right? So if math coaches are, you know, working, how can we increase that? And I would like us to look into look, bringing math coaches at the high school level, because we know that 75% of, you know, the eighth graders are not represented on this, and they're going to be going to algebra in ninth grade. What kind of support does that look like for our high schoolers, right? Especially in schools where you have large populations of ESOL and med students, special ed students, what kind, you know. So I would like us actually to think about that um, because as we, you know, we start doing the budget and moving and being a strategic, we're going to have to be very strategic where we put our funds and the things that work for our students and outcomes. So that's one of the things that I would like to, to hear is actually from from a few of our, of, of our math, math coaches. And, and I know you guys talked about the whole um, thing, sorry, with the um, EML students and that you have a plan on how to work and develop that, correct? And that I think one of your math coaches is actually bilingual uh, or along those lines. I would just like to see what that looks like, like the, the process of how that's gonna be implemented because it sounds like one person for the whole system sounds very, whoever this person is, God bless them, it sounds like they're gonna be overwhelmed. <laughs> so, I did. Is that person? Oh my Ms. Rivera Oven, I did want to remind <laughs> the board and the community about our fiscal year 2024 program evaluation agenda, which mm -hmm. has on it an evaluation of the math coaches. So your statement and your interest in terms of hearing from math coaches in terms of what's working well, what are the challenges, those are aspects of that evaluation that we'll be able to bring out and be able to share in terms of from their lens and also from the lens of those that they are serving in the school buildings, what's working and where do we see opportunities for improvements? I really would love, would love that. Um, and to echo on the whole communication with parents, um, again, the Black and Brown Coalition did a great job in bringing the voices of those parents and bringing to, you know, to us and saying the way that we communicate grading and reporting and so on is a way that I'm not understanding. There was a reporter out there. I mean, my kids, 
when I used to get report cards from school, they were easy, easy peasy. Either you were doing well, you were, you know, you had a seven, a six or a five. And I mean, you know, my, my mom could understand that. When I looked at that report card the other night with the graphs and, and percentages, and I, I have to tell you, I was like, what is that? Because honestly, for a lot of our parents, that is just not, it's, it's hard to digest because we have to put ourselves in the shoes of a lot of our parents with the challenges of technology and just understanding Honestly, there was a colleague of mine next to me. He has two PhDs, and he looked at me. He goes, I don't get it. <laughs> I cannot understand what that report card means. So I think it's really important. Some of these parents, what they were saying is, I saw my kid was doing so well. I met with the teacher, and then at the end of the semester, it was like my, my kid's not doing well, and they had to go and get tutors and so on, and we were not really communicating the resources that we have in our schools. And it broke my heart that that lady who had to get a second job to be able to pay for tutoring so her child could do better in math. When we have resources in our, you know, available to us, whether it's online tutoring or so on or some other stuff that we have in our schools. So for me, it's also creating that communication with our parents so they know that we can be supportive of their, uh, of their students. But what does that look like? But again, I, I really would like to hear from, um, from, from all these folks who are in the front lines doing the, you know, doing the heavy lifting. Because it's different, right, when we're here hearing anecdotally what's going on in the community versus being in the front lines at a school with a couple thousand students and, every, and then you have to go to another school with a couple thousand students. It's a different dynamic. And if we truly, you know, are going to be deliberate and intentional about making sure that this is, you know, this is our top priority, really, making sure our kids are reading and writing by certain grade levels, then if we have found something that works, let's support it, let's enhance it, and let's, you know, make it more available, and let's look, in my opinion, let's look into um, supporting some of these high schools. Um, the coaches would love to share about the work they're doing every day. They are excited to be in schools and to watch how instruction and planning has progressed. Um, I'll just give you a quick snippet of information. Um, we did a survey where teachers self-reported their growth, um, and uh, teachers are growing in terms of planning instruction, data monitoring, as well as the way students are, are learning mathematics. And so they have shifted their instruction from um, students being receivers of information to students um, really synthesizing, making, um, uh, making their own knowledge grow. Um, and so I, I think you would find a lot of teachers as well who have lots of great things to say about the coaches. Ms. Yang, and then we'll need to wrap up this conversation because we have a lot more to cover tonight. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, <coughs> looking at these data, I, I think they are very difficult to, to look at. Um, and I'm thinking about the remedial support we provide to our students. Uh, I know one of the things, now we have Dr. Edison at the table, I want to look at summer school. I know we just put out a summer school evaluation of the summer school 2022, right? So I appreciate that very much. But that report um, does not delve into why or what local school program were offered. And, and, and since this is one area we can help students bridge the gap, I really want to understand that portion of it and see why are we not getting good results, you know, uh, uh, in return of our investment. Um, another thing I would like to look at is, um, I know our ESSA fund is coming to an end, right? Um, our online tutoring is not happening. Now, Saturday school historically have yield good results. The last report mm -hmm. I have is from 2018 to 2019. Okay, now, now this year we heard the Saturday school is back uh, into full swing 
again. Um, so I would really like to see if we can uh, not, you know, not this round, but soon, and and get our understanding of uh, evaluation of the Saturday school now, so that we we understand what are some effective uh, support that can help us bridge the gap. I appreciate it. Dr. Addison, while we have you on the table, do you know off the top of your head which evaluations your office has completed this fall? We are, for this fiscal year of 2023-2024, we are starting that work. So we're actively in the data collection because it's happening now. So we're actively in that school year. So when you look back at the agenda, there are some that we indicated we will provide a winter update, which is like that mid-year check-in for you, but we won't, will, would not have kind of a full evaluation completed until we had an opportunity to examine the implementation of a program for the entire school year. Um, so that mid-year is just kind of like if you think about it from the lens of our evidence of learning transition, a mid-year yeah. check. That's kind of why for some of the programs that were identified, we indicated a winter report out so that you can see mid-year, how's it going so far? But we do want to give the program an opportunity to be implemented for an entire school year. Um, and also recognizing what we discussed before that it takes at least yeah. two to three I years you to were really see on some other ones that we were wrapping so, up this fall. Yes, the we sent four about a month ago that we that were the closeout of the fiscal year 2022-2023, and then you have a series of four coming tomorrow in the transmittal. Um, it includes uh, innovative school calendar evaluation. So wrapping up some of those um, ones from the prior school year, the 22-23 school year. That's what I was looking for. Thank you. All right, very well. So um, again, want to thank you for this presentation. You know, this gives us a level of understanding and analysis that uh, we really need in order to um, help figure out what um, leadership direction and oversight we need to do um, on an ongoing basis and uh, for our budget deliberations that are coming up shortly. So greatly appreciate the presentation and uh, we're going to take a recess now since we're close to our five o'clock before we begin our next uh, presentation. So uh, how much time do we have? We have a 30 minute recess. And so we will see you back at uh, five o'clock. Thank you.
and we're back. So um, we are now moving on to our next agenda item, which is um, the staff FY23 staff climate <laughs> survey results. And with that, I pass it on to Dr. McKnight. All right. Thank you so much, uh, President Silvestri. So uh, during this presentation, I welcome uh, the staff to the table. We're going to discuss the results of the 2023 climate <coughs> survey that was conducted last spring. And as you know, this is the first time that we had conducted the climate survey since before the pandemic. Um, so this was truly a baseline and we were actually, you know, launching a, a very different um, type of survey and spent much time discussing it. So we have a team of presenters here today um, to really talk about the themes, the survey findings, and uh, most importantly, how we're going to be able to take that to address uh, further needs within our school system. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Collins. Thank you, Dr. McKnight. Mm -hmm. Ensuring our staff feel valued and supported is vital to our goals in providing the best education for all Montgomery County Public School students. COVID and virtual school intensified challenges our staff and students faced. When we returned to in-person instruction after COVID, many new challenges added stress to those committed to providing our students with what they needed to be successful. School districts across the country are grappling with these same issues. However, Montgomery County Public Schools is committed to working to meet these challenges. Today, Mrs. Stephanie Sharon, Dr. Keisha Addison, and Dr. Peter Moran <laughs> will share with you the details of the survey and how we are providing our school-based and central office leaders the support they need to create the climate we want for our students, our families, and our staff. I now turn the presentation over to Ms. Stephanie Sharon, Chief of Strategic Initiatives. Thank you, Dr. Collins. If we could go to the next slide, please. So for the purposes of our presentation today, this is the flow of the conversation. Um, we are going to first just give a little bit of history and context to the climate surveys so that everybody's uh, up to speed on the last time that we did the climate surveys and why we chose to do the climate survey um, in spring of last year. We then are going to provide an overview of uh, what the st uh, staff climate survey entailed as well as the key findings for both central office and school base on the district level. Following that, we will then talk about the specific action steps for both schools and central offices, Dr. Collins um, and Dr. McKnight iterated. And then we'll talk about what's coming up on the horizon with our FY24 surveys, which are going to encapsulate not just staff, but our students and families as well. Next slide, please. So again, why did we administer, administer the climate survey to staff in the spring of 2023? Um, Dr. Collins mentioned a, a lot of the points that we have up here about the importance of creating a more engaging and supportive and productive work environment, that climate and culture are critical to the success of our students. Um, when people feel good at work and they feel empowered at work, they will be more productive. Um, we also had a lot of advocacy from our MCEA partners in making sure that we surveyed staff, even if we didn't do everybody by the end of the year. And again, really focusing on cultivating a workplace culture that fosters that employee growth, loyalty, and overall success, we know also um, improves our retention of our critical staff that we have every day. And then lastly, it is aligned to the well-being and family engagement and professional and operational excellence pillars of the strategic plan. The survey is actually one of our metrics in the strategic plan. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Addison to talk about the history of our climate surveys as well as our overarching results. Good afternoon again. Um, so the provision, oh, next slide please. The provision of climate surveys has been um, under the shared accountability team since the early 2000s. Um, as I was looking at the historical information, I found administrations dating back to 2003, 2004. And the original set of surveys at that time were titled the Surveys of School Environment, and they were designated for students, staff, and families. 
And these original surveys focused on areas such as academic environment, social environment, school safety and discipline, administrative environment, and physical environment, just to name a few of the areas. And these original surveys um, included on average between 80 to 90 survey items. Um, and so why did I give you that historical? Well, just to show that as a district, we have always valued the voice of those we support and serve, be they students, families, or staff. These surveys play a crucial role in assessing from the perspective of those surveyed the overall effectiveness of the school, office, and the school district that serves them. And so as we continue to administer the survey for many years, as typical, we receive feedback about the survey and the items. And so around 2012, the 2012-2013 school year, an internal work group came together to re-examine our parent survey um, to develop a parent engagement survey to align with it being more current as well as align with the interests at the time of the district. We made adjustments and modifications around that time to not only the survey for families, but also staff. And then we also shifted a bit in the middle, um, and we had surveys that were administered to students and to students and staff that were from the Gallup organization. And so we did that for about four years, and then we returned to administering surveys of staff that came from this. Office of Shared Accountability around 2016, 2017. And we did that for another three years. And so during the 2019, 2020 school year, we were working to develop a, and administer a newly revised staff culture and climate survey that was to be administered. It was planned for administration March, 2020. And of course that survey was unable to be launched because of the onset of the global pandemic that changed the way we lived, worked, and learned. Next slide, please. So as shared by Ms. Sharon, the 2022-2023 administration of the climate survey was in response to advocacy from our association partners. One of the decisions um, we made was to start with a set of research-based survey items, which we leveraged from the many survey tools publicly available from Panorama Education. And we checked with them to ensure that their items were free to use, and we looked at their many survey instruments and um, they encouraged, as you look at their survey tools, to mix and match items from across their different survey tools. And so the survey items identified for the staff climate survey administered this past school year were determined collaboratively with leadership of our association partners. And unlike the surveys from the early 2000s, the goal was to have a more succinct survey of no more than about 25 items. And so once we finalized the survey, um, it was sent to all staff, school base and non-school base or central office staff via email. And um, we are able to achieve this because we work with our employee and retiree services center to obtain a list of all staff and they give us that information and we have email so we can push that information out. And the survey um, administration window, which you see there, which was between May 15th and May 31st, was informed by our association partners that allowed us to obtain the feedback from staff on the items indicated. And at the conclusion of the survey window, I have a staff person in my office, Mr. Holly Rosenbaum, I need to shout out, who takes all of the data and engages in data cleaning and organization to prepare for internal reporting and sharing with school-based and non-school-based office leaders. And while we had an aggressive timeline, because you'll notice that we pushed the results internally within a month of um, the survey closing, we were able to do that, which provides the information for them to learn of the perceptions and concerns that can support improving and creating positive and supportive educational and work environments. And the other thing to note that when we think about our district climate staff climate survey, we had an overall response rate of 40.3%. So we received 9,964 surveys back across school-based and non-school-based staff. 8,638 were from school-based staff, and the remaining 1,326 were from central office or non-school-based staff. Next slide, please. <clears throat> on this slide, we highlight some of the items on the staff climate survey with results shown for responses from school-based staff, which is the purple block on the screen, and non-school-based staff, which is the blue block. 
Before delving into the findings um, indicated, I want to share some information on assessing climate according to the RAND Corporation. They indicate that climate is closely related to two other concepts that are often used to describe the character of a learning environment. Culture, which refers to norms, values, and beliefs and assumptions of a school, and I'm going to add and an office, and context, which refers to both the compositional characteristics of a school and to the characteristics of the neighborhood or surrounding area. And in Rand's examination and findings from one of their studies, they shared that climate is complex and multidimensional. They further stated that culture can influence climate perceptions, and culture and climate shape one another, and aspects of culture can either inhibit or promote a positive climate. And so even with all that they indicated, it is important from Rand's perspective to assess climate. And so changing culture is difficult, they indicated, and it is easier to change an organization's climate at, based on how you're assessing it. And Dr. Moran will speak to that a little bit later as we go forward. And so on to the slide. On this slide are the specific survey items to the right and the percentages to the left. These items were identified to highlight specific areas of belonging, responsive, respect, um, positive working environment, and safety. It is important to understand, though, that it would not be appropriate, for example, to determine a climate of a school or office using only one of these items. The survey responses were on a four-point scale that we organized into what I would say is a positive side and a less than positive side. So the scale ranged from not at all, somewhat, quite, or extremely. And the percentages represented on this slide are those for responses on the positive side of the scale, meaning quite or extremely. And so in looking at the item focused on belonging, overall, how much do you feel like you belong at your school? And what you'll notice on the right side is the word office is in blue. That's what it said on the non-school-based slide. You will see that um, the percentages across the two groups are very similar, with 73.6% of school-based staff and 75.8% of non-school-based staff indicating they feel, feel um, like they belong at their school or office. Similarly, in examining the survey item of how respectful are the relationships between staff and students or staff in an office, 70.7% of school-based staff indicated the relationships are quite or extremely respectful compared to 78.9% of non-school-based staff. For the item focused on positive working environment, 56.2% of school-based staff indicated quite or extremely compared to 72.7% of non-school-based respondents. And for the final item on this slide, 72% of school-based respondents indicated feeling quite or extremely safe in their school, and 82.3% of non-school-based staff indicated feeling quite or extremely safe in their office. Next slide, please. Taking the same four items on the previous slide, we provide percentages disaggregated by race and, and ethnicity. Um, we were intentional to ask respondents to indicate their race and ethnicity on the slide, on the survey. And so in alignment with our anti-racist audit, we wanted to ensure that we engage in an examination of results as displayed. The first column is a repeat of what was on the previous slide, and the remaining columns represent the staff identified racial ethnic group. I will not read through the various percentages on this slide, but just wanted to have an opportunity for you to see this information and look at it as it relates to the positive um, percentages from staff based on race ethnicity. Next slide, please. On this slide are four additional survey items. Um, these items were identified, again, to highlight areas of things such as thinking deeply on race-related topics, excitement about work, discussing major news events related to race ethnicity, and engaging discussions on and examinations of data. Again, I want to reiterate the intention to not use a singular item as an overarching designation of the climate of a school or office. However, the information does allow one to show areas for growth or improvement. 
So for example, in my office, my leadership team, once we got our results, we looked at the results as a leadership team. We looked at areas where we didn't have high percentages on the positive end and identified areas where we can improve. And also we engaged in that discussion with our teams and our entire office to discuss what are we seeing and how do we improve. And so the percentages represented on this slide are those for responses on the positive side of the scale. Now, this scale was slightly different. We had two sets of scales on the survey, but it's similar. So the scales for these items range from almost never, sometimes, frequently, and almost always. And so on this slide, you will notice lower percentages on the positive end of the scale for non-school-based respondents who completed the survey compared to school-based respondents. And looking at the item focused on thinking deeply, 45.9% of non-school-based staff indicated they frequently or almost always are encouraged to think more deeply about race-related topics in their office compared to 66.7% of school-based staff. 41.5% of non-school-based staff reported feeling excited about work during the past week, frequently or almost always, compared to 57.9% of school-based respondents. 35.9% of school-based respondents and 36.1% of non-school-based respondents report adults or staff frequently or almost always talk about major news events related to race ethnicity, either in their school or in their office. And for the final item on this slide, 63.4% of school-based respondents and 50.8% of non-school-based respondents reported working in teams to examine data that lead to improving teaching, learning, and assessment. Next slide, please. Again, here we share the positive end of the scale for the four survey items disaggregated by race ethnicity. I will now turn it over to Dr. Moran, who will share how the Office of School Support and Wellbeing supports schools in monitoring their climate and use the survey results to examine strengths and areas of improvement. Next slide, please. Thank you, Dr. Addison. Um, good evening. President Silvestri, Board of Ed members, and uh, Dr. McKnight. Um, I appreciate having the opportunity to meet with you today uh, to discuss some of the important work that has been done over the past several months by the administrators, principals, teachers, and other and others in Montgomery County Public Schools. Uh, as you are aware, we are at a time and a place where school climate has become and must continue to be a focus for all of our work. The climate of the school system, the climate of a cluster of schools, the climate of one school, is the responsibility of all of us. From the bus driver that starts the day picking up the students in the early morning hours, to the principal that greets staff and students as they enter the building, to the main office administrative assistants that welcome students, staff, and families when they enter the building, to the teachers that collaborate in teams to plan best first instruction, to the director or associate superintendent and the manner in which they deliver feedback to a principal or assistant principal, to our communications department and the tone and timeliness of our messaging, and to you, the board members, who collect and respond to the feedback of the public. Each of us in this school system owns the climate of our schools. Therefore, it's our shared responsibility to care for one another, to demonstrate compassion and understanding because we know that positivity is transferable. And as adults, it transfers to the people that always matter most, our students. A key to improving school climate is understanding what it is and what it isn't. As you heard from Dr. Addison and Mrs. Sharon, we are administering a culture and climate survey next month, and therefore, we must understand the difference. Culture is our normed behavior, the habits that an organization establishes over time, and how it communicates, collaborates, and behaves. As you can see in the quote, the culture is our brand, the climate is how our brand makes us feel. Finally, the way to strengthen climate is by changing our norms, habits, and behavior. Next slide, please. In alignment with the Office of Strategic Initiatives, the Office of School Support and Wellbeing examines the four key questions on each school's individual survey. Again, these questions are overall, how much do you feel like you belong at your school? How respectful are the relationships between staff and students? Overall, how positive is the working environment at your school, and how safe do you feel in your school? Based on the percentages of staff that respond not at all or somewhat, we respond by engaging the principal administrative team or instructional leadership team in a discussion to determine the level of support that is needed. 
These discussions are driven to ensure that we understand the full context of the data, exhibiting an understanding that it is one survey that indicates how staff feel at that precise moment. The collection of additional information can be done through the most basic yet productive practice a school or office can implement. Focus group discussions to gain a under, deeper understanding to identify what immediate steps can be taken to solve a problem. To be effective, these focus group discussions must be followed up with immediate action and a communication of commitments to habits or norms that will change and how they will change. To improve climate, actions that demonstrate active listening are essential. As a result, directors and associates determine if they will provide standard support or supplemental support or both, essentially, um, as seen on this slide. For example, you'll see under standard support four supervisory visits that are aligned with the implementation of the school improvement plan. Currently, we are in the middle of our second supervisory visit. In both the first and second supervisory visits, one of the five key, qu key questions that is posed, discussed, and for which actions are identified is, how are you collectively addressing your culture and climate goal with your triad? The term triad is posted on this slide in both standard and supplemental supports. The triad is a team of three or more people that represents our three unions, SEIU, MCEA, and MCAP, that address culture and climate-based issues through monthly scheduled meetings and informal check-ins as needed. The functioning of this team is a significant determinant in strengthening school climate. It must function from a proactive stance as opposed to a reactive stance. Strong relationships between the three representative Representatives provide continuous dialogue, resulting in anticipation of problems and allowing for collaborative solutions to be introduced while the school climate is steered in a positive manner. Next slide, please. Every school improvement plan across all 211 schools has a culture and climate goal. I'm proud to say that this is the first time a goal focused on culture and climate has been included in the school improvement plan. The achievement of this goal is determined based on a specific set of actions, which I will discuss on the next slide. On this slide, we are looking at Oakview Elementary's school climate goal for both students and staff. I'd like to tell the climate story of Oakview Elementary to describe a high-level example of how a school is capitalizing on the school improvement plan to change school climate. As you can see on the slide, Oakview has established a goal that's focused on increasing the sense of belonging for black and African American students and increasing the access that Hispanic and Latinas, Latino students have uh, to a trusted adult. For the staff climate goal, they are focused on one of the key questions. Overall, how positive is the working environment at your school or office? The development they took to establish these goals and actions to meet that, them went through the following process. The administration looked at the results of the survey over the summer and completed a thorough self-reflection of the results and identified ways to impact climate to make changes. I want to highlight this because this reflection was shared with their staff. One of, the, one of the key ways to change school climate is to demonstrate vulnerability. This same process of self-reflection was conducted with the instructional leadership team. The process resulted in administration's uh, commitments to school climate and working with the staff to establish uh, staff climates, uh, staff commitments to climate. These commitments extended across multiple questions. However, in alignment with the school improvement plan and a positive working environment being the focus, the staff committed as a school to the following norms and behaviors. We listen with an open mind in a non-judgmental way. We will check in with staff from time to time. We will be open to, re to and respectful of feedback from our colleagues. We will support and respect others being mindful of our expressions and body language. We will show appreciations, acknowledgments, aha moments, and apologies. We will actively listen without, without withholding judgment and the need to speak. We will practice empathy. We will be, be open and respectful of feedback from our colleagues. We will model kindness and respect for our students. I share these commitments with you because developing a shared commitment and honoring that commitment is how we change school climate. It is important that as educators, as the adults, we recognize that in order to change the climate of a learning environment for students, we must change our behaviors. Asking ourselves the critical question, how do my actions contribute to a positive school climate or office climate? Finally, while the goal is always to attain 100%, similar to academic goals, the climate goals are also over a three-year period of time. 
As a result, during each of the next three years, Oakview is focused on increasing the percentage of staff and students that respond with quite or extremely by five percentage points or 15 percentage points by the conclusion of the continuous school improvement cycle. Next slide, please. So right here, we're looking at an action plan from another school that outlines specific steps that will be taken to achieve their school improvement culture and climate goals. You will notice that one of the first actions is professional learning on relationship building and community engagement with students and families. While we have attempted to return to a pre-pandemic environment, this action plan recognizes that a result of isolation and years with minimal community engagement and relationship development, those knowledge and skills need to be built. A specific action that was demonstrated by this school was not relying on one data point in time, but by collecting additional survey data from students and staff at the conclusion of the first marking period, followed by collaborative analysis and discussion with staff and student focus groups. In addition, this group also leveraged the anti-racist audit findings to engage in discussions with students and families representing different racial groups to better understand how they define positive relationships and engagement with their communities. This additional data has allowed for school leadership teams to determine the impact of their action plans and continue to modify them as they move forward through the course of the school year. I'm now gonna turn it back over to Mrs. Sharon. Thank you, Dr. Moran. If we can go to the next slide. So just as important as making sure that we're addressing climate results in schools, we need to make sure that we're also addressing the climate results in the offices as well. And the process that is followed is very similar to what Dr. Moran stated in, in intensive detail around the school improvement planning process and what Dr. Addison highlighted as an example of how she unpacked her individual department's climate survey results. So when offices received their climate survey results, they engaged in a similar process of data analysis, of unpacking with their staff in order to help draft goals within their office improvement plans. Um, in addition to that, we also got uh, a lot of feedback, additional feedback at the October ANS meeting um, and also with our employee associations through both our conversations with the board and in individual meetings. Um, the superintendent's core team also took the feedback that we collected and they analyzed it and it is in the process of thinking and developing what new practices and structures need to be made based on the feedback. For example, um, we heard the critical importance from central office staff about needing strong onboarding structures and that, that having strong onboarding structures is something that definitely improves climate because you feel less overwhelmed if you feel like you're being onboarded into the climate and culture of the, of the community in which, which you work. Right now, we're looking at how, how best to do that. Some other action steps include in central office is our community of practices that have recently been um, launched that are comprised of internal and external stakeholders. Um, they're looking at our climate and culture data to provide additional recommendations that we can utilize in both schools and central office. Additionally, all central office leaders further developed their actions that they identified in their office improvement plans by fostering a strong climate during professional development sessions in November that they all participated in. We are also in the process of revising our culture of respect compact with our three associations and we'll be rolling out a plan of implementation um, for that in the second half of, or I should say at the start of um, 2024. Again, our focus remains on a positive culture for teaching and learning and that includes both the work in central office as well as the work in schools. And this is gonna continue to be an adaptive challenge that we have to work through um, and that we have to work through together across the system to, de to develop the actions that we need to take collectively. Next slide. So I think it's important just to remind our audience of where they can find all of these results by school. Um, you can go to the shared accountability webpage and you can find um, whichever school you'd like to look at or office and department. I do have, there is a caveat that based on the level of respondents for the central office um, surveys, not every single department is broken out because we had to think about our suppression rules around that. Um, but the data is can be found there as well. Next slide. 
So where are we going next? We launched our staff survey. We have utilized this staff survey in addition to uh, multiple other data points in order to craft office improvement goals and school improvement plans, as well as identify actions to improve our overall culture and climate. But that is only phase one. Um, where our, our excitement is really around the launch of our full student, family, and staff surveys that are going to be launched next month, towards, most likely towards the end of next month in January. Um, we worked collaboratively with our association partners and received a lot of feedback that providing the survey in May or in the springtime is a, like the worst time of year to survey folks <laughs> in the whole community. So we heard that feedback and we moved it up to January. Right now we're in the process of developing the survey items and finalizing them with students and families. All of our survey items, as Dr. Addison noted at the beginning, when you think about the history of the climate survey and the different categories of questions that we identified, going all the way back to 2003, right? These are the categories based that, that have been identified for all three surveys to align with, that align with both our district priorities and our strategic plan. So. All questions will be aligned with these areas, and the questions will actually align with each other between the stakeholder groups so that when someone's analyzing the results for one particular school, for instance, they'll be able to see um, comparatively how students answered a similar question to staff and the community in order to help determine patterns and trends. If you go to the next slide, please. So again, as I stated, we're in the process of finalizing our survey for this upcoming year. We are doing this in January so that we can release results in the spring. Other feedback that we've heard from schools is when we get it in the summer after people leave, we don't get a chance to process and really engage our communities around the results. They will have it before then. So before school lets out, they'll be able to actually take a look at the results with their communities and engage in some preliminary planning before the school year hits when they start working on their school improvement plans. Again, we're working on vetting um, our survey questions, particularly around the staff and fam uh, no, I always mess this up, student and family surveys right now. I had a great conversation with Mr. Saeed just yesterday after getting some student feedback on the surveys. We reviewed all the, re reviewed all the feedback with him and he gave some additional insights and we talked about how we can collaborate um, in the future as we're thinking about what information we need. We are working with our family engagement charter and our associations. We've held multiple um, focus groups with some folks just to take a look and provide some input into what we're asking before we finalize. We are also working with our family engagement charter in order to develop a culturally responsive engagement plan to maximize the participation of our families and communities in responding to our surveys in a culturally responsive manner. Right now, um, we're talking about how we're going to communicate early and more often with our community. That's the feedback that we've heard. Using culturally responsive language to explain the purpose of the survey. We know in certain pockets of our population, there's fear. There's even there's fear of completing surveys um, because they think that they might you might use that information against them in our community. So how we're messaging that is going to be important. Going to family events such as Latino parent meetings or to church events to provide opportunities for families and support for them in completing the surveys. Um, we're also talking about adding voiceovers for questions that par for parents who cannot read. Um, how can we help support with that? Personalized outreach. Our parent, our PCCs, our amazing parent community coordinators are working lockstep with us to um, really help us deploy this and support our families in completing. And even talking about how we can engage in some workshops with families that would like to come and learn more, and we can actually walk through that through with them with the surveys. Again, we also are going to be providing support and guidance to schools on how to maximize the engagement of their students and their staff in the survey. And our results will be available, as I stated, internally for school and district leaders in the spring. Next slide. So at this time, I'll turn it over to President Silvestri for questions. Uh, board members, if you could please turn your lights on if you have questions. We'll start with Ms. Yang. Okay. So, good evening. Wow, is it really dark outside? <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, being here and to talk about this very important topic. Now, I heard um, definition, say culture is our brand, climate is how that brand makes us feel. And I'm just wondering, as a system, have we ever defined what is our culture? What is our climate? What are we striving towards? Okay. 
Yes, thank you, um, Ms. Yang. So I think that's the work that we're embracing right now. I think after going through the pandemic, really the brand is developed from who is it that we want to be and what do we want to be known for in the school system? Basically our North Star. And that's not something that I'd say that we have collectively done in my years as MCPS. I mean, we knew what we knew about ourselves, but I think after so much change, it's time for us to redefine that. And I think going through the process of, you know, creating the, the new survey and, and highlighting the things that are important that we want to stand out about our school system is really what we are working to achieve now. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the perfect timing for it, given where we are. But as we, they've discussed, um, Dr. Baran mentioned this in his, his talking points, it's like, and it's, we must do this because it's the work of everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it's about making sure that when we talk about what our brand is and what we want that to be, every teacher, every principal, every bus driver, everybody in the system knows and understands that. So I, I see that being the work that we are embracing right now, which I think is a great time to do that. And it's something that, if I may add, that I think organizations don't necessarily put that out there. I mean, I know that when you interview folks, that's often a question they ask. Tell me about the culture here. But it's not something you put on a strategic plan on our website. Our culture is, maybe you see that more in the private sector, but uh, as Dr. McKnight says, it's, that doesn't mean something that we can't uh, be more proactive about. Yeah, so when I think about we are sending out a survey, right, to understand our culture and our climate, and <coughs> um, then we gather feedback, so, but, you know, how do we, what questions to put on, how do we evaluate how good we are mm -hmm. in achieving some, something? So a definition, or maybe not a definition, in the, but some understanding of what we are working towards, it's important if we are to survey. Uh, 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 and, I, and I do, although we don't define culture, or have a culture definition, you know, in the strategic plan, we do have a mission and vision mm -hmm. in MCPS that is part of our strategic plan that we are constantly aiming towards mm -hmm. achieving. So I think using that mission and vision and what our uh, viewpoint is as a district, what we're trying to strive is what we should be benchmarking against. Okay. So um, as we are, um, you still developing questions uh, for the survey. One of the sayings uh, that we have heard a lot, uh, you know, is no one can whistle a symphony. Uh, it takes the whole orchestra to play it, right? And um, as a staff member, when I was doing the survey, or many of our community members as parents when they do in the survey, somehow I think to a great extent there are um, people equate leadership to our principles. So, but as we know from the saying that it takes a village and, and I want us as a school system to think about how do we share powers? How do we promote group efforts? And how we have collective responsibilities. So we all know that Oftentimes, if it's not measured, then it's not being done. So I'm wondering whether this is an opportunity for us also to take a look at that. I think, I, I, just to respond, I just I think one of the things that, um, as an associate superintendent, in, in measuring the effectiveness of a principal mm -hmm. is how many leaders they create in their building, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. that, and, and so when we look at that and, and try to mm -hmm. um, push our principals to distribute leadership throughout their school. Mm -hmm. um, it creates that culture in the school where everyone has a, a sense of ownership over the climate because they're a leader. So um, that's, I just wanted to share that. I think that's one of the things that we're, we, we need to focus on more is creating those opportunities um, because when we, from a, from a building service manager and uh, recently was out at, out at a school and we had an OSET 
uh, team meeting, an on-site emergency team meeting, and the building service manager was the logistics manager and was, was, took, a, took a very active role in the leadership of that meeting. Um, and the, the, the principal was, was you, if you walked in, you wouldn't really know which position was held by who, right? The building service manager at that time could have been viewed as, as the principal. And I, I think I use that as an example because that building service manager had a tremendous amount of pride mm -hmm. in the school, confidence in his leadership ability, and as a result of being empowered with that opportunity, then that there is the culture of a, of a school right there. Right. So I think that is the key of us bringing everyone forward. We have a lot of uh, experts in different area inside our buildings, in our each offices. How do we galvanize everyone? And so we all work towards a uh, our goal. So I see this climate survey as a good opportunity for us to have a clear vision of what we're trying to achieve, right? Our culture and climate, what are we trying to achieve? And how, how do we go about it? Because the question we ask will tell us a lot about how we are going about doing it. Yeah, so thank you for everyone's work in this area. Mr. Said. Yes. Um, first, I want to say, um, Sharon, thank you so much for the shout out. Uh, I am so glad that you guys did that focus group of students. Um, I think it's so important that they're part of this because a lot of the time there can be disconnect in the types of questions we're asking because, you know, adults are making this for students, but students have very different perspectives. So I just want to thank you for that. Um, I have uh, one qu couple qu quick things to say here. I think one of them is that it would be great if we could see the data broken down by the four point scale that you guys use. Right now, we just see the, the groups that said quite or extremely, and then we're basically assuming the rest. But I think there's a big difference, one between extremely I fit in extremely here. I, I feel like I, you know, fit in, you know, quite, you know. I think those, are, that's a big difference, and I'd want to see that breakdown because I want to know what, 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 what schools they feel really great at, what schools feel okay, and then also the somewhat not at all because I think grouping those together, those are also very different. Somewhat's like, oh yeah, it's fine. Not at all is is a problem, and I want to be able to generally to kind of you know see that data broken down, and um, I, I think that would be really really helpful because right now. Really, we're getting one data point. We're getting quite or extremely grouped together. That's just one data point, but I, I'd want to get more kind of in-depth info on that. And then I had a question. Um, so I, I noticed that you know you guys break it down by um, ethnicity uh, and racial groups, and I see that there's another group that is consistently you know scoring below where we want it to, far more than any other group. It would be great maybe um, if in the future we could have more specific metrics on that, like maybe Middle Eastern be identified, two or more races, so we can see is there one group within that other group that's really because th that could be so many different things and I, I you know I don't know what other means so I feel like I'm kind of being left in the dark that wow we have this one group that's way below where we want it to be who is that comprised of um, so just I think generally more specificity in this would be great and you know if you have a response to that um, that would be much appreciated thank you so much thank you Ms. Sasai for your feedback and your comments the first um, I want to addresses the breakdown for each of the four scales, you can see that on our website. So for the purpose of the board presentation and the visual, it, it's a lot, a little complex to kind of show it in a, a data visualization for all four categories. But if you go to our website, you will be able to see the percent respondents for each of those scales for the schools. Okay, thank you. I know because we also got emailed and it was in the same format. Right, here. correct. Because so, again, that was an yeah. that was an intentional approach okay. to sharing that, um, recognizing that it's publicly available for the individual. So we were trying to synthesize it and summarize it for folks to make it easy. Okay, I appreciate that. Yeah, I wasn't aware that there was more in depth on the website. So, okay, thank you for that. And then, can you repeat your second, the second part that you raised? Other. Yeah. Other. Oh, yes, thank yeah. you. Um, the One of the challenges we face with other, um, and one of the reasons we organized uh, and created an other group are due to low representation from the different racial ethnic groups. And so um, we've heard, we're hearing from you today, we've heard from our other um, community partners interest in being uh, more discreet in terms of the groups that we represent. And one of the challenges we have to recognize is that when we continue to kind of delve into even more, it makes it even more challenging for us to report because we're going to get into really low numbers and, and we want to protect, protect 
the um, identity of those who respond. And so intentionality around creating those larger racial ethnic groups that we tend to typically report on that align with the federal reporting categories and creating that other so that we don't unintentionally identify individuals when we do our report. Okay, thank you. I, I understand that. Uh, Mr. Verabin. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I, I have um, uh, a observation on page, um, on slide nine. Um, during the past week, how often do you feel excited about your work? Uh, across the board, those are really some really low numbers. Um, that is something that I see when I visit schools like the morale of our staff, um, which is to me, this is a huge red flag, honestly. So I was at a school a couple of weeks ago there were 15 people who called in sick at this little elementary school, 15. And the poor principal was going to actually be teaching a class or covering a class. So for me, at what, what happens with that? Like what, what is our response? Because as we have these great schools where people feel like they belong and the kids feel they belong, we also have other schools that there is such a, um, anemic response in belonging or being being excited to go to work. So what do we do with that? What does the response look like um, from us to support these schools with those issues? Like, just walk me through it. I'm not going to, I'm going to allow Dr. Moran to speak to that piece, but I did want to um, share what we heard from principals as we've been engaging and preparing for this new um, launch of the survey and and specifically that item because they called that item out themselves as well and I think it's a valuable aspect of what you just raised. There are a number of factors that can impact how I feel about work in a week and one of the things that a few of the principals mentioned was well when we launched this survey it was heavy testing. Right. So most people aren't excited when it's a, a heavy testing week in a school building, which could impact how they respond to the survey. So those are some of the facts. And I, that was important information for me as we're developing that, because it also impacts the timing of when we roll the survey out, because if we roll the survey out in the height of testing windows, we recognize the stress, the impact of testing windows and administration and school buildings, so that could influence how I reflect on the survey. So I wanted to add that piece first, but I'll turn to Dr. Moran to speak to this. Yeah, and, and, and do we look at, you know how we look at truancy, how often kids do not show up to school and so on and so on. Do we have something like that for staff to kind of identify that there's, you know, that they're, you know, that they're calling in sick or they're, you know, or, or exactly, or disengage. I mean, do we measure that? So, yes, we do. So actually, uh, it, the first email every single morning that I receive and that many of us receive around this table is the number of staff out at each particular building. And what happens with that data point is that initiates a, a, a series of actions in terms of contacting that principal, uh, potentially deploying central office resources to that school, um, assessing why those absences are occurring, um, working even with, um, you know, Dr. Kapunin, um, is it relative to sickness, is it relative to um, mental health, is it relative, so, so an assessment essentially is done based off of the number of those um, absences at the school. So. Um, uh, Amy Bledsoe, going to give her a shout out because I see her name at about 5:30 every morning. Boom, that that email comes through. So and 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 it's like clockwork. So, but to to answer the 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 first question around morale, um, I think I think it's important to say that morale is being impacted by many differing factors right now. Right. So the idea that the morale um, of a school is is contained within the environment of a school is just is is just not realistic anymore. There are event, there are so many societies societal issues that are, as you, everyone knows here, um, are impacting our staff, are impacting um, our, our students, our community members. Um, and I think one of the things that um, has been 
a critical thing has been our partnership with the well-being side of, of our office um, to deploy resources to schools uh, to support with things uh, like morale. Um, our restorative justice coaches are um, are outstanding and, and do that work uh, about you know creating that environment, um, not just responding to incidents, but being in there proactively. Uh, Yep, um, employee assistance program also is another thing that we that we provide. But I think the, essentially the the one thing I wanted to communicate to you is is that what moves morale in schools is is the work of teams. And so when you're working in isolation in a school, you feel alone and your morale dips. Those schools that have opportunities for people to truly collaborate in conditions where they can be honest and open, and they are contributing to the work, to the plan for a, a specific lesson, um, that's what changes morale. So um, a lot of the work that the associates and directors do is, is, is observing, evaluating, providing support around how to build a team, the roles and responsibilities that those different individuals have, um, how to do things like I just talked about where you're creating those leadership opportunities. Um, at the end of the day, people want to do a great job. Um, sometimes they need um, the, the best, I think, feedback that anyone can ever give somebody is asking for their help. Um, and I think some of our best principals, assistant principals, teacher leaders, ask others for their help, ask others for their expertise. That changes morale. Ms. Yang? Yes, um, I want to get an understanding. Um, after receiving the climate survey, um, if there are schools that are um, outliers, or how do you use this data uh, to to work with the, the schools? That's part one. Part two, I'm a staff member in the school. I I gave very low marks, right? To for example, how positive is the working environment? Is it my admin that's engaging me in this conversation? I might not feel comfortable, you know, voice my, um, you know, like be identified in fear of retaliation or whatever. So how does this work? Help me visualize how does this work happen in our buildings and to really address? So, so there, there's, a, there's a couple layers to that answer. So the first thing that I would say is that you, one always needs to consider the context of when they receive a data point, similar to if I receive a data point about you know, a, a student and making a judgment on what that student you know, is able to, to learn and do. Um, so one of it is going out and actually having a conversation, looking at the number of responses, right? So there have been times where people have looked at data and the response rate may be significantly low. The, the, in that particular situation, the um, action may be to administer a similar survey to collect more information or to bring people in. I, I was at Highland the other day, uh, Scott Steffen, the principal there, does tell me anything meetings with each of his grade level teams where essentially there's no agenda. They sit down and they just have a conversation. Um, but I think to, to, um, to, to paint a picture that I think um, a, that is the key to really addressing this, that um, we are in the process of planning how to have um, high functioning triads at all 211 schools in partnership with our unions, is that you have to have a triad team who brings things to you, not at this set meeting at the end of each month, but continuously, and that you have those relationships and you're working together to address those problems. Um, and that they feel safe being in that. And you're also very transparent about not only the input of what's coming into that space, but the output of what's happening. What's the action that we're taking together? Um, and, and sharing that with your ILT, being transparent about it with your staff. So that is one of our immediate actions, um, that is, is, to, is, to, is to work with our partners on the, on the triad team. But you'll find the correlation often with school climate in a high-functioning triad team that is working very closely together um, to proactively address um, you know, uh, potential climate issues. Dr. Magnate? Yes, I just thank you for that, Dr. Moran. Um, <coughs> You're spot on. I mean, and just for public consumption, the triad is a team within a team that is um, representative of uh, elected faculty for our 
MCEA, SEIU, and the principal, McCap. And uh, I think it strikes the perfect opportunity, Mr. Uh, Hull and I have been talking in terms of developing that plan to work with our associations on how we all share the responsibility of strengthening that team. That was a team that was developed collectively, uh, I think, early to 2012. 2012. There we go. Let's say early around 210, 212, um, to actually do this very thing, have that shared responsibility within the schools and make sure that everybody feels valued in the work that they're contributing. So now is a great opportunity for us to do that. Mr. Hall, I know we had that conversation recently, but is any, anything you want to add here? No, I think you, you covered it pretty well. <clears throat> so we look forward to doing that work. Um, we had a great you know, discussion with MCA, I believe it was a couple of months ago, just about that. And I think the launch of the climate survey and all the collaboration that's been done with them just leads us into the next step. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And my question was going to be about how you're working with the association. So <clears throat> uh, since you mentioned <clears throat> the triad teams, could you give me, uh, paint the picture, as Ms. Yang says, what does a high-functioning triad team look like? <clears throat> so um, so, so the, the first is that I, they, I think the, you, you norm, they have norms that they set for how they engage around the just basic tenets of, of respectful uh, communication. Um, and, you know, at the time when triad teams in 2012 were created, we had this uh, culture of, of respect um, pact. Um, that was a, a leverage point for how those triad teams were launched. So, um, you know, there are, there are some things that um, always work, and um, one, one of those things is, is, is defining that culture of respect for, for the triad team. I think the other piece is ensuring that there's an understanding of the levels of decision making um, amongst that team and ensuring that people know the role and responsibility that they carry um, and that at the end of the meeting when that we're, we're providing people with how, how a certain decision was made, the rationale for that decision, what it's gonna look like when it's implemented um, for the whole staff, like what, what they're going to experience. Um, they don't meet uh, at just set times. <clears throat> It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, the EFR could go in and meet with the principal on any given day, like just to say, I want to give you a heads up on this. Let's get ahead of this. So it's about a group of people that are anticipating things on the horizon, not sitting back and waiting for something to impact the school climate, right? There are many things that triad teams do that never get to the staff. They never even have any knowledge of something because they work through it together prior to it being, you know, a public um, uh, issue. Um, it could be something as, you know, um, specific as, you know, planning time or um, the um, the the way that arrivals and, and different responsibilities are dis disseminated amongst the entire staff. So um, I would say that those that may, are not high functioning utilize it as only having a set meeting once a month as a kind of a, as a check the box as opposed to uh, that's my timer as opposed to <laughs> yeah as a, as opposed to a, uh, a a an ongoing continuous dialogue that happens naturally and organically and not through this kind of stuffy agenda driven process and my final question is um, when a when a climate survey is low year after year um, can you say more about how how are you getting that street data t to unpack, you know, what what the root causes are, so you can develop your plan for improvement? So and, and the trust issue, right? Yeah. So I'll, first, I'll, I'll just start by so we we have a very we have a specific standard that is around the climate of a school. It's standard six for for all of our principals. Um, standard eight is also about the the community that's developed under the principal's leadership. So as a principal supervisor, I always start at that place with the standards. Right? We all are driven by what are the standards, what are the expectations that uh, we each carry each day. So um, when it's continuous, um, the the to get right at it, the, the most in critical move for a principal supervisor to make is to partner with the principal and collect that street data being a part of it, and not through a survey. 
uh, through a sit-down conversations, essentially a listen and learn, collecting the trends of what people are sharing, then working with the principal about sharing out those trends, right? You said we will. And then establishing a plan that they present publicly with their staff about how they're going to improve uh, the, the climate because of, and just being open with the data, a let's say a three-year trend of, of positive working environment, um, you know, not being um, at a sas satisfactory rate. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I know we're administering this, the, the survey again, and to right. more uh, parties in a month or so, and um, it comes back to the board mm -hmm. in the spring after we get the results. So um, this has been a good uh, preview to that, and uh, we look forward to, to seeing the improvements that you made and how it plays out in the next uh, administration. Dr. McKnight. Oh, so I had a quick Seven. question, and it was just, I was just listening to what you were saying, um, Peter, it, and this may not even be a good question, but based on what you said, can we, can we say that some of the results that come back that the administrators are not surprised? Not what? So, so I, I, I'll answer that as some, for, based off of standards and expectations. Right. No one should be surprised about right. what, the, what, yeah. the, yeah, okay. the, what their climate looks yeah. like. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. Dr. Minnie? I was just going to say there are so many different ways we will and will continue to use this survey moving forward. The first step was getting it back in place so that we could use it as a Dr. Miranda and Dr. Addison and Ms. Sharon stated a data point that is even in, in all of our decisions. I just remember um, even when I was hired as a principal in Montgomery County Public Schools, I remember being told, you know, you want to look at this school survey data. What does this mean and require for your work going in? And so, you know, you think about those types of things, that, that's how it should be used in a part of the conversation decision making all the time. And so, you know, I think you've gotten a really good jump start to that process. and and um, look forward to just continuing to use it in all ways to help us and help um, our school staff overall take control of it. I mean, I want, so badly wanted to answer the question, but I wanted Dr. Moran to do it too because he's over on that side and I wanted to give him the opportunity, but when Ms. Avestri <laughs> asked the question, you know, what does this good triads look like? I mean, each of us as principals could go back and think about when, we ha when that process first started, it was really good. It was exciting to say, actually, as a principal, you individually don't own by yourself everything that happens, and you don't have all the right ideas <laughs> or all the answers mm -hmm. that bring people in and for them to be able to say, you know what, this is what we can do to boost morale, or you know, we'll collect information and bring it back to our meeting. And it's a part of the discussion all the time. So when it's a part of the discussion all the time, then there are no surprises. And everybody knows and, and is a part of, of what we have to create. So I, I'm, I am thrilled about the opportunity in front of us to continue to utilize this in a way that elevates ownership of all staff in our school buildings moving forward. And overall, our entire system, because central office, you know, that data is a big part of this, too. You know, that's something that we have to continue to look at and, and look at actually the, how the two always complement each other in, in reaching those goals. So. Thank you so much to the team. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for your work. And uh, we'll now move on and to our next agenda item, um, the 2022-23 Annual Report and Strategic Plan Updates, item number nine. Dr. McKnight. Yes, I was just wondering where Ms. Sharon was going. Yeah. She was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ms. Sharon, come back to the table. <laughs> so thank you. Um, so thank you so much. And as I see her coming to the table, I see she's coming with, uh, I think last year you came with posters. Oh, yeah. She's coming, yes, with the visuals. We have them. Oh, there you go. They already have them. So we're going to discuss the 2022-23 annual report and provide an update in terms of where we are. Um, we're also proud that as a part of this, we're going to have our new school profiles data dashboard, um, which is huge. That just helps us really guide all of our work and create that level of transparency that we, you know, people always say we can work towards. Well, this is a perfect example of exactly how we do that. So I want to thank Ms. Sharon and her team. I mean, we have, you know, just been going through and talking about ways that we can build these systems to be more transparent and, and for our staff 
more user friendly so that they can utilize this in the work that they're doing. So we're excited to share that this evening. I'll turn the presentation over to Dr. Collins. I'm really excited to introduce this presentation today. We spend a great deal of time talking about the challenges of our schools um, and the district. These challenges sometimes overshadow all the great work our staff do every day to support our students and families. The annual report gives us an opportunity to look back at the previous school year to provide our communities with information about student performance, operational performance data, and the steps taken to fulfill the vision and mission of Montgomery County Public Schools during the 2022-23 school year. Our team will introduce the new school profiles data dashboards based on the findings from the anti-racist audit system. Many families questioned if Montgomery County Public Schools is providing all the information about how our schools are doing. The dashboards were developed to make it easier for students, families, and staff to see in real time how each school is reaching the milestones with the pathway to college, career, and community readiness. This is one step in providing transparency, accountability, and rebuilding trust within our community. I will now turn it over to Ms. Stephanie Sharing, Chief Strategic Initiatives. Thank you, Dr. Collins. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. So as Dr. McKnight and Dr. Collins indicated, there are three parts to our presentation today. Um, we're going to first talk about updates to our strategic plan, because as a reminder, our strategic plan is our roadmap. And based on the adoption of our strategic plan in FY22, we identified that this was going to be a living, breathing document that we were going to be coming back to each year and updating strategies and metrics along the way. We're then going to talk about the annual report. And again, this is our story of our district in the last school year. And we typically have uh, shared this story um, in anywhere from January, February to March. And we purposely moved this story up to December because we wanted to be more timely with what is the story of our district? Where are we? And this year, as you can see, we um, decided to add from our web version a PDF version that you can be found online. And we also have printed copies that you all received that really gives us the highlight and overview of who we are as a district and what we've accomplished in the past year. And then finally, we're going to talk about where we want to go in the future, right? So we're going to take a look back. We're going to talk about where we are at in our strategic plan, which is our roadmap. And then we're going to conclude with where our thinking is as we're moving forward and how we're communicating our story and creating that transparency to our community. And the, what we're going to introduce with the school profiles dashboard today is just the beginning. So we're really excited to share that with you all today. So before I get started, I do want to recognize a few folks that were integral in the development of all of this. First, um, the updates to the strategic plan was a collective effort from the entire district. Every single office was involved in updating the metrics as well as the strategies, because this is the living, breathing work of everybody. For the annual report, um, none of this would have happened without Sarah Siddons, who probably is not watching from France right now because she is in Paris on vacation. Uh, but she did say she was sorry to miss it. She'll watch the recording. Um, but she really project managed this from a from the comms lens. And Andrew Vines, with his amaz amazing creativity, who designed the PDF, as well as dealt with a lot of go back and forth feedback around the annual report, just did a fantastic job. And Ashley Rhodes, my um, assistant, who really served as as the project manager for all of this. And then finally, I would like to recognize the student and data systems team, many of which are here over to my right I see today. Um, Daisy DaCosta, De Greg Bryden, Kathleen Schrantz, Emily Colbert, Darshini Shah, and Val De Silva, who when I say worked, we're working 24 hours a day on putting this dashboard together, it was a true labor of love. Um, and I would, this none of it would have been put together without They took a vision and ran with it, um, which, is, which is what true innovation is all about. So thank you for that. Um, if we can go to the next slide. 
are actually, can we pull up my view of the, thank you. Okay, so the first thing that we're gonna talk about are the updates to the strategic plan. So, if you go to our strategic plan website, which can be navigated uh, from our home screen, all right, you will see this is where we always put our updates to our strategic plan. And again, the purpose of today's conversation is not to go through every single data point in our strategic plan, um, but it's just to really reference where we have updated the information and what those updates look like. I also want to note, as you can see, there's a year coming up there, 2025, where this strategic plan will be expiring. Um, we, the vision really behind this is to to really engage in a robust engagement process with our community, with our staff, with our Board of Education, and with our students on revamping and updating our strategic plan. And that is going to start with strategic planning committee this spring. Um, and we really want to think about what we have learned from this strategic plan and how we can make it even better based on, the, on what we have learned. Um, as you can see, when you scroll through our strategic plan website, we have our most current enrollment and demographic data. You will notice in the annual report and the strategic plan, the graduation rates are still listed for 2022 as we have not received official data and will not receive the official data until 2024. So we did put a note in there. As soon as we get that official data, we will update the 2023 from the state. Again, um, when we go down, and we were just talking earlier in the last about our core values um, and our mission and vision as a district is listed here. Another academic excellence, you can see these are our, all of the objectives that are outlined in our strategic plan, and you can click on any one of these in order to see the updates. I'm gonna click on math and literacy because I wanna highlight a few things for you. Um, for the strategic plan, as a reminder, each year we update the strategies. These are here. MCPS staff utilizes the data that they have presented through all of the board meetings, through the, through the metrics that we collect with the strategic plan in order to evaluate, are their high leverage strategies working? And if they're not, what modifications can we make and to make sure that we're being transparent with our community? Additionally, if you scroll down, you will see year one actuals that from last year, our target for the for 2022-23, and our year two, because this is 2022-2023 data, um, that we hit, and you can hit see this for every one. Now, we made a modification strategically um, for the literacy and math. We have heard a lot around the evidence of learning data. We've heard a couple things. One that this number that they see doesn't match what they have seen in other presentations. So I want to be clear on what this is showing versus what you've seen, per, for instance, in the October 26th evidence of learning presentation. In our presentations um, and in our data dashboards, we share our evidence of learning data by looking at grades two, five, eight, and 11. We also take a look at our transition grade levels of three, six, and nine. This year, because the board identified three, six, and nine as their priority, we actually showed new data around those grade levels. The strategic plan is the aggregate number right there for grades K all the way up to 12 for the entire school system. But in order to create additional transparency here, this is why this number here might look different than what you see on the grade two EOL. There is a pop out that we added here that does provide the disaggregated results for the entire district in literacy and math for the strategic plan. So that you can see this is where all students hit in both literacy and math, and this is where they hit when you look at the high level view. That is a recent addition based on feedback that we heard and a desire to see that level of detail in the strategic plan. <coughs> As you go through the strategic plan, you also see board meetings linked in here. We linked and matched every board meeting um, and the slide decks and materials with, a strategic, with the strategic plan objectives because that way you can go deeper if you so choose to take a look at the specific data points and presentations around the work. You will see that highlighted for all of the areas, giving just another example as you're looking at, at, at um, well-being and family en or engagement. Okay, you'll see that there is information identified here with the new targets that are identified in the plan. As I said, we will be coming back in the spring to start thinking about how we want to reimagine the way our strategic plan looks and what updates we want to make. Um, so that is our strategic plan and you can scroll through that. 
The next item that I'm going to share is really the feature of today, uh, one of the features of today, and that is the annual report. The updates to the strategic plan um, is in the annual report. Let me scroll to the top so that we're all seeing the same thing. Now, what Andrew Vines, who very brilliantly de developed, this is, the, is, is a brief snapshot. It has all the same information that is on the web page. Whoops. Nope, you can go to the web page, not the PowerPoint. Yeah, there you go. Um, it has all the same information that is on the web page, but it's a truncated version. You can go much deeper in the web page if you want to go take a look at our progress. So we also heard some feedback around the design that we wanted to make improvements of. So as you can see, we have our translated options up here. Not going to go through every data point in the strategic plan, but I do want to highlight some of the great work that has happened in the past year um, that we should be celebrating as a district. We know that we have a lot of work to do in a lot of areas, but we've also made great gains. In, in many areas too. So as you can see, we always traditionally have our letter from the um, board president and the superintendent. You can click to read more about that. We have our demographic information from last year identified, and I'm sorry if I'm making anybody dizzy, please feel free to tell me to slow down if I am. Um, and then you start having your pop-outs. I call them pop-outs, comms calls them lightning boxes, pop-outs to me is easier to say, uh, where you can click on the learn more boxes and you can get more detailed information. This, for instance, shows you more detailed information about our workforce. So you can see under retention of teachers, workforce demographics when you click on that. Yes, Ms. Ms. Yang. Um, I'm at MCPS website, right? I love it that you're doing demonstrations so I can follow along. Sure. Okay, so is this under annual report? If I... You do a search in uh, annual, re annual report, it should pop up, but then... Pop the up 2022, not this one. I'm going to ask the comms team where that would be. Not yet put in Google. Oh, it's not yet put in Google until after the board presentation. Oh. Yes. We're <laughs> launching it to you all first. Thank you. <laughs> Is Thank that you. school at a glance also not, not yet? It's after it's the gonna be, dashboard. It's going to be, yeah. Dashboard is yeah. after the book. The, that one is live. The school profiles is live. Yes. You can get there from the school's page at the top. And I'll show you that in just a second. Yep, yep, nope. So again, we have our board education highlights. You can click to see the specific revisions of policies. We get to some recognitions, our board members. And here's some new work that we've put in our strategic plan. We felt it, our, our annual report, we felt it necessary to really share the strategic frameworks to support success for all students. Dr. McKnight launched the vision, the theory of action last year, which really has helped drive all of the work of the system. Um, additionally, we have our anti-racist system action plan and our pathway to college, career, and community readiness. And those are frameworks that are really designed to help really cr start creating that coherence as a system to address the needs of all of our students. So we found it um, important and critical for us to start educating our community through the annual report on what these are. So you can find um, links to all of those in here. Then you get to the accomplishments in the strategic plan. There is a link to the strategic plan I just showed you, um, identified right there. And then you get to some of our accomplishments. Again, as you can see, we have our view more buttons where you can click on and you can see um, more detailed information. For instance, APIB exam performance going all the way back to 2019. And you can take a look at the demographic breakdown and the progress that we have made. Want to just highlight a couple things that are really exciting. We have had our highest SAT participation rate, 80.1% since 2017, and that's largely because of the investment that the Board of Education has made around the um, making sure that the fees are waived. We anticipate um, next year when we look at AP participation, we're going to see some great gains there as well. We've also identified um, the 24-point increase in kindergarten literacy data, huge increase in structured literacy. That is all the investments that we have made. Uh, we've talked before about how we invest, we have invested almost $40 million in professional learning around this work, around literacy work, and this, this, is, the, this is what's paying off at this point. You'll also see information about um, unofficial information about our graduates, as well as some of the great things that are happening for our students, including scholarship, national merit um, finalists, um, a gr students graduating with associate's degrees. And then again, you have CTE information, immersion hubs, um, ELC curriculums, ma our math coaches, how many, how many we are hired or were allocated. This is another great thing to highlight as it has been a huge part of our pathway to college, career, community readiness, where we're talking about 
about um, getting more of our students exposed to uh, college and careers through fairs. Um, there has been a lot of work done around here. We had our largest attendance in the history of the uh, event for the 2022-2023 um, HBCU Fair, which is a huge accomplishment um, and aligns with the district priorities. We've identified here, um, excuse me, some highlights of, of some of our staff throughout the year. We have our well-being and family engagement, 90% of our schools effectively implementing restorative justice practices as a result of the data. That is a huge increase over the prior year, which I believe was around 60%. So we are seeing great gains in that area, and our suspension data is starting to trend in the correct direction as a result of some of that work that has been done. Um, you also see a lot of the incredible work that has been led by the chief medical office um, staff around the opioid awareness that they did last year um, and the impact that that has had, our extracurricular activities, again, our engagement strategies. I know we talk a lot about our Stronger Student Connections um, app, although we want to get that download higher. It is a start, and that is the, the number of downloads that we've had in the past year. And then we get to professional and operational excellence. And again, this is where we're really highlighting some of the professional learning opportunities that our staff have engaged in last year, which has been a lot. Um, you can see how many teachers were trained over the summer on core uh, practices, how we've had over 2,000 uh, staff trained on effective EML um, strategies for students. And these are all aligned with the, pro with the priorities of the district. We are leading the state in nationally board certified teachers, which is a huge accomplishment and we are continuing. We have 857 candidates in progress, um, which is aligned with our um, goal of making sure that we have a highly effective teacher in every classroom. We launched our professional learning around our anti-racist action plan. Um, and again, when we get to operational excellence, you can see the electric school buses were launched last year and the number of meals that we provided to students, as well as the number of hotspots that we're able to provide. Um, as you go down, you will also see our operating budget highlights from the 22-23 school year, as well as our capital um, budget plan, as well as some of our critical ESSER investments. So, that is our opera. This is our opportunity to really showcase the great things that are happening in the district. Um, the third and final component before I turn it over for discussion is to share with you our newly designed school profiles, which we have strategically launched today because it directly relates to how we tell the story of our district, how we tell the story of our schools, and how we're being responsive to the desire and the need for additional transparency, which I believe we heard one of even the public, one of the last public comments state around how we are sharing information with our community. So I'm gonna pull up, and this, this is live, Ms. Yang, so I will show you exactly where to go for this. Let me get to the home page. So if you're at your, our home page and you go to schools, and you click on school profiles right here. It says school profiles. First thing, you will get to a landing page, okay? And this is our reimagined school profiles. This is how we are gonna be communicating information. Many of you are probably familiar with the schools at a glance. We've been doing schools at a glance, those PDFs and binders since 2002. We have archived that information. You can find it in link here. Um, it is at the bottom of this page so that we didn't want to delete any information, but we really thought it was critical that we reimagined how we are displaying this information for our community so that it's digestible, it's easy to understand, and it allows our community to really get a snapshot of the state of our district and our schools. So there's a couple components that I want to share with you, and I won't go through elementary, middle, and high for the length of time that that will take, but I'm gonna highlight both the district level as well as the elementary and what you can see on that because they mirror each other in the other ones. First thing I'm gonna, I'm gonna note and, and applaud the team for, which I don't think they realized what they were getting into when they did this, is they committed to making sure that every one of these dashboards was translated into all of the languages, which seems like, okay, how hard can that be? Um, when they were literally having, like one dashboard in English was having to be <clears throat> translated, like one translation was 150 different pages that they were having to go through. Um, but they did it, 
and they did it well. And we have all of this information translated into all the languages so that, and we contacted community members, um, instead of just relying on translation, we contacted community members and said, could you read this? Are we using the right, are we, is this making sense to you in your native language for every single language um, to really make sure this is accessible, um, which was is critical and shows their commitment um, to the work of our district and the transparency that we're trying to create. So if I click on our district profile, just give it a second, it will, it will, will pop up. Um, this is our view as a district, right? So if we take a look, this is the enrollment page for the district. So what you can see here is you have your enrollment information, you have it disaggregated by race, you have information about special services, attendance rate for the district, farms now or ever present. Then you can click on, and this is the district level, staffing to take a look at the district level view. This is where you can see the comprehensive breakdown in our school personnel costs. What are we spending and where? Um, what are the staff positions across the entire district? Race and ethnicity of our entire staff, professional staff experience, gender, et cetera. If I click on facilities and programs for the entire district, oops, that was the wrong one, my bad. Or no, it is. Okay, I'm sorry. We have our enrollment projections for the entire district. We have some core facility teaching stations, which is basically like we're taking a look at portables. What does that look like? In the different um, categories, we have relocatable classrooms. You can go to testing and graduation. And you can look at the average SAT, again, APIB. We did a one-to-one -one match with what's on the schools at a glance, and we used the 2022-2023, and we, and we created a new visualization for it. Our vision for the future is that right now in the spring, we're gonna be working on the 23-24 information for this. It will then become interactive to compare from year to year, um, and those features will be added as the information becomes available. We're also going to continue to break down demographic data to show in a more um, transparent way as we go forward as well. And then this feature, which is not on our school, pro, our school um, at a glance, is our pathway. So if you take a look, we have a county summary of our pathway data, right, for the four pathway measures that have gone to the, gone to the Board of Education. You will see on the bottom, on the district level, we have middle school, we have elementary. You see the high school says coming soon. It says coming soon because we have not released that information to the Board of Education yet. We have not done the pathway presentation. As soon as, that, so it will be live. As soon as it goes to you, it will be uploaded here. If you go to elementary school, this is where you can drill into the individual schools, right? So I'm not going to, I'm going to use our COLA because they're up and running here, but this is where you can look and you can click on any school that you want and you can see the same information that we showed at the district, at the, the district level broken down by the specific, specific, excuse me, school that you would like to look at. So again, you could take a look at the staffing of the school individual school, you can look at their facilities and specific targeted programs that exist in those schools with a map of where you're looking at. And again, you can look at the academic pathway information for that particular school disaggregated by race. Now you will see that there's dash marks in there and that's because we did have to apply suppression rules for any groups that were under 20. We had to, we had to uh, apply su suppression rules. You'll see a dash dash if it's under 20. You will see a dash and a percentage of students who met if it's between, I'm sorry, it's a dash dash if it's under 10. It's a dash with a percentage if it's between 10 and 20. You want to jump in real quick? I do. I want a quick question. So I'm having a brain freeze. I don't know if it's the time or what. So is this automatically being populated into the system? Is there a formula that was written to pull the numbers in or somebody hand entering this? It, it's want... not by hand. So shared accountability creates the data. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I just want to. Yes. Shared accountability creates the, we call them flat files, flat data files. And then the technology team use those flat files to make sure that we're matching the official data. And then they, they do their magic, which I don't know all the technical terms for the magic um, for the dashboard. Okay. Mm -hmm. I figured it was formulas created to get everything in there. I didn't know there was some hand entering, but I just wanted 
the community to know like what goes into pulling all this information in because it's a lot. It's yeah, and they create they create what they call business rules um, that like for these suppression rules so that when it pop the information pops out it pops out accurately. Um, and the last feature, just to share, so you can go through that. You can look at some. You can look at a summary of just elementary schools in the same format. And then this is where we are starting to launch our Excel data um, downloads for the community, as we have heard that as an interest. So if you click on this, and I'm just going to save this, and it downloads right up here. And what I can do is I can download an Excel file. The first file that we've put in here is what we've heard from our community, which are the um, documents at the end of the At A Glance uh, book. That's what they, they have asked for first to, to be loaded. But we are going to be adding additional um, downloadable data sets as we move forward. So our goal here, hold on, let me. Um, our goal here, like I said, is I call this like a soft launch, right? What we're going to be doing is this is our first iteration. We are going to be adding safety and security at a glance is going to be loaded in the spring. We're also going to be adding special ed at a glance, which is also going to be loaded in the spring. We're going to be updating 23-24 data, and they're going to be added interact interactive features in alignment with what I said earlier. And we also want to make sure that we get feedback from the community. So we included this feedback survey. I wanted to make sure I highlighted it because we want to make sure that people get an opportunity to say, hey, I looked at this. This is what I thought. Um, we will also make sure that we push that out separately and we contact some of our uh, community members to make sure that what we're sharing is resonating as we think about how we're transforming, how we're communicating um, our progress as a district and creating that clarity. So on that, I will turn it back to Ms. Silvestri and the board. Mr. Saeed, questions? Um, I just real quick want to start by saying, can we give a round of applause to just this and, and the team that worked so hard? I mean, seriously, seriously. I, I had to contain myself from doing a cartwheel and, and crying onto tears. Uh, seriously, into how amazing this is. I mean, it supports transparency. Students, families, staff can find information on schools. It presents positive information on MCPS, which is not something we see all the time. It's translated into multiple languages. It's user friendly. It has a feedback survey. I mean, everything that could have possibly been done right here was done right. And the amount of information in here that before you had to sift through and search for and really, really go into depth, probably even ask administrators directly for, is now presented here. And the amount of questions I get from students about information that I can now easily pull and easily guide them towards, the amount of information in here that I think students, families, and, and, and staff want to know about their school that is now in this dashboard, I mean, this is a game changer. This is something I've never seen before. We always talk about transparency and all that, this is what we're talking about. Clear cut, very uh, user friendly, everyone can understand it. I mean, I am, I am so, seriously, so ecstatic that this exists and that this work is being done. And I want to just thank everyone who went into creating this because I think that this is one of the, the biggest steps we have ever made towards transparency and, and communicating information. And I am so proud uh, that this was done. So again, just so, so happy about this and just wanted to com commend the great work that everyone involved in this did. So just thank you for this and I'm really, really happy to see it. Ms. Yang. Yes, me too. <laughs> so I think we actually have this conversation, right? So um, it, the fact that we translated all of this information into seven languages shows the care we have taken to address and to meet the needs of the community. So hats off to you and to the whole team who put this together. The Excel school data file, I think it's going to be make a huge difference, you know, for, for, for everyone. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Ms. Sharon, uh, as you see, we were all thrilled about these, uh, this presentation and what you have outlined here. How is the world going to know that this exists? What's your communications plan? Well, that's uh, that's what the communications department is actually going to be working on, blasting out. They're going to be doing, I think, a, and I'm looking at Chris right now because I don't want to misquote, but I believe we have a press release going out about this. We're going to be blasting this out in things you need to know. I know that we are sending this out um, on, on our offices to a lot of our advocacy groups um, that have worked with us in some of this to make sure that they're sharing it with their communities um, and seeing what we can do to enhance our work. 
Excellent. Awesome. And I'll be posting it on my social media as well, just to let you know, right tomorrow, first thing. Could you give us a sneak peek on what will be included in the safety, safety? Yeah, so I don't know what, it's. if you look at what the current schools that, uh, safe, there's a safety and security at a glance document, I don't know what all of that in, is on there right now, but I do believe it has like suspension data um, by school um, and, and incidents, serious incidents. I think, I don't want to misquote. You can see, if you go on the safety and security at a glance right now, that's what we're going to be dashboarding. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, really looking forward to sharing that press release with the community so um, everybody can know about it and uh, really um, use it. You know, it's, 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 well, our, it's our information so that we can help our schools uh, become even better and to celebrate. Uh, the positive things that are happening in every corner of our district. Just a quick, can I say a quick thing for the communications? Um, so we're going to be sharing with all our partners and all the PTAs. Awesome. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. So I think we can move on to agenda item number 10, the overview of the superintendent's recommended fiscal 25 operating budget. Uh, and with that, I'll ask Mr. Hall to get us started. All right. Thank you, uh, President Silvestre. Um, good evening, board members. Um, the development of the operating budget is one of the most uh, impactful and important things that we do as a school system each year because it really provides a roadmap for um, what we're going to be focused on over the coming years. Uh, one of my favorite sayings is, uh, don't tell me your priorities show me your budget and I'll tell you your priorities. Uh, so it really is important uh, work that we do. And so we look, as we've worked over the past several months developing the superintendent's recommended budget, we look forward to engaging with the board over the coming months uh, as we uh, prepare their budget to send over to county council uh, in the spring. So there are a number of issues uh, that we're facing in developing the operating budget for fiscal year 2025. Uh, in a time of national educational challenges, our vision is to develop an operating budget that champions transparency, accountability, and supports for our school system's priorities. Um, we are also facing, one of the challenges we are facing is the end of the federal relief ESSER, uh, the federal relief money called ESSER. Uh, so it's hard to believe that it was almost four years ago now that um, COVID hit us all and took us all by surprise. And this ESSER money has really been a lifeline for MCPS and school districts across the country as we grapple with uh, and support our students and our schools through the recovery from COVID. Of course, that um, recovery is ongoing and continues, even though the uh, ESSER money will expire uh, January or September 30th of 2024. So that's one of the larger challenges that we're facing. Um, and it really is going to mean that we need to focus on what is absolutely critical that we maintain this being funded with ESSER. This year we have about $130 million of revenue, uh, this federal revenue that we will not have next year. Obviously we cannot keep, we cannot maintain all of that. And so the team has really looked at um, evaluations, uh, talked to our school leaders to figure out what is working, what needs to be prioritized. Since the completion of the FY24 operating budget process, we have uh, initiated or improved on ways that we can be more transparent to you, our board, our local government, and our community. At the same time, we are expanding on ways that we can be uh, accountable for every dollar that we spend. We are charged with the awesome responsibility of educating over 160,000 students and we do it with limited resources, both in terms of money and time. So it is absolutely critical that we get it right. If we could go to the next slide, please. So this is uh, kind of a visual of the current FY24 budget. So we saw an increase of $245 million, or 8.4%. I want to thank our board, our county council, and all of our uh, community advocates uh, that supported us through this process. Uh, we've already heard today about a number of the important initiatives that we've been able to build out through uh, this increased funding, including the supports for math, uh, increased compensation for our employees, amongst uh, many other important investments. Next slide, please. 
So this slide looks at where the revenue comes from. Again, we're looking at the FY24 budget here uh, and where the money is coming from. The largest portion, almost two thirds of the uh, money comes from our local government here in Montgomery County. Uh, this is by far the largest portion of any district in the state of Maryland, and that's due uh, to the wealth equalization factor that is built into the state funding formula, which looks at uh, each county's uh, comparative wealth. And um, because Montgomery County is one of the wealthier counties in Maryland, we actually receive a smaller percentage of our funding from the state, and hence uh, a larger portion from the local government. Our state funding, which is the next largest, accounts for almost 30% of the overall funding. Uh, the federal funding, uh, which is where we get a lot of our mandates from, actually only accounts for about 3.5% of the, the funding, and this does not include the ESSER money that I mentioned earlier. So um, I, again, we have about $130 million of the federal ESSER relief money budgeted this year that will not be there next year, and that is not included in this uh, graphic. Then we've got our enterprise funds, so these are our self-supporting funds like our food service fund. Um, and then this year, as in the past several years, the county used $25 million of our fund balance to fund uh, the current year budget. Uh, the council decided that they would not maintain that funding source going forward, and so we will not have that $25 million as we look at the FY25 budget um, to utilize. Uh, it's also important to note that the blueprint uh, for Maryland's future, which is a state law, explicitly requires local governments to spend more. So as we get these additional requirements from the blueprint, whether it's around pre-K or our nationally board certified teachers or um, paying for AP and IB exams, the state is only funding a portion of that, somewhere around 30 percent, and our local government is expected, required, uh, to pick up the remaining amounts. And so as we move through blueprint implementation, we will see a larger portion of the funding that is required to come from the local government um, as opposed to the state. If we could go to the next slide, please. So that was where the money comes from, our different revenue sources. So where does the money go? So we've got a few different um, ways of looking at uh, this. This is the first one, and it really looks at how much of it goes towards personnel. So our salary and benefits make up ni nearly 90% of the operating budget, uh, by far the largest amount. You can see the other pieces, such as uh, contractual services is only 2.5%. Uh, furniture, equipment, less than 1%. So we are a people business, um, and that is where we invest the majority of our money. That is where the majority of our FY25 ask will be focused is in compensation, both in salaries and benefits. Next slide, please. So this is another representation of how the money is spent. This one is done by state reporting category. So this is how we are required, how every district in Maryland is required to report their uh, expenditures to the state. And as you can see, between instructional salaries, special education, and benefits, that makes up uh, those three buckets alone make up about 75% of our expenditures each year. Um, other uh, notable ones would be transportation at about 5%. Um, the administration, so that would be the centralized administration, not the school administration, uh, often what people would call uh, district provided services or central office, only make up about 2% of our budget. So out of every dollar that uh, we spend, only about two cents of that uh, goes to centralized administration. And that is one of the lowest percentages of any school district in the state of Maryland. Next slide, please. So this is uh, a third uh, and yet another uh, visualization of how the money is spent. This is one that we have developed over the past uh, several months as we have heard calls for additional transparency. Of course, we uh, try to be as transparent as we can all of the time and through our website um, and our uh, standard reporting, all of the information is out there, but it's a lot of information and sometimes people have trouble understanding it and sifting through it. And so trying to make it uh, as simple as possible when we look at this, you're looking at the 80% uh, of the budget that goes directly into schools, 
And then the 20% that is for these district provided services or services like transportation that serve directly serve our students but would not be housed within the schoolhouse. So if we go to the next slide, we'll look at a breakdown of that 20%, okay? So again, this is just looking at the 20% of the budget that is not uh, directly in the school building. Makes up about $631.5 million, or about 4,000 out of the 25,000 FTEs. So again, the vast, vast majority of our resources, both in dollars and people, are where you would expect them to be in the schoolhouse. So breaking down these district provided services, uh, the largest one is transportation by far. Uh, Montgomery County has a tremendous uh, student transportation system, providing transportation to many, many of our district wide and our magnet programs, something that uh, I'm not aware of uh, really any other school districts that provide this level um, of transportation services for their students. So really uh, allowing our students to to, to pick and choose as much as possible the programs that they're interested in and that they're gonna be successful in. The next largest portion uh, is our academic and instructional supports. So again, not necessarily housed in the school, but directly supporting the school, uh, as well as maintenance, uh, same thing. Technology, again, um, not necessarily housed in the school, but supporting our schools uh, every single day. Then you've got the uh, student services, including mental health supports, that make up about $51 million. Utilities, that make up about $44 million. And then you're talking about safety and security, facilities management. And it's not till you get pretty far over to the right here. You're talking about, um, you know, human resources, finances, and district leadership, some of these uh, central uh, central office functions. So when you're really talking about strictly the central office, you're talking about a small percentage of the 20%. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And if we could advance that again, there we go. So we looked at this graphic last year, but it's really important to understand uh, how our budget has changed over time and how our um, purchasing power has changed over time. So in economics, the purchasing power is how much you can afford to buy today compared to how much you could afford to buy 10 years ago or 10 years in the future. We all know that inflation uh, is, is very real, uh, especially over the past three to four years. I think everybody's experienced that in their personal lives, and we certainly have seen that as a school district. So the top blue line there shows our uh, budget from 2001 up until this year in real dollars. And as you can see, uh, it's been a pretty steady increase. And so when we have community members and people saying, gosh, you know, we're increasing your budget every single year, where is this money going? Uh, they are. I mean, it is. Uh, the budget goes up uh, virtually every year. But when you look at it in uh, constant dollars or purchasing power as far as uh, adjusted for inflation, what we can actually buy for the dollars we have, it has been very flat since about 2009. And we actually uh, today still have not reached the per pupil spending level that we were at in 2009. And anybody who's been in Montgomery County knows how uh, our student population has changed, what the needs have, uh, how the needs have changed, and the services that we're providing, especially after COVID. Uh, you know, the social emotional needs, the idea of a school system hiring psychologists and social workers um, just wasn't a big topic of conversation 15 years ago, and it certainly is today. So um, we really are providing more services than we've ever provided before and doing it either on a flat or reduced budget over the past um, decade and a half. So I just wanted to highlight that um, to make sure that people understand that even though the overall budget is growing, that doesn't mean that our capacity to provide services to our students grows along with it. Mr. Hall, are ESSER dollars included in there? Uh, ESSER dollars are not included in here. Thank you. Good question. So I will stop there and I will turn it over to our Associate Superintendent of Finance, Mr. Rob Riley. Thanks, Mr. Hull. I'm just gonna, so that was FY24. I'm just gonna briefly go over how we developed the superintendent's FY25 budget. So next slide, please. Uh, so one thing we like to say is that it's uh, built upon the board strategic uh, plan and priorities. So what does that mean? So 
uh, each year, um, this year on July 25th, we, we sent this budget guide to all of our chapters. And when I say chapters, it's the, the associates and the chiefs. It's actually 85 separate subunits within those chapters. And they are tasked with, and, and I'm glad we went over the uh, the strategic plan, because they're tasked with what can we do when looking at their metrics of success to move those metrics forward by realigning, by adding accelerators, uh, how can they adjust their budget in order to meet that strategic plan? Uh, so, so it's uh, part on our uh, division and department directors. The other way we, we match to the uh, board strategic plan is we did uh, with our budget advisory, superintendent's budget advisory committee this year, uh, we intentionally, we had more meetings, first of all. We had uh, six meetings so far, and we're going to have uh, more as we go along. But one of the things that we did was we looked at each of these strategic plan items uh, in a separate meeting. And then we kind of uh, gathered and, and uh, collaborated to determine what were the most important things within these strategic plan items uh, for, for our community. So uh, that's, another, that's another way that we match our budget to the strategic plan. Uh, next slide. Uh, so as Mr. Hall had mentioned, we do have a, a few factors here that not only impacted our FY24 budget development, uh, as well as our FY25. Uh, so the first item there, the expiration of our federal COVID uh, runs out September 2024. Um, so we, we had shown there 3% of our budget normally is uh, federally funded. When we were at the height of our SR relief funds, that represented 14% of our budget. So in essence, we're going back from four, we're moving from 14 back to 3%. Uh, so the so-called uh, Esser cliff. Next item there is the continued inflation that's impacting the cost of learning, operations, and teaching. So this is going to include things such as increases in our technology licenses that we're seeing, uh, increases in non-public tuition, uh, and increases in our maintenance contracts. These are some examples there. Uh, we're also continuing to implement uh, the blueprint for Maryland's uh, future. Um, and as it was noted, uh, Blueprint actually extends, it's a plan through 2030. Uh, but part of the issue is that the, with the money that we get from the state averages around 30%. So the, the bulk of that is, is what we're asking for our local funding. So um, as we go through that, that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, the next item there is uh, additional academic and social and emotional supports. Uh, Mr. Hull alluded to this too. Although our COVID funding is going away, the reason that we that COVID funding came about was the needs of our students, and these needs are not going away. So that's another impact that's going to affect our FY25 budget. Uh, next item there, second year of our agreements reached with the employee associations. Uh, so that's actually uh, makes it a little easier during the development because this was actually negotiated last year. The only thing is it's still the, the biggest factor in our budget. So uh, the rising number and cost of health care claims and impact on the financial bottom line of the employee benefits program. So I've, I've spoken about this before. Uh, the employee benefits program uh, has been decreasing in fund balance over the last uh, five or six years, uh, largely the result of this increase in cost and health care claims. We do, every year, we do uh, make an effort to put in the budget um, an amount that uh, looks at that increase in the rates, uh, but it's not only a function of rates, it's a, fact, it's a function of the number of claims too, and we're seeing these go up as well too. So if we don't have enough in the budget, uh, what we've done in the past years is try to have some year-end savings to, to put into the, the fund, but that is uh, a one-time thing. You know, it's really, it's, it's important to get it into the operating budget so that fund itself is sustainable because uh, we do a, a large portion of our operating budget is a contribution to uh, the employee benefit fund. Uh, and the last item there is uh, no fund balance from FY24 to be budgeted for FY25. Uh, you had seen in, the pr in one of the previous slides that $25 million, so that goes away. Uh, so one, one of the effects that you'll see um, in today's, uh, you have our monthly financial report. On attachment four, you'll see the normal amount of uh, expenditure budget to actual balance at this point. Normally, it's somewhere between uh, 15 and $30 million. The reason for that is because that, that $25 million fund balance has is incorporated within that. 
you, if you look today, you'll see it's down to $1.9 million, uh, a, little, a little tight there. Uh, and I've, I've, I've often said that our staff, we're good at managing that budget, um, but there's some things that aren't totally in our control. For instance, inflation. Uh, that, if it goes higher than what we projected or expected, somehow we got to make up that, uh, that difference. So it's, it's just, I guess what I'm saying is it's a smaller, uh, uh, you know, amount of variance that we have to live with. So um, I'll, I'll keep you posted on that throughout the year, but that, that is something that's going to impact our FY25 budget as well. Next slide. So another major impact for 25 is enrollment. Uh, so what you're looking at here is our uh, K-12 enrollment uh, from uh, 9-30-2017 to current, 9-30-2023, uh, which is what our, uh, uh, what our uh, FY25 is going to be based on. And you can see, you know, we had increases uh, through FY2019 and then COVID hit. So we had two years of decreases there. Uh, we did have an increase last year, but now we've had a slight, I think it's about 450 uh, students uh, drop in general ed enrollment um, and this, or overall enrollment. And this is what our funding is based on. Uh, so uh, I think Mr. Hull said as well too, it's, it's our, for our state funding, it's a function of our enrollment and our relative enrollment and our relative wealth. So at this point, we really still don't know what our state funding is. I, we never know at this. It's always kind of a, uh, an estimate at this point. We will know on January 15th, at which time we'll know our blueprint funding as well as our state uh, general funding. So I just wanted to give you an idea of where we stood with enrollment. Um, so that's our uh, overall enrollment. The next slide is going to show our uh, enrollment based on uh, different populations. So as you can see, our free and reduced price meals um, has increased. And in fact, that did increase throughout COVID. Uh, so unlike the general ed that we saw before, this has increased as well as our emergent multiling multilingual learners. That's been a steady increase throughout that whole time period, um, as well as uh, students with disabilities. Uh, so, uh, so the thing here is that we do get a, a pot of money from the state related to these populations, uh, but it's not necessarily built into the formula funding. So uh, as the general ed population is. So that, that's something that we just have to be cognizant of as we're building the FY25 budget. Next slide. Um, I think this one's a little bit redundant uh, for the previous one. So uh, it, as, as mentioned, uh, the compensation funding uh, we do have negotiated. Uh, the ESSER the fund uh, that was alluded to before. So we do have funds, and if you recall, we moved funds at the end of last year to balance our budget to ESSER. Uh, we're now determining which of those funds are going to come back into our operating budget based on the amount of available revenue. Uh, other things, as mentioned before, was the blueprint mandates, such as pre-K expansion, um, and then I mentioned the employee benefit fund and the academic and social emotional supports that are still needed for our students. Next slide. So uh, we were talking about our budget development. So this, this gives you an idea of the extent of the, uh, the folks that are in our superintendent's budget advisory committee. Um, we will be meeting two more times this year. What we found was uh, the committee does a great job of expressing their interest and their, uh, you know, before the superintendent's budget, but I think it's important and they agreed that, that we want to kind of close that loop, show what actually got into the uh, uh, the board's budget and what actually was approved in our final budget. So we're going to meet a few more times uh, between now and the end of the fiscal year. Uh, we also had, we had three of community forums last year. This year we had six and I thought they were all successful. Some were more, um, uh, we had more uh, attendance. attendance. <laughs> Uh, than others, but but I, I felt, in my opinion, even the ones that weren't attended as much, uh, the the, the input, the people that were there had great input, and then they had 100% attention from us. So, uh, and and I just want to give uh, kudos to uh, Mr. Sneed, uh, Mr. Saeed because the student one was very well attended and very well, um, uh, a lot of great input there too. So. <laughs> I, I think we had the record for the highest attendance in person. Yes. I right, yeah. the budget form. So, cha -ching, kudos to the students. We did it. Uh, so, the, 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 I know, right? Thanks for, the, thanks for the shout out. I appreciate it. And they were all great, by the way. I, I appreciated the virtual ones as well, too. But, yeah. um, so, last slide, I just want to give you an update on the milestones and where we're at. So, 
Uh, Thursday of next week, uh, the superintendent's going to present her budget at uh, Address to Shannon Middle School. That's the 14th there. Then there'll be a little bit of lull, like uh, about a month, uh, because the, the board is going to have their first uh, work session on January 16th. On January 17th, that's when we'll actually find out our, our state funding. And then on the 18th will be the first of two board public hearings, uh, which we've been uh, promoting at, at the different community forums as well, too, to make sure we get as much input from the community as we can. Uh, on February 6th, uh, you guys are going to tentatively adopt the FY25 operating budget, um, and then it moves over to the county. So in March, the county executive is going to propose his budget, um, and then in April and May, we don't have the dates yet, but that's where the county council is going to have their hearings as well as their work sessions, um, and they'll pass their vote, uh, pass, pass the budget on May 23rd, um, at which time it'll come back to us, and then we'll adopt on June 11th. So. So I'll open up for discussion, but that's just a brief overview of uh, the FY25 budget process so far. Question about the budget presentation on Thursday. Is that a hybrid event or just in person? Um, uh, live online and invitation at the school. Live online and by invitation at the school. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and um, you were saying that with the budget advisory group, you're going spending some time with them to help them understand what actually was adopted in this school year's budget because it is such a... We, we, learned, we did that in the first session before we started moving into the uh, strategic uh, pillars okay. with them in depth, but uh, then we'll continue that too because it's, it's a lot. So yeah, I think we, we can't just assume that everybody kind of knows as much or is involved as much as we are on a daily basis. Right, right, right. Just uh, for folks that don't know, you know, we... The superintendent recommends her budget, and then once we get the final amount, then she also has to say, okay, we asked for 100 we got $80, what can we afford with $80? So right. what we actually ask and what we actually end up with mm -hmm. can be very different. And so it's important that our budget right. advisory, who are our advocates uh, in the community, also understand what we ended up with. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Mrs. Harris. Yes, um, actually no questions, because I think this just perfectly laid the foundation for the work that will start on the 14th, when we get the first, the, the superintendent's recommended budget, and then our work and our questions really start when we dig, dig down in our work sessions. But I did just want to comment, um, first of all, I think that, um, you know, one of the things you mentioned, because of um, the relative wealth of Montgomery County, and the way the blueprint formulas are working, um, locals are now expected to pay more um, to educate the the future of their of their counties. And um, I just want to say, first of all, I'm really grateful for the county we live in and our county council partners because um, this county values education, and we aren't afraid to do what we need to do to pay for it. And that is not universally true. I, you know, I was at the MABE conference talking to board members from other LAAs who begrudge every dime they spend on their students. And I'm like, why are you on your board of education? <laughs> um, but so I'm very grateful for that. And I do think, um, and I do think this is a great foundation. And I appreciate the mention for, you know, the monthly financial report is on the agenda for today's board meeting. I love that thing. I read it with fine tooth comb every month. And um, this and that together, I just, for all of those who say we don't share transparently the information about our budget, mm -hmm. maybe it's complex because it is, but it's there. And I do appreciate too your candor about, I think um, I really appreciate the work that we do together. And I, I will say it again, I think we have the most talented and competent budget and finance staff anywhere. Um, when you say you are good at managing the budget, that is the understatement of the century, um, honestly. And um, can I can I thank Mr. Yes. and Ms. Alfonso Windsor for this as well. And I do think that um, I kind of look at Mr. Riley sometimes as my spirit guide as I go through <laughs> some of this stuff. But I share with you the concern, as you said it, in you know, in right there in black and white in the monthly financial report. Um, this year, um, our end of year balance is going to be much closer to break even than we have ever experienced, and that's because of the that that fund balance is gone. Um, 
so we're going to be watching very, very closely going forward. But again, we have such great staff that it really does give me confidence, even knowing all I know about how tricky this budget year is going to be, that it's going to be okay. So. In the spirit of transparency, could I'll also bring up uh, next Thursday, the morning of the superintendent's budget, we have, we're meeting with uh, county council, and the topic is going to be the monthly financial report. So they actually see value in that as well, too. As they should. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah, thank you. I also wanted to say I appreciate um, slide seven, where you're providing the <coughs> district provided services breakdown. Again, you know, just putting it in multicolors with dollar amounts, just helping people unpack what that big bundle of money is. The more we can help people understand the buckets, mm -hmm. um, I think the better off we'll be. Thank you. Anything further on the budget? Okay. If not, we thank you for the presentation and look forward to the Dr. McKnight's uh, release of the budget on Thursday. And encourage all your friends and neighbors to watch. Thank you, Mr. Riley and budget team. Okay, so now we can uh, move on to our next agenda item, number 12. Preliminary plans presentation um, on the Burtonsville Elementary School replacement. Dr. McKnight. Yes. All right. Thank you so much. Um, as our facilities team come down, uh, this is we're going to talk tonight about the Burtonsville Elementary School replacement project. Um, we are so excited. This has been a long time coming um, to actually get where we are with Burtonsville Elementary. C kudos to that community. I mean, their consistent advocacy. Good to see you. Um, you know, just it, it, it's it's been a journey. I think if nothing else, we've been able to reestablish trust um, within that community by going out and really talking about, you know, what the interest was and what we needed to do. So I am thrilled, just simply thrilled that we are here today um, with Principal Lloyd and, and the team to really talk about what this project is going to be. And then most importantly, you know, we're very excited. We talked so much today about pre-K, right? Mm -hmm. So then we already know, you know, what, what our plan is going to be for the, for the, for the, old facility when we build a new facility. So it's just really exciting to think about the evolution of this project. So thank you so much for being here this evening. I'll turn it over to you to begin the presentation. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, so good, ev good evening for President Sylvester and the members of the board and uh, Dr. McKnight. So thank you for the opportunity to uh, have a presentation for the preliminary plans uh, for the Burtonsville Elementary School project. And today, uh, you know, uh, we have a principal, Lloyd, and then uh, Miss Jancy from the MTFA Architecture uh, to present the, uh, the plans. And then I just want to give some background of this project because this project is uh, part of the CIP for many years. And uh, because uh, the originally this project was addition project to the existing building, and, but the enrollment went up and down for years, and uh, this project was pulled out from the CIP for many times. And then currently, the uh, the, the school has uh, ten. Uh, I'm sorry, like hundred students over capacity right now. And then uh, we actually looked at the current uh, site, and. Uh, it's because uh, this school is actually tucked behind the stores and in the commercial areas, so actually none of the students can walk to the school right now. You're stealing my thunder. <laughs> <laughs> and then so, and we actually looked at the bus loop and the safe access and the bicycle pass, so it was decided to build the new building at the new site. And uh, this new site is within the current uh, school service areas, so there is no need for like boundary studies or um, like reboundary. And then also this new site is within the residential area, so it's more like friendly for like walk, uh, walking students, popul populations. And then one of the great benefit of having this new site is uh, during the construction, there is no disruption for the students or staff. So when this building is completed, the school can just move from existing building to new facility, which is great benefit for the school community. 
And then, so this new building is going from like uh, 71,000 square feet to about 95,000 square feet. And with the feature of like 21st century uh, sustainable learning spaces. And the construction is anticipated to start uh, late uh, next year, 2024, and the completion date is summer of 2026. So now I'm turning over to the principal, Lloyd. Good evening. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not used to being in the seat. <laughs> um, to our board president, Ms. Silvestri, board members, Dr. McKnight, to executive staff members that are here at the table and beyond the table, and I have to say hello to Dr. Kimball. We have history, so ah, good you. evening to Dr. Kimball. Um, I just want to say that I am super excited to be in this seat. I had said several times I would not believe that this is happening until I see bricks actually being laid, and so this um, makes me feel like we are definitely headed in the right direction and a step closer to actually having a new Burtonsville element. Well, I don't know if that will be the name, but um, to having a new building. So I do want to say that we are about 120 students over the capacity. Um, I'm not counting, but I just want to let you know. <laughs> I just want to let you know that. And we are also super excited that we will get to stay at our beloved Burtonsville while the new school is um, being built. So that is um, definitely a great thing that we don't have to go to a holding school and we don't have to pack up and unpack. Um, I also want to say that we are so looking forward to a new parent lane. Um, if any board members here have received complaints, I do apologize, but it is not my fault. It is the fault of the parent pickup lane that we have right now. And we are a school that is full of community engagement. Every event that we house at Burtonsville is standing room only. It's unbelievable. And so I can only anticipate that we would have that much more parent involvement with actually being nestled in a neighborhood and not in the industrial area where people do have to drive to get to our school. So there is some excitement around going from zero walkers, zero, to having 85% of our school be able to walk to school. Um, we don't, we're not even sure what that will look like, but like everything else, we will figure it out. Um, so I'm super excited about what, uh, what this has to offer for us with having a school in the neighborhood, I know that this will bring even more parents into our school building, um, and um, we're looking forward to it. So it, I don't know if there are any questions for me about this process or if I'm turning it over to Megan Jancy. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Wait, I have to say this. I want to say thank you on behalf of my students, the Burtonsville Stars, um, obviously my staff, um, my parent community, the Burtonsville community at large, and um, also to my fabulous PTA. Um, they are small, but they are mighty. And um, they really fight for our students, um, for our school, for our community, and um, I probably would not be sitting here without them. But I also need to thank my team. I need to thank Alicia and DJ and um, Shiho and uh, Megan and Seth because um, I'm also not quiet. Um, I do push back. I am vocal. Um, I've been at Burtonsville for 14 years, so Burtonsville is um, my life, you know, a huge part of my life. And I want to make sure that I'm leaving a legacy for my students and my staff to be proud of. So I know that I'm not always easy. I know that I am outspoken. I know that I push back. But it is, um, I appreciate all of you, and it is all done for the love of my school and my school community. Thank you. Can I just say real quick, I want to say thank you for your leadership because I don't know what you're doing over there, but you have a lot of male um, leadership in your PTA. They are fabulous. I love when they come to our hearings and just talk and share. So I just say kudos to you and um, continue to push. That's what you're supposed to do. And that's why I think you have the engagement that you have because the parents know that you stand behind them and that you're trying to make sure that you have the best for the students over there. Thank you. I just wanted to say that. Thank, thank you. you. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. I'm Megan Jancy with um, MTFA Architecture. 
Um, I've been working on this project for, I don't know, a few months now. Um, and we're really excited to present our preliminary plans to you tonight uh, to share the amazing journey we've been on um, and hopefully uh, share a little bit about what this building looks like and the plans for the new school location. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, the new site, as was mentioned, is this is a full replacement project. So the new site is located um, on a fairly flat, almost 11-acre site, um, bounded on the north and west sides by Saddle Creek Drive. Um, and then the other two sides are really surrounded by some hilly terrain and wooded landscape area. The new site will have approximately 113 parking spaces. The building will accommodate 796 students. Um, with a separated bus loop and student drop-off area. As noted, that is one of the major pain points of the existing site, um, and really to allow for student safety. Um, the school is also bringing in a new uh, LFI as well as a autism program, so there is also an allowance for special ed buses to drop off as well. There will be lighting throughout the parking areas and around the building and walkways. Um, the service is screened on the south side from the neighborhood. Uh, the single family homes surround it on the north and west sides of the building. Um, and so it was important that that service was not at the front door as it is currently today. So it's not what you see when you first drive up um, and isn't really a nuisance for the neighborhood either. Uh, the, the school bus entrance um, is shown in yellow coming off of a roundabout um, and really creating a separate single drive through aisle for all the school buses to arrive. While from the north site is the green for this, the car drop off and dedicated parent drop off lane, uh, which allows for a significant amount of queuing to occur on site. Um, and then in the center of Saddle Creek Drive along the west side is the primary uh, crosswalk for all the student walkers. All three of these uh, modes of transportation arrive at a central plaza at the main entrance, really creating an equity of arrival for all of the students, whether they've come by car, bus, or walk. Um, there are several play fields all co-located on the east side of the building, uh, soft and hard playscape areas, as well as some additional parking for after hours and community access, um, and a large field along that barrier. The next slide, please. So the floor plan is a very efficient, compact footprint that's surrounding a central courtyard scheme. Uh, from along the west and south sides, it's a two-story academic wing uh, that really frames and creates the, the um, major entry and elements along the street. And then the other two sides are surrounded by the connected civic spaces to create that central courtyard area. So the purple area shown in the upper on your screen in the upper left corner is the admin suite. This has the greatest visibility on the site with access to both the bus loop, the central plaza, and the parent drop-off loop, really creating a sense of security from the first point of arrival. There's also several civic spaces located along the main entry corridor from the gymnasium and the multi-purpose room. These are shown in yellow and orange respectively, as well as the media center, which is then also um, accessible to the courtyard, allowing for outdoor use um, and some outdoor classroom space. Uh, the music spaces are also located in this area with access to the multi-purpose room, which has a stage and is connected uh, through a, a a rear entry as well. Um, the art classrooms are also located along this court, courtyard to allow for a greater access and possible display of art um, to really connect with the students. And then the, real, the, the significant portion of the building remaining is dedicated to the learning spaces and the educational classrooms. So the spaces shown in the blue along the bottom are your single pre-K class and K classrooms. Um, and then there are uh, six additional classrooms on this floor uh, for first grade, as well as um, half of the LFI and autism classrooms are also on this floor. So the uh, special ed classrooms have been divided to be co-located amongst all of the educational spaces. Next slide, please. 
The second floor is dedicated to classrooms um, and support spaces, so uh, large and small instructional spaces uh, to autism and a single LFI classroom, as well as the remaining upper grade level classroom spaces. And these are simply located in an L-shaped corridor with access from all points up and down with stairs to conveniently allow students to move up and down through the building to be able to reach all of the other co-curricular spaces. Next slide, please. So here, the aesthetics of creating a warm and welcoming a playful expression that's compatible with the surrounding neighborhood. It is a new residential neighborhood for the school, so not being in a commercial district, to really find a way to uh, celebrate who Burtonsville is. As we continue to study the elements of this building, you can see the two-story portion of this building faces that main street and really creates the strong civic presence needed to establish the school and the community. Um, it's broken down into some simple volumes around the central courtyard using some folded planes and, um, to create canopies and to mark our entrances. Next slide, please. So creating a welcoming entry plaza that is centrally located, as I mentioned, this can be accessed by walkers, cars being dropped off, as well as buses. It has the central flagpole with benches, um, some landscape panels and trees to really create a park-like setting to allow for a place for the school to gather before and after school events at the main entry, and really has a really great visibility from the admin offices. This really draws the inspiration from the, the community input and involvement that we've gone through um, over the past several months, uh, really talking about how important uh, this uh, experience is for the community and really being able to uh, approach the school and have the sense of excitement when arriving on campus. The next slide, please. So as you can see, as you arrive at the building, um, whether in this case this is as you would arrive by car, there's always a, a point where you get to see that front entry area and signified by that canopy and really draws you in. So as the car drives around, you end up at that central plaza. Um, there are exterior materials. It's primarily a brick building using accent brick to create other um, expressions and elements on the facade, um, using fiber cement board siding as well as some accent phenolic panels for wood and warmth. And we're continuing to study the colors to really appreciate and express who Burtonsville is. Next slide, please. So these materials are really carried around the building in a way that's playful, that creates a sense of expression. Um, but this school also has many sustainable features in order to meet the energy requirements as well as the, the sustainability goals for the county. Um, so as I mentioned, the parking is actually going to, is uh, designed to uh, hold the size of the new electric buses, um, so allowing for the fleet to expand. Those buses are bigger than they are today. Canopies to provide shade. Um, we're using uh, low E glazing as is expected. Um, overall building um, features from bicycle racks located around the building to allow bicycles to arrive on campus. Um, several light shades along the south facing windows to prevent overheating and solar gain. Um, and we're also doing a, a huge coordination effort to allow for solar panels to be installed upon the roof, which you'll see in our 3D fly through. Um, and that is, I believe on the next slide, um, is our 3D flyover. So this is really, as you're coming in, um, coming down towards the entry plaza, you can see the scale of the neighborhood across the street, the two-story homes, really drawing on um, the, the scale and making sure that this building is compatible with the neighborhood, um, arriving at the site, being able to experience an entry plaza that has a secure main, main entry area with overlooking uh, spaces from the admin office. The gym is easily located off of the parking for after hours access and community use. The play fields are easily recognizable also when you arrive by car, so it's easy to know which way to go. Um, the classroom spaces, the multi-purpose room, these are all directly accessible to these outdoor play spaces to allow for the school to use them more readily throughout the day. Uh, the pre-K and K classrooms are located together on this side of the building with a dedicated pre-K play area specifically for their age groups. 
Um, and then as you come through the bus loop, you can see we have secondary entrances and canopies here as well for bad weather and inclement days. There is an opportunity to use alternate entrances um, to really create a building that sits well on this campus um, to create a new image for Burtonsville. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Okay, um, questions, Ms. Harris, and then Ms. Yang. Yeah, just um, first of all, thank you very much. This is, these are my favorite presentations. I love to see these, these concepts. Um, and just coincidentally, somebody um, sent me something today. Um, again, the critics who say we're not doing enough on sustainability in MCPS, and I, that's because we don't talk about it as much as we should. Um, and they, they sent me an article talking about Baltimore County breaking ground on the state's first net zero elementary school. And I'm like, um, <coughs> <laughs> this will be designed yeah. to um, the, meet the net zero standards yes. um, and is also to achieve two green globes. Yes. And the, just the one thing I wanted to mention was in, in the text on page 12, it mentions a vegetative green roof, but you clearly mentioned solar, which is... Mm. Correct. We are um, we are looking for solar panels in order to do net zero, not vegetated roofs. I underlined that today as well. <laughs> yeah. um, and I just the one thing I mean, and I really do appreciate you mentioning all of you the walkability features here because no school is going to be net zero if people drive to it because our greenhouse gas emissions are the biggest black mark on the county when it comes to trying to achieve our climate action plan goals. And so the more that we do create these spaces that people can walk or bike or scoot or whatever to and they're not getting in a car that's burning fossil fuels, that's what's going to bring it down. And so I really do appreciate you mentioning that. And it just goes to the comprehensive way that we look at these projects as it's not... It, it's, it's a school, it's a community place, but it's more than that too, because it really is creating the kind of space we need to create to create a real future for the, the kids that are gonna go there and are gonna inherit sort of the climate that we have created. So I do thank you and I do appreciate the attention to those kinds of details. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much. This is exciting and uh, color and everything is very pleasing. Um, I have a question. Am I understanding correctly? This is back into Woods area. Only two, only two directions is uh, for people to come over in the neighborhood. That is correct. Okay. I saw a one side uh, 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 pedestrian, pedestrian crosswalk. Um, what about the other side? How do people come from the other side? I'm looking at uh, pedestrian safety. Sure, and thank you. We have done, um, we've actually engaged with Montgomery County um, beyond our site as well to look at other possible ways that students will be crossing to really understand how students will be arriving at the site. There are very limited crosswalks in the neighborhood currently, so we are working with them to discuss possible um, locations for sidewalks beyond our school site that they would be able to install to make sure that there is an opportunity to safely cross. Um, in looking at Vision Zero, making sure that there is this opportunity for a safe location. Um, so working with the civil engineer to identify places you can see in this image here, narrowing the street, removing the street parking directly in front of this portion of the school to allow for um, some uh, cough uh, traffic calming measures to be installed. Um, we're considering even a raised crosswalk to make sure that there is a slowdown uh, measure prior to getting to this point, but really creating a primary crossing area um, is envisioned here at this entry plaza to make sure that that is really the safest location for students to cross. Right. And uh, another part of it is I'm happy to hear about crosswalk, clear marking, you know, even raised crosswalk. It's the the width of the sidewalk, because elementary school families typically adult child working, walking together, strollers involved, all that stuff. So really looking at the width of the sidewalk is... Uh, yes, the sidewalk width on our school side um, is already eight feet, um, and so it is actually wider than some of the standard yeah, sidewalks. The, yeah, if you're working with uh, Vision Zero, you know, when they look at... Uh, neighborhood sidewalk that might yes. be a good input now from the cars parking lot is there a safe walkway uh, from the cars going into the school building because if you look at some of our schools parking lot a vast big 
but what is a reasonable walkway, not just all the way, just around it? Is there a walkway in between? Uh, yes, there are. So there are islands. You can see we're creating some islands. Those will be used to also cross. Um, there's sidewalks along the um, closest island by the um, by the school itself. We actually have a low fence there to prevent crossing not at a crosswalk. Okay. Um, and there is a raised crosswalk section uh, right at the admin office corner to allow for that safe pedestrian access from that parking lot as well to make sure that people aren't just crossing where they would like to. Thank you for that. Now, my last question, my second question will be about the um, construction time frame. Um, we have heard about a lot of su supply chain issues, and I heard that the construction is 24 to 26, so it's a two-year turnaround time. Yes, so we are actually looking at uh, either 18 months to 24 months, but the good thing is we don't have to do demolition of the existing okay. building for this new site, so hopefully we can build within 18 to 24 months. Okay, thank you. Thank and you. It, and I just wanted to add, too, um, we do coordinate and meet regularly with Montgomery County DOT around um, any new expansions we're doing, new buildings, even existing buildings, to make sure that all of the pedestrian safety, and, and same with our uh, partners at Vision Zero, mm. to make sure that uh, their needs are being met and our needs are being met and we're creating a safe uh, space for our students. Especially 85% of the students will be walkers, so this is paramount. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question was about the walkers, but um, also I'm confused about the two-year building time frame when we just talked in previous meetings about how we're going to have to push that to three years. Well, for the elementary school and then this project, we, since we don't have to do the demolition and associated abatement, okay, so, so that's why it, I think we can build within 24 months. Okay. Yes, so we're going to be starting, yeah, sometime next uh, next year. And remind me, what, what was this property before? Uh, this is just an open site, but it is owned by MCPS already, but it's green space. It, it, when the development was built, it was created as a flat level pad for a future school site. Okay. What's the one that is in a alleyway and we had... We're going to swap properties with. This is this one? Is oh. this one? There was, I don't think this. It's is an one. access road. Yeah. Access road. Yes. Access road, Currently. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and we're okay. Yeah. But this is this was this, this is, is, is it. this is so a new site. The current. Is Hills and oh, I'm sorry. I'm looking at her, so I'm right here. <laughs> okay. um, the neighborhood is Bentley Hills, and. Um, it's kind of unfortunate just in some of the community meetings. I know that years ago when the development was um, built, there was signage there that said future elementary school. But um, some of the families that have moved in over maybe the last three or four years say that that signage was not there. Um, but obviously when it was built, it was built with that huge open space um, that the architects love because it's flat, or maybe construction <laughs> will love because it's flat, but it was always for a future school. Okay. So, yes, it, it's Burtonsville, though, that you're thinking of. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we want to thank you for the uh, presentation. We're very excited about seeing this project come to fruition, and uh, thank you uh, for coming and talking with us tonight. Thank That's you. Right. Um, thank you for having me. Thank, thank you. you all. All right. Well, we are now going to move uh, to agenda number item number fourteen, consent items. I'll ask board members if we, they we have. We need to approve. We need to approve the plans. Is there something to read? You just a, a motion to approve the yeah. plan. M move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands, and that's unanimous with those present. I'm good. All right. Agenda item 14, four members, anything that you want to pull? Uh, actually, yes. Uh, so sorry. I, I don't want to, I know everyone wants to go to sleep right now, and so do I. Uh, but um, I wanted to pull item 14.2, mobile panic alert system. I just wanted to get more information on what this was. As you all know, I'm very interested in safety and security, and this seems to align with that. So I just had a couple questions about what this is, basically. 
Okay, what else, Ms. Harris? Uh, yep, um, items uh, 14.6, 14.7, and 14.15, and I believe staff is prepared to address those all briefly together, um, just getting to more of our sustainability work. Okay, can I get a motion to move the rest in block? Motion. Second. All in favor, raise your hands, and that's unanimous with those present. Okay, let's start with item 14.2. So I'll ask uh, Mr. Adams to come down, but um, I I'll get us started. So the mobile panic alert system uh, is with a company called Centegix, and it basically is a device that would be worn by the school staff that has uh, a button that they can uh, press if there's an emergency of any kind to trigger a response. Um, f it would you know, communicate directly with the central office in the school, and then uh, an appropriate response would be sent. So it uh, lessens the time and the need for fumbling around for a cell phone. Some of our bu uh, buildings don't have uh, hard uh, hard lines, and so this is just uh, an additional safety piece to make sure that if there, you know, God forbid, ever is an incident, that there is uh, an immediate response. So you said school staff. So at, at like which schools will every school administrator have this? So we're working through um, kind of the final details of how big of a pilot program we're going to do. It's not going to be rolled out immediately at every school, but if it is successful um, with the schools we do roll it out in this spring, then we can look at expanding it um, for next school year. And I'll just also add that they use this in Clark County, which is where our, our uh, chief of human resources um, just uh, migrated from. And so she has uh, endorsed it and said that it was a, a very positive thing for them and their um, staff. Okay, so you said this spring they're going to start rolling out a pilot program. Yep. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. And, uh, is it intended for all staff in a school during a pilot? Correct. Oh. Yeah, I'll just add that these are very common in healthcare. I mean, I know years ago I wore one when I was in a hospital, and it's just, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Okay, we'll move on to uh, 14 6. Oh, I guess you're doing them together. Yes. 14, 6, 7, and 15? Yes. Yes. And just uh, 14, 6, and 7 just get to our energy savings uh, performance plan work. And 14, 15 is really amazing. Sure. So just uh, a little bit of background. We, you know, for the first two, um, we, we've had multiple presentations at fiscal management about the um, energy savings performance work. Um, this, is, this is work where we're going to start to replace infrastructure and use the energy savings associated with it to, to basically pay for it. So it's, it's basically um, doing work without competing against our, our operating or capital budget. So this is work that's been in the works for several years. It's something that obviously um, even we're very closely with the county on, but uh, dovetails very well within our sustainability work um, and, and some of the things that we've been talking about for years that's going to start to move the needle on our aggressive plan that we've adopted as a, as a board and as a district. So we're very excited about this. This is the first 50, and as I mentioned at the CIP, second 50 is right on the heels. So um, we're excited to keep the momentum going on these. And then the um, third item, the Educational Urban Farm um, and Sustainability Demonstration Hub. This is, this is really neat. Um, this is one uh, where we're, we're going to take advantage of our school property, think very differently about our out outdoor space. Um, we're going to par obviously partner with other agencies to, to, to grow food, learn about sustainable features. Um, you know, there, there's been work that's been going on in downtown Silver Spring around um, urban gardens and, you know, providing produce and, and vegetables and other, other means to families. And this is going to happen on our school site. So uh, we're hopeful that um, this is a great success. Uh, we have great partners, and this is hopefully just one of many where we're thinking very differently about what we do, how we do it, and how we educate our students and families around sustainability and, and sustainable practices. So kudos to the team. Um, this is probably one of the first in the nation in terms of, of school sites. So, um, you know, obviously the support Dr. McKnight through this has been incredible and we're so excited um, for this to, to be happening in Montgomery County, Maryland. Well, and just kudos to Mr. Trobman in your office, who is just like the, uh, the architect of so many of these really amazing and creative things. And I really do think we are poised to be, and we don't talk about it enough, just such on the cutting edge of sustainability of school systems all across the country. 
um, because of this kind of visionary, innovative work. And talk about getting our students ready for 21st century green jobs, right there. And some of our student climate action councils were here, council members were here earlier, but I told them this is the work you need to be partnering on with the school system right here, talking about this, being part of this work. So this, I think, this is just so exciting. Yay. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, can I get a motion to move 14-2, 14-6, 14-7, and 14-15 and block? Motion. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. That's unanimous with those. Okay, item number 15 is for informational purposes only. Item 16, uh, we have um, a motion, we need a motion to approve our committee appointments, which are posted on board docs in block. Motion. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous with those present. Item number 17, can I get a motion to move 17-1 and 17-2 in block? Motion. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. That's unanimous with those present. Item 17.3, uh, Mr. Saeed, do you have any comments on the calendar of major events for the election of the student member of the board? Just want to say I'm really excited for this year's election. Looking at these dates gave me flashbacks to when I was staring at them every single night in anticipation. And I just want to say I've gotten um, so much outreach from students who are interested this year in running. Um, and you know I'm, I'm really happy. Uh, some say that you know um, student leaders helped inspire them. And I think the increase in social media activity that you know a number of student leadership organizations have displayed have helped support this. And so I'm really really excited. Excited. I'm really looking forward to the nominating convention and not being the one on the stage and being the one who can watch from afar, uh, you know, and, and not shaking in that one. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm really, really excited for this. So just to keep comments brief, but I'm really looking forward to this, this year's SMOP election. Okay. Can I get a motion to approve the calendar of events? Motion. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. <laughs> and that's unanimous with those present. <laughs> 17.4, new business item, items. Do we have anything to bring forward, Ms. Harris? Yes. Um, so new business item, uh, which is a resolution that I really do think is just a housekeeping update to the board's October 2020 resolution that outlined, uh, identified six schools currently named for enslavers. Um, and this uh, resolution just updates that resolution to the current state of knowledge. I've shared with all of my uh, colleagues on the board the fall 2023 article in the Montgomery Story by historian Ralph Douglas that also adds to that list uh, Julius West. And so, um, again, I think this is just a housekeeping update to the resolution to continue in the, the vein of the board's intent. Um, and I did want to just give a shout out to um, all of the this all of this work got its start um, in May of 2018 in an article in the Watkins Mill Current by uh, Sarah Elbish Shabishi and Kevin Finn. And wherever they are in the world, thank them for getting the ball rolling. So and then this will lay on the table and we will vote next month. Any second. Any uh, questions or discussion? No, if we it's know right why this wasn't um, included, this name was not included in the original list. They probably just missed it, right? They could have just missed it. Yeah, I think it's just the research. Yeah. I didn't hear the answer. I, I, th I think he, he was not a towering figure. And so I think there, you know, it was, it was limited information and a smaller life maybe than some of the other ones. I don't know if that's... I, I mean, I do think it's just the research piece. I think it's the historians in the county have literally been digging through historical records. And if you read Mr. Buglass's article, which I thought was amazing, um, he, he traces the history of every single school name ever in Montgomery County Public Schools. Wow. And so, um, and I think, um, I think it was just a product of doing that work. Okay, so this will lie at the table until the next board meeting. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous with those present. 
Item number 18 is for informational purposes only. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Motion. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous with those present. We are adjourned.